LibriVox.org. Recording by Charles Bice. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter 1. A Sermon on Inns. The sea was a pale elfin green, and the afternoon had already felt the fairy touch of evening, as a young woman with dark hair, dressed in a crinkly copper-colored sort of dress of the artistic order, was walking rather listlessly up the sea-line, a reason that many young women have had in the history of the world. But there was no sail in sight. On the beach below the parade were a succession of small crowds surrounding the usual orators of the seaside whether niggers or socialists, whether clowns or clergymen. Here would stand a man doing something or other with paper boxes, and the holiday-makers would watch him for hours in the hope of some time knowing what it was that he was doing with them. Next to him would be a man in a top hat, with a very big Bible and a very small wife, who stood silently beside him while he fought with his clenched fist against the heresy of the Milnian Suplicarianism, so widespread in fashionable watering-places. It was not easy to follow him, he was so very much excited, but every now and then the words, Ah, Suplicarian friends, would recur with a kind of wailing sneer. Next was a young man talking of nobody knew what, least of all himself, but apparently relying for public favor mainly on having a ring of carrots round his hat. He had more money lying in front of him than the others. Next were niggers. Next was a children's service conducted by a man with a long neck who beat time with a little wooden spade. Farther along there was an atheist in a towering rage who pointed every now and then at the children's service and spoke of nature's fairest things being corrupted with the secrets of the Spanish Inquisition by the man with the little spade, of course. The atheist, who wore a red rosette, was very withering to his own audience as well. Hypocrites, he would say, and then they would throw him money. Dupes and dastards! And then they would throw him more money. But between the atheist and the children's service was a little owlish man in a red fez, weakly waving a green gamp umbrella. His face was brown and wrinkled like a walnut, his nose was the sort we associate with Judea. His beard was the sort of black wedge we associate rather with Persia. The young woman had never seen him before. He was a new exhibit in the now familiar museum of cranks and quacks. The young woman was one of those people in whom a real sense of humor is always at issue with a certain temperamental tendency to boredom or melancholia, and she lingered a moment and leaned on the rail to listen. It was fully four minutes before she could understand a word the man was saying. He spoke English with so extraordinary an accent that she supposed at first that he was talking in his own oriental tongue. All the noises of that articulation were odd. The most marked was an extreme prolongation of the short U into oo, as in put for put. Gradually the girl got used to the dialect, and began to understand the words, though some time elapsed even then before she could form any conjecture of their subject matter. Eventually it appeared to her that he had some fad about English civilization having been founded by the Turks, or perhaps by the Saracens after their victory in the Crusades. He also seemed to think that Englishmen would soon return to this way of thinking, and seemed to be urging the spread of teetotalism as an evidence of it. The girl was the only person listening to him. Look, he said, wagging a curled brown finger, look at your own ince, which he pronounced as ince. Your ince, of which you write in your books, those ince were not put up in the beginning to sell the alcoholic Christian drink, they were put up to sell the non-alcoholic Islamic drinks. You can see this in the names of your inns. They are Eastern names, Asiatic names. You have a famous public house to which your omnibuses go on the pilgrimage. It is called the Elephant and Castle. This is not an English name. This is an Asiatic name. You will say there are castles in England, and I will agree with you. 
there is the Windsor Castle. But where? he cried, sternly shaking his green umbrella at the girl in an angry oratorical triumph. Where is the Windsor Elephant? I have searched all Windsor Park. No elephants! The girl with the dark hair smiled and began to think that this man was better than any of the others. In accordance with the strange system of concurrent religious endowment which prevails at watering places, she dropped a two-shilling piece into the round copper tray beside him. With honorable and disinterested eagerness, the old man in the red fez took no notice of this, but went on warmly, if obscurely, with his argument. Then you have a place of drink in this town which you call the Bull. We generally call it the Bull, said the interested young lady with a very melodious voice. You have a place of drink which you call the Bull, he reiterated in a sort of abstract fury, and surely you see that this is all very ridiculous. No, no, said the girl softly and in deprecation. Why should there be a Bull? he cried, prolonging the words in his own way. Why should there be a bull in connection with a festive locality? Who thinks about a bull in gardens of delight? What need is there of a bull when we watch the tulip-tinted maidens dance or pour the sparkling sherbet? You yourselves, my friends? And he looked around radiantly, as if addressing an enormous mob. You yourselves have a proverb. It is not calculated to promote prosperity to have a bull in a china shop. Equally, my friends, it would not be calculated to promote prosperity to have a bull in a wine shop. All this is clear. He stuck his umbrella upright in the sand and struck one finger against another like a man getting to business at last. It is as clear as the sun at noon he said solemnly. It is as clear as the sun at noon that this word bull, which is devoid of restful and pleasurable associations, is but the corruption of another word which possesses restful and pleasurable associations. The word is not bull, it is the bull bull. His voice rose suddenly like a trumpet, and he spread abroad his hands like the fans of a tropic palm tree. After this great effort, he was a little more subdued and leaned gravely on his umbrella. You will find the same trace of Asiatic nomenclature in the names of all your English inns, he went on. Nay, you will find it, I am almost certain, in all your terms in any way connected with your revelries and your reposes. Why, my good friends, the very name of that insidious spirit by which you make strong your drinks is an Arabic word, alcohol. It is obvious, is it not, that this is the Arabic article al, as in alhambra, as in algebra, and we need not pause here to pursue its many appearances in connection with your festive institutions as in your Alsop's beer, your Ali Sloper, and your partly joyous institution of the Albert Memorial. Above all, in your greatest feasting day, your Christmas day, which you so erroneously suppose to be connected with your religion, what do you say then? Do you say the names of the Christian nations? Do you say, I will have a little France? I will have a little Ireland, I will have a little Scotland, I will have a little Spain. No, and the noise of the negative seemed to waggle as does the bleating of a sheep. You say, I will have a little Turkey, which is your name for the country of the servant of the prophet. And once more he stretched out his arms sublimely to the east and west and appealed to earth and heaven. The young lady, looking at the sea-green horizon, with a smile, clapped her grey-gloved hands softly together as if at a peroration. But the little old man with the fez was far from exhausted yet. 
In reply to this, you will object, he began. Oh, no, no, breathed the young lady in a sort of dreamy rapture. I don't object, I don't object the littlest bit. In reply to this, you will object, proceeded her preceptor, that some inns are actually named after the symbols of your national superstitions. You will hasten to point out to me that the Golden Cross is situated opposite Charing Cross, and you will expatiate at length on King's Cross, Gerard's Cross, and the many crosses that are to be found in or near London. But you must not forget, and here he wagged his green umbrella roguishly at the girl, as if he was going to poke her with it. None of you, my friends, must forget what a large number of crescents there are in London. Denmark Crescent, Mornington Crescent, St. Mark's Crescent, St. George's Crescent, Grosner Crescent, Regent's Park Crescent, nay, Royal Crescent. And why should we forget Pelham Crescent? Why, indeed, everywhere, I say, homage paid to the holy symbol of the religion of the prophet. Compare with this network and pattern of crescents, this city almost consisting of crescents, the meager array of crosses which remain to attest the ephemeral superstition to which you were for one weak moment inclined. The crowds on the beach were rapidly thinning as tea-time drew nearer. The west grew clearer and clearer with the evening, till the sunshine seemed to have got behind the pale green sea and be shining through, as through a wall of thin green glass. The very transparency of sky and sea might have to this girl, for whom the sea was the romance and the tragedy, the hint of a sort of radiant hopelessness. The flood made of a million emeralds was ebbing as slowly as the sun was sinking, but the river of human nonsense flowed on for ever. "'I will not for one moment maintain,' said the old gentleman, "'that there are no difficulties in my case, or that all the examples are as obviously true as those that I have just demonstrated. No, it is obvious, let us say, that the Saracen's head is a corruption of the historic truth. The Saracen is a head. I am far from saying it is equally obvious that the Green Dragon was originally the Agreeing Dragoman though I hope to prove in my book that it is so. I will only say here that it is surely more probable that one putting himself forward to attract the wayfarer in the desert would compare himself to a friendly and persuadable guide or courier rather than to a voracious monster. Sometimes the true origin is very hard to trace as in the inn that commemorates our great Muslim warrior, Amir Ali Benbow's, whom you have so quaintly abbreviated into Admiral Benbow. Sometimes it is even more difficult for the seeker after truth. There is a place of drink near to here called the Old Ship. The eyes of the girl remained on the ring of the horizon, as rigid as the ring itself, but her whole face had colored and altered. The sands were almost emptied by now. The atheist was as non-existent as his god, and those who had hoped to know what was being done to paper boxes had gone away to their tea without knowing it. Her face was suddenly alive, and it looked as if her body could not move. It should be admitted, bleated the old man with the green umbrella, that there is no literally self-evident trace of the Asiatic nomenclature in the words the old ship. But even here, the seeker after truth can put himself in touch with facts. I questioned the proprietor of the old ship, who is, according to such notes as I have kept, a Mr. Pumph. The girl's lip trembled. Poor old hump, she said. Why, I'd forgotten about him. He must be very nearly as worried as I am. I hope this man won't be too silly about this. I'd rather it weren't about this. And Mr. Pumph, 
told me the inn was named by a very intimate friend of his, an Irishman who had been a captain in the Britannic Royal Navy, but had resigned his post in anger at the treatment of Ireland. Though quitting the service, he retained just enough of the superstition of your western sailors to wish his friend's inn to be named after his old ship. But as the name of the old ship was the United Kingdom, his female pupil, if she could not exactly be said to be sitting at his feet, was undoubtedly leaning out very eagerly above his head. Amid the solitude of the sands, she called out in a loud and clear voice, Can you tell me the captain's name? The old gentleman jumped, blinked, and stared like a startled owl. Having been talking for hours as if he had an audience of thousands, he seemed suddenly very much embarrassed to find that he had even an audience of one. By this time they seemed to be almost the only human creatures along the shore, almost the only living creatures except the seagulls. The sun, in dropping finally, seemed to have broken as a blood orange might break and lines of blood-red light were split along the split, low, level skies. This abrupt and belated brilliance took all the color out of the man's red cap and green umbrella, but his dark figure, distinct against the sea and the sunset, remained the same, save that it was more agitated than before. "'The name?' he said. "'The captain's name. I, I understood it was Dalroy.' But what I wish to indicate, what I wish to expound, is that here again the seeker after truth can find the connection of his ideas. It was explained to me by Mr. Pumph that he was rearranging the place of festivity in no inconsiderable proportion because of the anticipated return of the captain in question, who had, as it appeared, taken service in some not very large navy, but had left it and was coming home. Now mark all of you, my friends, he said to the seagulls, that even here the chain of logic holds. He said it to the seagulls because the young lady, after staring at him with starry eyes for a moment and leaning heavily on the railing, had turned her back and disappeared rapidly into the twilight. After her hasty steps had fallen silent, there was no other noise than the faint but powerful purring of the now distant sea, the occasional shriek of a seabird, and the continuous sound of a soliloquy. Mark all of you, continued the man, flourishing his green umbrella so furiously that it almost flew open like a green flag unfurled and then striking it deep in the sand, in the sand in which his fighting fathers had so often struck their tents. Mark all of you this marvellous fact, that when, being for a time, for a time astonished, embarrassed, brought up, as you would say, short, by the absence of any absolute evidence of eastern influence in the phrase, the old ship, I inquired from what country the captain was returning. Mr. Pumph said to me in solemnity, From Turkey, from Turkey, from the nearest country of the religion. I know men say it is not our country, that no man knows where we come from, of what is our country. What does it matter where we come from if we carry a message from paradise? With a great galloping of horses we carry it, and have no time to stop in places. But what we bring is the only creed that has regarded what you will call in your great words the virginity of man's reason, that has put no man higher than a prophet, and has respected the solitude of God. And again he spread his arms out, as if addressing a mass meeting of millions, all alone, on the dark seashore. End of chapter one. Recording by Charles Bice. www.charlesbice.com. Courtesy of Wimabi Press. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter two. The End of Olive Island. 
The great sea dragon of the changing colors that wriggles round the world like a chameleon was pale green as it washed on Pebblewick, but strong blue where it broke on the Ionian Isles. One of the innumerable islets, hardly more than a flat white rock in the azure expanse, was celebrated as the Isle of Olives, not because it was rich in such vegetation, but because by some freak of soil or climate two or three little olives grew there to an unparalleled height. Even in the full heat of the south it is very unusual for an olive tree to grow any taller than a small pear tree. But the three olives that stood up as signals on this sterile place might well be mistaken, except for the shape, for moderate-sized pines or larches of the north. It was also connected with some ancient Greek legend about Pallas, the patroness of the olive. For all that sea was alive with the first fairyland of Hellas, and from the platform of marble under the olive trees could be seen the grey outline of Ithaca. On the island and under the trees was a table set in the open air and covered with papers and inkstands. At the table were sitting four men, two in uniform and two in plain black clothes. Aides de camp, equerries, and such persons stood in a group in the background, and behind them a string of two or three silent battleships lay along the sea, for peace was being given to Europe. There had just come to an end the long agony of one of the many unsuccessful efforts to break the strength of Turkey and save the small Christian tribes. There had been many other such meetings in the later phases of the matter as one after another the small nations gave up the struggle or the greater nations came in to coerce them but the interested parties had now dwindled to these four for the powers of europe being entirely agreed on the necessity for peace on a turkish basis were content to leave the last negotiations to england and germany who could be trusted to enforce it there was a representative of the sultan of course and there was a representative of the only enemy of the sultan who had not hitherto come to terms for one tiny power had alone carried on the war month after month and with a tenacity and temporary success that was a new nine days marvel every morning an obscure and scarcely recognized prince calling himself the king of ithaca had filled the eastern mediterranean with exploits that were not unworthy of the audacious parallel that the name of his island suggested poets could not help asking if it were odysseus come again patriotic greeks even if they themselves had been forced to lay down their arms could not help feeling curious as to what greek race or name was boasted by the new and heroic royal house it was therefore with some amusement that the world at last discovered that the descendant of Ulysses was a cheeky Irish adventurer named Patrick Dalroy, who had once been in the English navy, had gotten into a quarrel through his Fenian sympathies, and resigned his commission. Since then he had seen many adventures in many uniforms, and always got himself or someone else into hot water with an extraordinary mixture of cynicism and quixotry. In his fantastic little kingdom, of course, he had been his own general, his own admiral, his own foreign secretary, and his own ambassador. But he was always careful to follow the wishes of his people in the essentials of peace and war. And it was at their direction that he had come to lay down his sword at last. Besides his professional skill, he was chiefly famous for his enormous bodily strength and stature, it is the custom in newspapers nowadays to say that mere barbaric muscular power is valueless in modern military actions but this view may be as much exaggerated as its opposite in such wars as these of the near east where whole populations are slightly armed and personal assault is common a leader who can defend his head often has a real advantage and it is not true even in a general way that strength is of no use this was admitted by lord ivywood the english minister who was pointing out in detail to king patrick the hopeless superiority of the light pattern of turkish field gun and the king of ithaca remarking that he was quite convinced said he would take it with him and ran away with it under his arm
it would be conceded by the greatest of the Turkish warriors, the terrifying Oman Pasha, equally famous for his courage in war and his cruelty in peace, but who carried on his brow a scar from Patrick's sword, taken after three hours mortal combat, and taken without spite or shame, be it said, for the Turk is always at his best in that game. Nor would the quality be doubted by Mr. Hart, a financial friend of the German minister whom Patrick Dalroy, after asking him which of his front windows he would prefer to be thrown into, threw into his bedroom window on the first floor with so considerate an exactitude that he alighted on the bed, where he was in a position to receive any medical attention. But when all is said, one muscular Irish gentleman on an island cannot fight all Europe for ever, and he came with a kind of gloomy good humour to offer the terms now dictated to him by his adopted country. He could not even knock all the diplomatists down, for which he possessed both the power and the inclination, for he realized with the juster part of his mind that they were only obeying orders as he was. So he sat heavily and sleepily at the little table, in the green and white uniform of the navy of Ithaca, invented by himself. A big bull of a man, monstrously young for his size, with a bull neck and two blue bull's eyes for eyes, and red hair rising so steadily off his scalp that it looked as if his head had caught fire, as some said it had. The most dominant person present was the great Omen Pasha himself, with his strong face starved by the asceticism of war, his hair and moustache seeming rather blasted with lightning than blanched with age. A red fez on his head, and between the red fez and moustache, a scar at which the king of Ithaca did not look. His eyes had an awful lack of expression. Lord Ivywood, the English minister, was probably the handsomest man in England, save that he was almost colourless both in hair and complexion. Against that blue marble sea he might almost have been one of its old marble statues that are faultless in line, but show nothing but shades of grey or white. It seemed a mere matter of the luck of lighting, whether his hair looked dull silver or pale brown, and his splendid mask never changed in color or expression. He was one of the last of the old parliamentary orators, and yet he was probably a comparatively young man. He could make anything he had to mention blossom into verbal beauty, yet his face remained dead while his lips were alive. He had little old-fashioned ways, as out of old parliaments. For instance, he would always stand up, as in a senate, to speak to those three other men alone on a rock in the ocean. In all this he perhaps appeared more personal in contrast to the man sitting next to him, who never spoke at all, but whose face seemed to speak for him. He was Dr. Gluck, the German minister, whose face had nothing German about it, neither the German vision nor the German sleep. His face was as vivid as a highly colored photograph and altered like a cinema, but his scarlet lips never moved in speech. His almond eyes seemed to shine with all the shifting fires of the opal. His small curled black moustache seemed sometimes almost to hoist itself afresh, like a live black snake. But there came from him no sound. He put a paper in front of Lord Ivywood. Lord Ivywood took a pair of eyeglasses to read it, and looked ten years older by the act. It was merely a statement of agenda, of the few last things to be settled at this last conference. The first item ran, The Ithacan ambassador asks that the girls taken to harems after the capture of Pylos be restored to their families. This cannot be granted. Lord Ivywood rose. The mere beauty of his voice startled everyone who had not heard it before. "'Your Excellencies and gentlemen,' he said, "'a statement to whose policy I by no means assent, but to whose historic status I could not conceivably aspire, has familiarized you with a phrase about peace with honour. But when we have to celebrate a peace between such historic soldiers as Omen Pasha and His Majesty the King of Ithaca, I think we may say that it is peace with glory. He paused for half an instant. 
yet even the silence of sea and rock seemed full of multitudinous applause, so perfectly had the words been spoken. I think there is but one thought among us, whatever our many just objections through these long and harassing months of negotiations, I think there is but one thought now, that the peace may be as full as the war, that the peace may be as fearless as the war. Once more he paused an instant, and felt a phantom clapping, as it were, not from the hands, but the heads of the men. He went on. If we are to leave off fighting, we may surely leave off haggling. A statute of limitations, or, if you will, an amnesty, is surely proper when so sublime a peace seals so sublime a struggle. And if there be anything in which an old diplomatist may advise you, I would most strongly say this, that there should be no new disturbance of whatever amicable or domestic ties have been formed during this disturbed time. I will admit I am sufficiently old-fashioned to think any interference with the interior life of the family a precedent of no little peril, nor will I be so illiberal as not to extend to the ancient customs of Islam what I would extend to the ancient customs of Christianity. A suggestion has been brought before us that we should enter into a renewed war of recrimination as to whether certain women have left their homes with or without their own consent. I can conceive no controversy more perilous to begin or more impossible to conclude. I will venture to say that I express all your thoughts when I say that, whatever wrongs may have been wrought on either side, the homes, the marriages, the family arrangements of this great Ottoman Empire shall remain as they are today. No one moved except Patrick Delroy, who put his hand on his sword-hilt for a moment and looked at them all with bursting eyes. Then his hand fell and he laughed out loud and sudden. Lord Ivywood took no notice, but picked up the agenda paper again, and again fitted on the glasses that made him look older. He read the second item, needless to say, not aloud. The German minister, with the far-from-German face, had written this note for him. Both Coot and the Bemsteins insist there must be Chinese for the marble. Greeks cannot be trusted in the quarries just now. But while, continued Lord Ivywood, we desire these fundamental institutions, such as the Moslem family, to remain as they are even at this moment. We do not assent to social stagnation, nor do we say for one moment that the great tradition of Islam is capable alone of sustaining the necessities of the Near East. But I would seriously ask your excellencies, why should we be so vain as to suppose that the only cure for the Near East is of necessity the Near West? If new ideas are needed, if new blood is needed, would it not be more natural to appeal to those most living, those most laborious civilizations which form the vast reserve of the Orient? Asia, in Europe, if my friend Oman Pasha will allow me the criticism, has hitherto been Asia in arms. May we not yet see Asia in Europe and yet Asia in peace? These at least are the reasons which lead me to consent to a scheme of colonization. Patrick Dalroy sprang erect, pulling himself out of his seat by clutching at an olive branch above his head. He steadied himself by putting one hand on the trunk of the tree, and simply stared at them all. There fell on him the huge helplessness of mere physical power. He could throw them into the sea, but what good would that do? More men on the wrong side would be accredited to the diplomatic campaign, and the only man on the right side would be discredited for anything. He shook the branching olive tree above him in his fury, but he did not for one moment disturb Lord Ivywood, who had just read the third item on his private agenda. Oman Pasha insists on the destruction of the vineyards and was by this time engaged in a peroration which afterwards became famous and may be found in many rhetorical textbooks and primers he was well into the middle of it before delroy's rage and wonder allowed him to follow the words 
do we indeed owe nothing the diplomatist was saying to that gesture of high refusal in which so many centuries ago the great arabian mystic put the wine-cup from his lips do we owe nothing to the long vigil of a valiant race the long fast by which they have testified against the venomous beauty of the vine Ours is an age when men come more and more to see that the creeds hold treasures for each other, that each religion has a secret for its neighbor, that faith unto faith uttereth speech, and church unto church showeth knowledge. If it be true, and I claim again the indulgence of Omen Pasha, when I say I think it is true, that we of the West have brought some light to Islam in the matter of the preciousness of peace and of civil order, may we not say that Islam in answer shall give us peace in a thousand homes, and encourage us to cut down that curse that has done so much to thwart and madden the virtues of Western Christendom? already in my own country the orgies that made horrible the knights of the noblest families are no more already the legislature takes more and more sweeping action to deliver the populace from the bondage of the all-destroying drug surely the prophet of mecca is reaping his harvest the cession of the disputed vineyards to the greatest of his champions is of all acts the most appropriate to this day to this happy day that may yet deliver the east from the curse of war and the west from the curse of wine the gallant prince who meets us here at last to offer an olive branch even more glorious than his sword may well have our sympathy if he himself views the session with some sentimental regret but i have little doubt that he also will live to rejoice in it at last and I would remind you that it is not the vine alone that has been the sign of the glory of the South. There is another sacred tree, unstained by loose and violent memories, guiltless of the blood of Pentbius, or of Orpheus, and the broken lyre. We shall pass from this place in a little while, as all things pass and perish. Far called, our navies melt away. On dune and headland sinks the fire, and all our pomp of yesterday is one with Nineveh and Tyre. But so long as sun can shine and soil can nourish, happier men and women after us shall look on this lovely islet, and it shall tell its own story. For they shall see these three holy olive trees, lifted in everlasting benediction, over the humble spot out of which came the peace of the world. The other two men were staring at Patrick Dalroy. His hand had tightened on the tree, and a giant billow of effort went over his broad breast. A small stone jerked itself out of the ground at the foot of the tree as if it were a grasshopper jumping. And then the coiled roots of the olive tree rose very slowly out of the earth, like the limbs of a dragon lifting itself from sleep. I offer an olive branch, said the king of Ithaca, totteringly leaning the loose tree, so that its vast shadow, much larger than itself, fell across the whole council. An olive branch, he gasped, more glorious than my sword, also heavier. Then he made another effort and tossed it into the sea below. The German, who was no German, had put up his arm in apprehension when the shadow fell across him. Now he got up and edged away from the table, seeing that the wild Irishman was tearing up the second tree. This one came out more easily, and before he flung it after the first, he stood with it a moment, looking like a man juggling with a tower. Lord Ivywood showed more firmness, but he rose in tremendous remonstrance. Only the Turkish pasha still sat with blank eyes, immovable. Dalroy rent out the last tree and hurled it, leaving the island bare. There, said Dalroy, when the third and last olive had splashed in the tide, now I will go. I have seen something today that is worse than death, and the name of it is peace. Omen Pasha rose and held out his hand. You are right, he said in French, and I hope we meet again in the only life that is a good life. Where are you going now? I am going, said Dalroy dreamily, to the old ship. Do you mean, asked the Turk, that you are going back to the warships of the English king? 
No, answered the other, I am going back to the old ship that is behind the apple trees by Pebblewick, where the Yule flows among the trees. I fear I shall never see you there. After an instant's hesitation, he wrung the red hand of the great tyrant, and walked to his boat without a glance at the diplomatists. End of chapter 2 Recording by Nicola K. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton Chapter 3 The Sign of the Old Ship Upon few of the children of men has the surname of Pump fallen, and of these few have been maddened into naming a child Humphrey in addition to it. To such extremity, however, had the parents of the innkeeper at the old ship proceeded, that their son might come at last to be called Hump by his dearest friends, and Pump by an aged Turk with a green umbrella. All this, or all he knew of it, he endured with a sour smile, for he was of a stoical temper. Mr. Humphrey Pump stood outside his inn, which stood almost on the seashore, screened only by one line of apple trees, dwarfed, twisted, and salted by the sea air. But in front of it was a highly banked bowling green, and behind it the land sank abruptly so that one very steep sweeping road vanished into the depth and mystery of taller trees mr pump was standing immediately under his trim sign which stood erect in the turf a wooden pole painted white and suspending a square white board also painted white but further decorated with a highly grotesque blue ship such as a child might draw but into which Mr. Pump's patriotism had insinuated a disproportionately large red St. George's cross. Mr. Humphrey Pump was a man of middle size with very broad shoulders, wearing a sort of shooting suit with gaiters. Indeed, he was engaged at the moment in cleaning and reloading a double-barreled gun, a short but powerful weapon which he had invented, or at least improved, himself and which, though eccentric enough as compared with latest scientific arms, was neither clumsy nor necessarily out of date. For Pump was one of those handy men who seemed to have a hundred hands like Briareus. He made nearly everything for himself, and everything in his house was slightly different from the same thing in anyone else's house. He was also as cunning as Pan, or a poacher in everything, affecting every bird or dish, every leaf or berry in the woods. His mind was a rich soil of subconscious memories and traditions, and he had a curious kind of gossip so elusive as to almost amount to reticence, for he always took it for granted that everyone knew his county and its tales as intimately as he did so he would mention the most mysterious and amazing things without relaxing a muscle on his face which seemed to be made of knotted wood his dark brown hair ended in two rudimentary side whiskers giving him a slightly horsey look but in the old-fashioned sportsman's style his smile was rather wry and crabbed but his brown eyes were kindly and soft he was very english as a rule, his movements, though quick, were cool, and on this occasion he put down the gun on the table outside the inn in a rather hurried manner, and came forward dusting his hands in an unusual degree of animation, and even defiance. Beyond the goblin green apple trees and against the sea had appeared the tall, slight figure of a girl, in a dress about the color of copper and a large, shady hat. Under the hat her face was grave and beautiful, though rather swarthy. She shook hands with Mr. Pump. Then he very ceremoniously put a chair for her and called her Lady Joan. I thought I would like a look at the old place, she said. We have had some happy times here when we were boys and girls. I suppose you hardly see any of your old friends now. Very little, answered Pump, rubbing his short whisker reflectively. Lord Ivywood's become quite a methody parson, you know, since he took the place. He's pulling down beer shops right and left, and Mr. Charles was sent to Australia for lying down flat at the funeral. Pretty stiff, I call it. 
but the old lady was a terror. Do you ever hear, asked Lady Joan Brett carelessly, of that Irishman, Captain Dalroy? Yes, more often than from the rest, answered the innkeeper. He seems to have done wonders in this Greek business. Ah, he was a sad loss to the navy. They insulted his country, said the girl, looking at the sea with heightened color. After all, Ireland was his country, and he had a right to resent it being spoken of like that. And when they found he'd painted him green, went on Mr. Pump. Painted him what? asked Lady Joan. Painted Captain Dawson green, continued Mr. Pump in colorless tones. Captain Dawson said green was the color of Irish traders, so Dalroy painted him green. It was a great temptation, no doubt, with this fence being painted at the time in the pail of stuff there, but of course it had a very prejudicial effect on his professional career. What an extraordinary story, said the staring Lady Joan, breaking into rather joyless laugh. It must go down among your county legends. I never heard that version before. Why, it might be the origin of the green man over there by the town. Oh, no, said Pump simply. That's been there since before Waterloo times. Poor old Noyle had it until they put him away. You remember old Noyle, Lady Joan. Still alive, I hear, and still writing love letters to Queen Victoria. Only, of course, they aren't posted now. Have you heard from your Irish friend lately? asked the girl, keeping a steady eye on the skyline. "'Yes, I had a letter last week,' answered the innkeeper. "'It seems not impossible that he may return to England. "'He's been acting for one of these Greek places, "'and the negotiations seem to be concluded. "'It's a queer thing that his lordship himself "'was the English minister in charge of them.' "'You mean Lord Ivywood?' said Lady Joan rather coldly. "'Yes, he has a great career before him, evidently. "'I wish he hadn't got his knife into us so much,' chuckled Pump. "'I don't believe there'll be an inn left in England.' But the Ivy Woods were always cranky. It's only fair to him to remember his grandfather. I think it's very ungallant on your part, said Lady Joan with a mournful smile, to ask a lady to remember his grandfather. You know what I mean, Lady Joan, said her host good humouredly. And I never was hard on the case myself. We all have our little ways. I shouldn't like it done to my pig, but I don't see why a man shouldn't have his own pig in his own pew with him if he likes it. It wasn't a free seat, it was the family pew. Lady Joan broke out laughing again. What horrible things you do seem to have heard of, she said. Well, I must be going, Mr. Hump. I mean, Mr. Pump. I used to call you Hump. Oh, Hump, do you ever think any of us will ever be happy again? I suppose it rests with Providence, he said, looking at the sea. Oh, do say Providence again, cried the girl. It's as good as Masterman Ready with which inconsequent words she betook herself again to the path by the apple-trees and walked back to the sea-front to Pebblewick. The inn of the old ship lay a little beyond the old fishing village of Pebblewick, and that again was separated by an empty half-mile or so from the new watering-place of Pebblewick-on-Sea. But the dark-haired lady walked steadily along the sea-front on a sort of parade which had been stretched out to east and west in the insane optimism of watering places, and as she approached the more crowded part, looked more and more carefully at the groups on the beach. Most of them were much the same as she had seen them more than a month before. The seekers after truth, as the man in the fez would say, who assembled daily to find out what the man was doing with the paper boxes, had not found out yet. Neither had they wearied of their intellectual pilgrimage. Pennies were still thrown to the thundering atheist in acknowledgment of his incessant abuse, and this was all the more mysterious because the crowd was obviously indifferent, and the atheist was obviously sincere. The man with the long neck, who led low church hymns with a little wooden spade, had indeed disappeared. For children's services of this kind are generally a moving feast, but the man whose only claim consisted of carrots round his hat was still there, and seemed to have even more money than before. But Lady Joan could see no sign of the little old man in the fez. She could only suppose that he had failed entirely and being in a bitter mood, she told herself bitterly that he had sunk out of sight, precisely because there was in his rubbish a touch of unearthly and insane clear-headedness, of which all these vulgar idiots were incapable. 
She did not confess to herself consciously that what had made both the man in the fez and the man at the inn interesting was the subject of which they had spoken. As she walked on rather wearily along the parade, she caught sight of a girl in black with faint fair hair and a tremulous intelligent face, which she was sure she had seen before. Pulling together all her aristocratic training for the remembering of middle-class people, she managed to remember that this was a Miss Browning, who had done typewriting work for her a year or two before, and immediately went forward to greet her, partly out of genuine good nature, and partly as a relief from her own rather dreary thoughts. Her tone was so seriously frank and friendly that the lady in black summoned the social courage to say, I've so often wanted to introduce you to my sister, who's much cleverer than I am, though she does live at home, which I suppose is very old-fashioned. She knows all sorts of intellectual people. She's talking to one of them now, this prophet of the moon that everyone's talking about. Do let me introduce you. Lady Joan Brett had met many prophets of the moon and of other things. But she had the spontaneous courtesy which redeems the vices of her class, and she followed Miss Browning to a seat on the parade. She greeted Miss Browning's sister with glowing politeness, and this may really be counted to her credit, for she had great difficulty in looking at Miss Browning's sister at all. For on the seat beside her, still in a red fez, but in a brilliantly new black frock coat, and every appearance of prosperity, sat the old gentleman who had lectured on the sands about the inns of England. He lectured at our ethical society, whispered Miss Browning, on the word alcohol. Just on the word alcohol. He was perfectly thrilling. All about Arabia and algebra, you know, and how everything comes from the East. You really would be interested. I am interested, said Lady Joan. Put it to yourselves, the man in the fez was saying to Miss Browning's sister, just what sort of meaning the names of your inns can have if they do not commemorate the unlimitable influence of Islam. There is a very populous inn in London, one of the most distinguished, one of the most of the centre, and it is called the Horseshoe. Now, my friends, why should anyone commemorate a horseshoe? It is but an appendage to a creature more interesting than itself. I have already demonstrated to you that the very fact that you have in your town a place of drink called the Bull. I should like to ask, began Lady Joan suddenly. A place of drink called the Bull, went on the man in the fez, deaf to all distractions. And I have urged that the Bull is a disturbing thought while the bull bull is a reassuring thought but even you my friends would not name a place after a ring in a bull's nose and not after the bull why then name an equivalent place after the shoe the mere shoe upon a horse's hoof and not after the noble horse surely it is clear surely it is evident that the term horseshoe is a cryptic term, an esoteric term, a term made during the days when the ancient Muslim faith of this English country was oppressed by the passing superstition of the Galileans. That bent shape, that duplex curving shape which you call horseshoe, is it not clearly the crescent? And he cast his arms wide as he had done on the sands, the crescent of the prophet of the only God, i should like to ask began lady joan again how you would explain the name of the inn called the green man just behind that row of houses exactly exactly cried the prophet of the moon in an almost insane excitement the seeker after truth could not at all probably find a more perfect example of these principles my friends how could there be a green man you are acquainted with green grass, with green leaves, with green cheese, and with green chartreuse. I ask if any one of you, however wide her social circle, has ever been acquainted with a green man. Surely, surely it is evident, my friends, that this is an imperfect version, an abbreviated version of the original words. 
what can be clearer than that the original expression was the green turbaned man in allusion to the well-known uniform of the descendants of the prophet turbaned surely is just the sort of word exactly the sort of foreign and unfamiliar word that might easily be slurred over and ultimately suppressed there is a legend in these parts said lady joan steadily that a great hero hearing the color that was sacred to his holy island insulted really poured it over his enemy for a reply a legend a fable cried the man in the fez with another radiant and rational expansion of the hands is it not evident that no such thing can have really happened oh yes it really happened said the young lady softly there is not much to comfort one in this world but there are some things oh it really happened and taking a graceful farewell of the group she resumed her rather listless walk along the parade end of chapter three recording by nicola k The Inn Finds Wings Mr. Humphrey Pump stood in front of his inn once more. The cleaned and loaded gun still lay on the table, and the white sign of the ship still swung in the slight sea breeze over his head. But his leatherish features were knotted over a new problem. He held two letters in his hand, letters of a very different sort, but letters that pointed to the same difficult problem. The first ran, Dear Hump, I am so bothered that I simply must call you by the old name again. You understand, I've got to keep in with my people. Lord Ivywood is a sort of cousin of mine, and for that and for some other reasons my poor old mother would just die if I offended him. You know, her heart is weak. You know everything there is to know in this county. Well, I only write to warn you that something is going to be done against your dear old inn. I don't know what these countries coming to. Only a month or two ago I saw a shabby old pantaloon on the beach with a green gamp, talking the craziest stuff you ever heard in your life. Three weeks ago I heard he was lecturing at ethical societies, whatever they are, for a handsome salary. Well, when I was last at Ivywood, I must go because Mama likes it. There was the living lunatic again, in evening dress and talking about people who really know, I mean who know better. Lord Ivywood is entirely under his influence and thinks him the greatest prophet the world has ever seen. And Lord Ivywood is not a fool. One can't help admire him. Mama, I think, wants me to do more than admire him. I'm telling you everything, Hump, because I think perhaps this is the last honest letter I shall ever write in the world. And I warn you seriously that Lord Ivywood is sincere, which is perfectly terrible. He will be the biggest English statesman and he does really mean to ruin the old ships. If you ever see me here again taking part in such work, I hope you may forgive me. Somebody we mentioned whom I shall never see again. I leave to your friendship. It is the second best thing I can give, and I am not sure it may be better than the first would have been. Goodbye, J.B. This letter seemed to distress Mr. Pump rather than puzzle him. It ran as follows. Sir, the Committee of the Imperial Commission of Liqueur Control is directed to draw your attention to the fact that you have disregarded the Committee's communications under Section 5A of the Act for the regulation of places of public entertainment, and that you are now under Section 47C of the Act, amending the Act for the regulation of places of public entertainment aforesaid. The charges on which prosecution will be founded are as follows. Violation of subsection 23 of the Act, which enacts that no pictorial signs shall be exhibited before premises of less than the rateable value of £2,000 per annum. Violation of subsection 113 of the Act, which enacts that no liqueur containing alcohol shall be sold in any inn, hotel, tavern, or public house, except when demanded under a medical certificate from one of the doctors licensed by the State Medical Council, or in the specially accepted cases of Claridge's Hotel and the Criterion Bar, where urgency has already been improved. As you have failed to acknowledge previous communications on this subject, this is to warn you that legal steps will be taken immediately. We are yours truly, Ivy Wood President, J. Levison Secretary. Mr. Humphrey Pump sat down at the table outside his inn and whistled in a way which, combined with his little whiskers, made him for the moment seem literally like an ostler. 
then the very real wit and learning he had returned slowly into his face and with his warm brown eyes he considered the cold gray sea there was not much to be got out of the sea humphrey pump might drown himself in the sea which would be better for humphrey pump than being finally separated from the old ship england might be sunk under the sea which would be better for england than never again having such places as the old ship but these were not serious remedies nor rationally attainable and pump could only feel that the sea had simply warped him as it had warped his apple trees the sea was a dreary business altogether there was only one figure walking on the sands it was only when the figure drew nearer and nearer and grew to more than human size that he sprang to his feet with a cry also the levelled light of morning lit the man's hair and it was red the late king of ithaca came casually and slowly up the slope of the beach that led to the old ship he had landed in a boat from a battleship that could still be seen near the horizon and he still wore the astounding uniform of apple green and silver which he had himself invented as that of a navy that had never existed much and which now did not exist at all he had a straight naval sword at his side for terms of his capitulation had never required him to surrender it and inside the uniform and beside the sword there was what there always had been a big and rather bewildered man with rough red hair whose misfortune was that he had good brains but that his bodily strength and bodily passions were a little too strong for his brains he had flung his crashing weight on the chair outside the inn before the innkeeper could find words to express his astounded pleasure in seeing him his first words were have you got any rum then as a feeling that his attitude needed explanation he added i suppose i shall never be a sailor again after to-night so i must have rum humphrey pump had a talent for friendship and understood his old friend he went into the inn without word and came back idly pushing or rolling with an alternate foot as if he were playing football with two balls at once two objects that rolled very easily one was a big keg or barrel of rum and the other a great solid drum of cheese among his thousand other technical tricks he had a way of tapping a cask without a tap or anything that could impair its revolutionary or revolving qualities he was feeling in his pocket for the instrument with which he solved such questions when his irish friend suddenly sat bolt upright as one startled out of sleep and spoke with his strongest and most unusual brogue oh thank you hump a thousand times and i don't really think i wanted something to drink at all now that i know that i can have it i don't seem to want it at all but what i do want and he suddenly dashed his big fist on the little table so that one of its legs lifted and nearly snapped what i do want is some sort of account of what's happening in this england of yours that shan't be obviously just rubbish ah said pump fingering the two letters thoughtfully and what do you mean by rubbish I call it rubbish," cried Patrick Delroy, "when you put the Koran into the Bible and not the Apocrypha, and I call it rubbish when a mad parson's allowed to propose to put a crescent on Saint Paul's Cathedral. I know the Turks are our allies now, but they often were before, and I never heard that Palmerston or Colin Campbell had any truck with such trash. Lord Ivywood is very enthusiastic, I know," said Pump with a restrained amusement. He was saying only the other day at the flower show here that the time had come for a full unity between Christianity and Islam. Something called Chrislam, perhaps, said the Irishman with a moody eye. He was gazing across the crane purple woodbines that stretched below them at the back of the inn, and into which the steep white road swept downwards and disappeared. The steep road looked like the beginning of an adventure, and he was an adventurer. But you exaggerate, you know, went on Pump, polishing his gun about the crescent on st paul's it wasn't exactly that what dr moole suggested i think was some sort of double emblem you know combining cross and crescent and carl the crescent muttered delroy and you can't call dr moole a parson either went on mr humphrey pump polishing industriously why they say he's a sort of a atheist or what they call an agnostic like a squire brunton who used to bite elm trees by marley the grand folks have these fashions captain but they have never lasted long that i know of i think it's serious this time said his friend shaking his big red head this is the last inn on this coast and will be soon the last inn in england do you remember saracen's head in plumsea along the shore there i know assented the innkeeper my aunt was there when he hanged his mother but it's a charming place i passed there just now and it has been destroyed said delroy destroyed by fire 
asked Pump, pausing in his gun scrubbing. No, said Delroy, destroyed by lemonade. They've taken away its license, or whatever they call it. I made a song about it, which I'll sing to you now. And with an astounding air of suddenly revived spirits, he roared in a voice like thunder the following verses to a simple but spirited tune of his own invention. The Saracen's head looks down the lane where we shall never drink wine again, for the wicked old women who feel well bred have turned to a tea shop. The Saracen's head, the Saracen's head out of Araby came, King Richard riding in arms like flame, and where he established his folk to be fed, he set up his spear and the Saracen's head. But the Saracen's head outlived the kings. It thought in it thought of most horrible things, of health and of soap and of standard bread and of Saracen drinks at the Saracen's head. Hello, cried Pump, with another low whistle. Why, here comes his lordship, and I suppose that young man in the goggles is a committee or something. Let him come, said Delroy, and continued in a yet more earthquake bellow. So the Saracen's head fulfills its name, the drink no wine, it's a ridiculous game, and I shall wonder until I'm dead how it ever came into the Saracen's head. As the last echo of this lyrical roar rolled away among the apple trees, and down the steep white road into the woods, Captain Delroy leaned back in his chair and nodded good-humouredly to Lord Ivywood, who was standing on the lawn with his usual cold air, but with slightly compressed lips. Behind him was a dark young man with double eye glasses and a number of printed papers in his hand, presumably J. Levison, secretary. In the road outside stood a small group of three which struck Pump as strangely incongruous, like a group in a three-act farce. The first was a police inspector in uniform, the second was a workman in a leather apron, more or less like a carpenter, and the third was an old man in a scarlet Turkish fez but otherwise dressed in very fashionable english clothes in which he did not seem very comfortable he was explaining something about the inn to the policeman and the carpenter who appeared to be restraining their amusement fine song that my lord said delroy with cheerful egotism i'll sing you another and he cleared his throat mr pump said lord ivywood in his bell-like and beautiful voice I thought I would come in person, if only to make it clear, that every indulgence has been shown to you. The mere date of this thing brings it within the statute of 1909. It was erected when my great-grandfather was lord of the manor here, though I believe it then bore a different name, and— Ah, my lord! broke in pump with a sigh. I'd rather deal with your great-grandfather, I would, though he married a hundred negresses instead of one, than see a gentleman of your family taking away a poor man's livelihood. The act is specially designed in the interests of the relief of poverty, proceeded Lord Ivywood, in an unruffled manner, and its final advantages will accrue to all citizens alike. He turned for an instant to the dark secretary, saying, You have the second report, and received a folded paper in answer. It is here fully explained, said Lord Ivywood, putting on his elderly eyeglasses, that the purpose of the act is largely to protect the savings of the more humble and necessitous classes. I find in paragraph 3, We strongly advise that the deleterious element of alcohol be made illegal, save in such places as the government may especially exempt for parliamentary or other public reasons, and that the provocative and demoralizing display on insigns be strictly forbidden except in cases thus especially exempted. The absence of such temptations will, in our opinion, do much to improve the precarious financial conditions of the working class. That disposes, I think, of any such suggestion as Mr. Pump's, that our inevitable acts of social reform are in any sense oppressive. To Mr. Pump's prejudice, it may appear for the moment to bear hardly upon him, but— And here Lord Ivywood's voice took one of its moving oratorical turns. What better proof could we desire of the insidiousness of the sleepy poison we denounce, what better evidence could we offer of the civic corruption that we seek to cure, than the very fact that good and worthy men of established repute in the county can, by having in such places as these, become so stagnant and sodden and unsocial, whether through the fumes of wine, or through meditations as modelled about the past, that they consider the case solely as their own case, and laugh at the long agony of the poor. Captain Delroy had been studying Ivywood with the very bright blue eye, and he spoke now much more quietly than he generally did. 
Excuse me one moment, my lord, he said. But there was one point in your important explanation which I am not sure I've got right. Do I understand you to say that though signboards are to be generally abolished, yet where, if anywhere, they are retained, the right to sell fermented liqueur will be retained also? In other words, though an Englishman may at last find only one ensign left in England, yet if the place has an ensign, it will also have your gracious permission to be really an inn. Lord Ivywood had an admirable command of temper, which had helped him much in his career as a statesman. He did not waste time in wrangling about the captain's locus of stand in the matter. He replied quite simply, Yes, your statement of the facts is correct. Whenever I find an ensign permitted by the police, I may go in and ask for a glass of beer, also permitted by the police. If you find any such, yes, answered Ivywood quite temperately, but we hope soon to have removed them altogether. Captain Patrick Delroy rose enormously from his seat with a sort of a stretch and yawned. Well, Hump, he said to his friend, the best thing, it seems to me, is to take the important things with us. With two sight-staggering kicks he sent the keg of rum and the rolled cheese flying over the fence in such a direction that they bolted on the descending road and rolled more and more rapidly toward the dark woods into which the path disappeared. Then he gripped the pole of the ensign, shook it twice, and plucked it out of the turf like a tuft of grass. It had all happened before anyone could move, but as he strode out into the road, the policeman ran forward. Delroy smacked him flat across the face and chest with the wooden signboard so as to send him flying into the ditch on the other side of the road. Then turning onto the man in the fez, he poked him with the end of the pole so sharply in his new white waistcoat and watch chain as to cause him to sit down suddenly in the road looking very serious and thoughtful. The dark secretary made a movement of rescue, but Humphrey Pump, with a cry, caught up his gun from the table and pointed it at him, which so alarmed J. Levison's secretary as to cause him to almost double up with his emotions. The next moment, Pump, with his gun under his arm, was scampering down the hill after the captain, who was scampering after the barrel and the cheese. Before the policeman had struggled out of the ditch, they had all disappeared into the darkness of the forest. Lord Ivywood, who had remained firm through the scene, without a sign of fear or impatience, or I will add, amusement, held up his hand and stopped the policeman in his pursuit. We should only make ourselves and the law look ridiculous, he said by pursuing those ludicrous rowdies, no? They can't escape or do any real harm in the state of modern communications. What is far more important, gentlemen, is to destroy their stores and their base. Under the Act of 1911, we have a right to confiscate and destroy any property in an inn where the law has been violated. And he stood for hours on the lawn, watching the smashing of bottles and the breaking up of casks, and feeding on fanatical pleasure. The pleasure his strange, cold, courageous nature could not get from food or wine or women. End of The Inn Finds Wings Recording by Zernaz The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton Chapter 5 The Astonishment of the Agents Lord Ivywood shared the mental weakness of most men who have fed on books. He ignored not the value, but the very existence of other forms of information. Thus Humphrey Pump was perfectly aware that Lord Ivywood considered him an ignorant man who carried a volume of Pickwick and could not be got to read any other book. But Lord Ivywood was quite unaware that Humphrey never looked at him without thinking that he could be most successfully hidden in a wood of small beeches as his grey-brown hair and sallow ashen face exactly reproduced the three predominant tints of such a sylvan twilight. Mr. Pump, I fear, had sometimes partaken of partridge or pheasant in his early youth, under circumstances in which Lord Ivywood was not only unconscious of the hospitality he was dispensing, 
but would have sworn that it was physically impossible for any one to elude the vigilance of his efficient system of gamekeeping. But it is very unwise in one who counts himself superior to physical things to talk about physical impossibility. Lord Ivywood was in error, therefore, when he said that the fugitives could not possibly escape in modern England. You can do a great many things in modern England, if you have noticed. Some things, in fact, which others know by pictures or current speech. If you know, for instance, that most roadside hedges are taller and denser than they look, and that even the largest man lying just behind them takes up far less room than you would suppose. If you know that many natural sounds are much more like each other than the enlightened ear can believe, as in the case of wind in leaves and of the sea. If you know that it is easier to walk in socks than in boots, if you know how to take hold of the ground. If you know that the proportion of dogs who will bite a man under any circumstances is rather less than the proportion of men who will murder you in a railway carriage. If you know that you need not be drowned even in a river unless the tide is very strong, and unless you practice putting yourself into the special attitudes of a suicide. If you know that country stations have objectless extra waiting rooms that nobody ever goes into, and if you know that country folk will forget you if you speak to them, but talk about you all day if you don't, by the exercise of these and other arts and sciences, Humphrey Pump was able to guide his friend across country, mostly in the character of trespasser and occasionally in that of something like housebreaker, and eventually, with sign, keg, cheese, and all, to step out of a black pine wood onto a white road in a part of the country where they would not be sought for the present. Opposite them was a cornfield, and on their right, in the shades of the pine trees, a cottage, a very tumble-down cottage that seemed to have collapsed under its own thatch. The red-haired Irishman's face wore a curious smile, he stuck the ensign erect in the road and went and hammered on the door. It was opened tremulously by an old man with a face so wrinkled that the wrinkles seemed more distinctly graven than the features themselves, which seemed lost in the labyrinth of them. He might have crawled out of the hole in a gnarled tree, and he might have been a thousand years old. He did not seem to notice the signboard which stood rather to the left of the door, and what life remained in his eyes seemed to awake in wonder at Dalroy's stature and strange uniform and the sword at his side. I beg your pardon, said the captain courteously. I fear my uniform startles you. It is Lord Ivywood's livery. All his servants are to dress like this. In fact, I understand the tenants also, and even yourself, perhaps. Excuse my sword. Lord Ivywood is very particular that every man should have a sword. You know his beautiful, eloquent way of putting his views. How can we profess, he was saying to me yesterday, while I was brushing his trousers, how can we profess that all men are brothers while we refuse to them the symbol of manhood, or with what assurance can we claim it 
as a movement of modern emancipation to deny the citizen that which has in all ages marked the difference between the free man and the slave nor need we anticipate any such barbaric abuses as my honorable friend who is cleaning the knives has prophesied for this gift is a sublime act of confidence in your universal passion for the severe splendors of peace and he that has the right to strike is he who has learnt to spare talking all this nonsense with extreme rapidity and vast oratorical flourishes of the hand captain dalroy proceeded to trundle both the big cheese and the cask of rum into the house of the astonished cottager mr pump following with a grim placidity and his gun under his arm lord ivywood said dalroy setting the rum cask with a bump on the plain deal table wishes to take wine with you or more strictly speaking rum don't you run away my friend with any of these stories about lord ivywood being opposed to drink three bottle ivywood we call him in the kitchen but it must be rum nothing but rum for the ivywoods wine may be a mocker he was saying the other day and i particularly noted the phrasing which seemed to be very happy even for his lordship he was standing at the top of the steps and i stopped cleaning them to make a note of it wine may be a mocker strong drink may be raging but nowhere in the sacred pages will you find one word of censure of the sweeter spirit sacred to them that go down to the sea in ships no tongue of priest and prophet has ever lifted to break the sacred silence of holy writ about rum he then explained to me went on dalroy signing to pump to tap the cask according to his own technical secret that the great tip for avoiding any bad results that a bottle or two of rum might have on young and inexperienced people was to eat cheese with it particularly this kind of cheese that i have here i've forgotten its name cheddar said pump quite gravely but mind you continued the captain almost ferociously shaking his big finger in warning at the aged man mind you no bread with the cheese all the devastating ruin wrought by cheese in the once happy homes of this country has been due to the reckless and insane experiment of eating bread with it you'll get no bread from me my friend indeed lord ivywood has given directions that the allusion to this ignorant and depraved habit shall be eliminated from the lord's prayer have a drink he had already poured out a little of the spirit into two thick tumblers and a broken teacup which he had induced the aged man to produce and now solemnly pledged him thank ye kindly sir said the old man using his cracked voice for the first time then he drank and his old face changed as if it were an old horn lantern in which the flame began to rise ar he said my son he be a sailor i wish him a happy voyage said the captain and i'll sing you a song about the first sailor there ever was in the world and who as lord ivywood acutely observes lived before the time of rum he sat down on a wooden chair and lifted his loud voice once more beating on the table with the broken teacup old noah he had an ostrich farm and fowls on the greatest scale he ate his egg with a ladle in an egg cup big as a pail and the soup he took was elephant soup and the fish he took was whale 
but they all were small to the cellar he took when he set out to sail and noah he often said to his wife when he sat down to dine i don't care where the water goes if it doesn't get into the wine the cataract of the cliff of heaven fell blinding off the brink as if it would wash the stars away as suds go down a sink the seven heavens came roaring down for the throats of hell to drink and noah he cocked his eye and said it looks like rain i think the water has drowned the matter horn as deep as a mendip wine and i don't care where the water goes if it doesn't get into the wine but noah he sinned and we have sinned on tipsy feet we trod till a great big black teetotaler was sent to us for a rod and you can't get wine at a PSA or chapel or iced at fod for the curse of water has come again because of the wrath of god and water is on the bishop's board and the higher thinker's shrine but i don't care where the water goes if it doesn't get into the wine lord avywood's favorite song concluded mr patrick dalroy drinking sing us a song yourself rather to the surprise of the two humorists the old gentleman actually began in a quavering voice to chant king george that lives in london town i hope they will defend his crown and bony part be quite put down on christmas day in the morning old squire is gone to the meet to-day all in his it is perhaps fortunate for the rapidity of this narrative that the old gentleman's favorite song which consists of forty-seven verses was interrupted by a curious incident the door of the cottage opened and a sheepish-looking man in corduroys stood silently in the room for a few seconds and then said without preface or further explanation for ale i beg your pardon inquired the polite captain for ale said the man with solidity then catching sight of humphrey seemed to find a few more words in his vocabulary morning mr pump didn't know as how you'd move the old ship mr pump with a twist of a smile pointed to the old man whose song had been interrupted mr mames seeing after it now mr gow said pump with the strict etiquette of the countryside but he's got nothing but this rum in stock as yet better now said the laconic mr gow and put down some money in front of the aged mame who eyed it wonderingly as he was turning with a farewell and wiping his mouth with the back of his hand the door once more moved letting in white sunlight and a man in a red neckerchief morning mr mame morning mr pump morning mr gow said the man in the red neckerchief morning mr coot said the other three one after the other have some rum mr coot asked humphrey pump genially that's all mr mame's got just now mr coot also had a little rum and, and also laid a little money under the rather vague gaze of the venerable cottager mr coot was just proceeding to explain that these were bad times but if you saw a sign you were all right still a lawyer up at grunton abbot had told him so when the company was increased and greatly excited by the arrival of a boisterous and popular tinker who ordered glasses all round and said he had his donkey and cart outside 
a prolonged rich and confused conversation about the donkey and cart then ensued in which the most varied views were taken of their merits and it gradually began to dawn on dalroy that the tinker was trying to sell them an idea suited to the romantic opportunism of his present absurd career suddenly swept over his mind and he rushed out to look at the cart and donkey the next moment he was back again asking the tinker what his price was and almost in the same breath offering a much bigger price than the tinker would have dreamed of asking this was considered however as a lunacy especially allowed to gentlemen the tinker had some more rum on the strength of the payment and then dalroy offering his excuses sealed up the cask and took it and the cheese to be stowed in the bottom of the cart the money however he still left lying in shining silver and copper before the silver beard of old Maine. No one acquainted with the quaint and often wordless camaraderie of the English poor will require to be told that they all went out and stared at him as he loaded the cart and saw to the harness of the donkey all except the old cottager who sat as if hypnotized by the sight of the money while they were standing there they saw coming down the white hot road where it curled over the hill a figure that gave them no pleasure even when it was a mere marching black spot in the distance it was a mr bullrose the agent of lord ivywood's estates mr bullrose was a short square man with a broad square head with ridges of close black curls on it with a heavy frog-like face and starting suspicious eyes a man with a good silk hat but a square business jacket mr bullrose was not a nice man the agent on that sort of estate hardly ever is a nice man the landlord often is and even lord ivywood had an arctic magnanimity of his own which made most people want if possible to see him personally but mr bullrose was petty every really practical tyrant must be petty he evidently failed to understand the commotion in front of mr mame's partly collapsed cottage but he felt there must be something wrong about it he wanted to get rid of the cottage altogether and had not of course the faintest intention of giving the cottager any compensation for it he hoped the old man would die but in any case he could easily clear him out if it became suddenly necessary for he could not possibly pay the rent for this week the rent was not very much but it was immeasurably too much for the old man who had no conceivable way of borrowing or earning it that is where the chivalry of our aristocratic land system comes in good-bye my friends the enormous man in the fantastic uniform was saying all roads lead to rum as lord ivywood said in one of his gayer moments and we hope to be back soon establishing a first-class hotel here of which prospectuses will soon be sent out the heavy frog-like face of mr bullrose the agent grew uglier with astonishment 
and the eyes stood out more like a snail's than a frog's. The indefensible allusion to Lord Ivywood would, in any case, have caused a choleric intervention if it had not been swallowed up in the earthquake suggestion of an unlicensed hotel on the estate. This again would have affected the explosion if that and everything else had not been struck still and rigid by the sight of a solid wooden signpost already erected outside old Mame's miserable cottage. I've got him now, muttered Mr. Bullrose. He can't possibly pay, and out he shall go. And he walked swiftly towards the door of the cottage. Almost at the same moment that Dalroy went to the donkey's head, as if to lead it off along the road. "'Look here, my man!' burst out Mr. Bullrose the instant he was inside the cottage. "'You've cooked yourself this time. His lordship has been a great deal too indulgent with you, but this is going to be the end of it. The insolence of what you've done outside, especially when you know his lordship's wishes in such things, has just put the lid on. He stopped a moment and sneered. So unless you happen to have the exact rent down to a farthing or two about you, out you go. We're sick of your sort. In a very awkward and fumbling manner, the old man pushed a heap of coins across the table. Mr. Bullrose sat down suddenly on the wooden chair with his silk hat on and began counting them furiously. He counted them once, he counted them twice, and he counted them again. Then he stared at them more steadily than the cottager had done. "'Where did you get this money?' he asked in a thick, gross voice. "'Did you steal it?' "'I ain't very spry for stealing,' said the old man in quavering comedy. Bullrose looked at him and then at the money, and remembered with fury that Ivywood was a just, though cold, magistrate on the bench. "'Well, anyhow,' he cried in a hot, heady way, "'we got enough against you to turn you out of this. Haven't you broken the law, my man, to say nothing of the regulations for tenants?' in sticking up that fancy sign of yours outside the cottage, eh? The tenant was silent. Eh? reiterated the agent. Ah, replied the tenant. Have you or have you not a signboard outside this house? shouted Bullrose, hammering the table. The tenant looked at him for a long time with a patient and venerable face, and then said, Maybe yes, maybe no. I'll mubby you, cried Mr. Bullrose, springing up and sticking his silk hat on the back of his head. I don't know whether you people are too drunk to see anything, but I saw the thing with my own eyes out in the road. Come out, and deny it if you dare. Arr, said Mr. Mame dubiously. He tottered after the agent, who flung open the door with a business-like fury and stood outside on the threshold. He stood there quite a long time, and he did not speak. Deep in the hardened mud of his materialistic mind, there had stirred two things that were its ancient enemies. 
the old fairy tale in which everything can be believed the new skepticism in which nothing can be believed not even one's own eyes there was no sign nor sign of a fane in the landscape on the withered face of the old man mame there was a faint renewal of that laughter that has slept since the middle ages end of chapter five recording by bill mosley frelsberg texas u s a chapter six the hole in heaven that delicate ruby light which is one of the rarest but one of the most exquisite of evening effects warmed the land sky and seas as if the whole world were washed in wine and dyed almost scarlet the strong red head of patrick dalroy as he stood on a waste of firs and bracken where he and his friends had halted one of his friends was re-examining a short gun rather like a double-barrelled carbine the other was eating thistles dalroy himself was idle and ruminant with his hands in his pockets and his eye on the horizon landwards the hills plains and woods lay bathed in the rose-red light but it changed somewhat to purple to cloud and something like storm over the distant violet strip of sea it was toward the sea that he was staring suddenly he woke up and seemed almost to rub his eyes or at any rate to rub his red eyebrow why we're on the road of pebblewick he said that's the damned little tin chapel by the beach i know answered his friend and guide we've done the old hair trick doubled you know nine times out of ten it's the best parson white lady used to do it when they were after him for dog stealing i've pretty much followed his trail you can't do better than stick to the best examples they tell you in london that dick turpin rode to york well i know he didn't for my old grandfather up at cobble's end knew the turpins intimately threw one of them into the river on a christmas day but i think i can guess what he did do and how the tale got about if dick was wise he went flying up the old north road shouting york york or what not before people recognized him then if he did the thing properly he might half an hour afterwards walk down the strand with a pipe in his mouth they say old boney said go where you aren't expected and i suppose as a soldier he was right but for a gentleman dodging the police like yourself it isn't exactly the right way of putting it i should say go where you ought to be expected and you'll generally find your fellow creatures don't do what they ought about expecting any more than about anything else well this bit between here and the sea said the captain in a brown study i know it so well so well that that i rather wish i'd never seen it again do you know he asked suddenly pointing to a patch and pit of sand that showed white in the dusky heath a hundred yards away do you know what makes that spot so famous in history yes answered mr pump that's where old mother grout shot the methodist you are in error said the captain such an incident as you describe would in no case call for special comment or regret no that spot is famous because a very badly brought-up girl once lost a ribbon off a plate of black hair and somebody helped her find it has the other person been well brought up asked pump with a faint smile no said dalroy staring at the sea he has been brought down then rousing himself again he made a gesture toward a further part of the heath do you know the remarkable history of that old wall the one beyond the last gorge over there no replied the other unless you mean dead man's circus that happened further along 
I do not mean Dead Man's Circus, said the captain. The remarkable history of that wall is that somebody's shadow once fell on it, and that shadow was more desirable than the substance of all other living things. It is this, he cried almost violently, resuming his flippant tone. It is this circumstance, Hump, and not the trivial and everyday incident of a dead man going to a circus to which you have presumed to compare it. It is this historical event which Lord Ivywood is about to commemorate by rebuilding the wall with solid gold and Greek marble stolen by the Turks from the grave of Socrates, enclosing a column of solid gold four hundred feet high and surmounted by a colossal equestrian statue of a bankrupt Irishman riding backwards on a donkey. He lifted one of his long legs over the animal, as if about to pose for the group, then swung back on both feet again, and again looked at the purple limit of the sea. "'Do you know, Hump?' he said. "'I think modern people have somehow got their minds all wrong about human life. They seem to expect what nature has never promised, and then try to ruin all that nature has really given. At all those atheist chapels of Ivywood's, they're always talking of peace, perfect peace, and utter peace, and universal joy, and souls that beat as one. But they don't look any more cheerful than anyone else, and the next thing they do is to start smashing a thousand good jokes, and good stories, and good songs, and good friendships by pulling down the old ship. He gave a glance at the loose signpost lying on the heath beside him, almost as if to reassure himself that it was not stolen. Now, it seems to me, he went on, that this is asking for too much and getting too little. I don't know whether God means a man to have happiness in that all-in-all -all and utterly utter sense of happiness, but God does mean a man to have a little fun, and I mean to go on having it. If I mustn't satisfy my heart, I can gratify my humor. The cynical fellows who think themselves so damned clever have a sort of saying, Be good and you will be happy, but you will not have a jolly time. The cynical fellows are quite wrong, as they generally are. They have got hold of the exact opposite of the truth. God knows I don't set up to be good. But even a rascal sometimes has to fight the world in the same way as a saint. I think I have fought the world, et militavi non sine, What's the Latin for having a lark? I can't pretend to peace and joy and all the rest of it, particularly in this original briar patch. I haven't been happy, Hump, but I have had a jolly time. The sunset stillness settled down again, save for the cropping of the donkey in the undergrowth, and Pump said nothing sympathetically, and it was Dalroy once more who took up his parable. So, I think there's too much of this playing on our emotions, Hump, as this place is certainly playing the cat and banjo with mine. Damn it all, there are other things to do with the rest of one's time. I don't like all this fuss about feeling things. It only makes people miserable. In my present frame of mind, I'm in favor of doing things. All of which, Hump, he said with a sudden lift of the voice that always went in him with a rushing, irrational return, of merely animal spirits, all of which I have put into a song against songs that I will now sing you. I shouldn't sing it here, said Humphrey Pump, picking up his gun and putting it under his arm. You look large in this open place, and you sound large, but I'll take you to the hole in heaven you've been talking about so much, and hide you as I used to hide you from that tutor. I couldn't catch his name, man who could only get drunk on Greek wine at Square Wimples. Hump! cried the captain. I abdicate the throne of Ithaca. You are far wiser than Ulysses. Here I have had my heart torn with temptations to ten thousand things between suicide and abduction, and all by the mere sight of that hole in the heath where we used to have picnics. And all that time I'd forgotten we used to call it the hole in heaven. And by God, what a good name, in both senses. I thought you'd have remembered it, Captain, said the innkeeper, from the joke young Mr. Matthews made. In the heat of some savage hand-to-hand -hand struggle in Albania, said Mr. Dalroy sadly, pressing his palm across his brow, I must have forgotten for one fatal instant the joke young Mr. Matthews made. 
"'It wasn't very good,' said Mr. Pump simply. "'Ah, oh, his aunt was the one for things like that. "'She went too far with old Gudgeon, though.' "'With these words he jumped and seemed to be swallowed up by the earth. "'But they had merely strolled the few yards needed "'to bring them to the edge of the sand-pit on the heath "'of which they had been speaking. "'And it is one of the truths concealed by heaven from Lord Ivywood "'and revealed by heaven to Mr. Pump.' that a hiding-place can be covered when you are close to it, and yet be open and visible from some spot of vantage far off. From the side by which they approached it, the sudden hollow of sand, a kind of collapsed chamber in the heath, seemed covered with a natural curve of fern and furze, and flashed out of sight like a fairy. "'It's all right,' he called out from under a floor or roof of leaves, "'You'll remember it all when you get there. "'This is the place to sing your song, Captain. "'Lord bless me, Captain. "'I don't remember your singing that Irish song you made up at college, "'bellowing it like a bull of Bashan, "'all about hearts and sleeves or some such thing, "'and her ladyship and the tutor never heard a breath, "'because that bank of sand breaks everything. "'It's worth knowing all this, you know. "'It's a pity it's not part of a young gentleman's education.' Now, you shall sing me the song in favor of having no feelings, or whatever you call it. Dalroy was staring about him at the cavern of his old picnics, so forgotten and so startlingly familiar. He seemed to have lost all thought of singing anything, and simply to be groping in the dark house of his own boyhood. There was a slight trickle from a natural spring in the sandstone just under the ferns and he remembered they used to try to boil the water in a kettle. He remembered a quarrel about who had upset the kettle, which, in the morbidity of first love, had given him for days the tortures of the damned. When the energetic pump broke once more through the rather thorny roof on an impulse to accumulate their other eccentric possessions, Patrick remembered about a thorn in a finger that made his heart stop with something that was pain and perfect music. When Pump returned with the rum keg and the cheese and rolled them with a kick down the shelving sandy side of the hole, he remembered, with almost wrathful laughter, that in the old days he had rolled down that slope himself, and thought it rather a fine thing to do. He felt then as if he were rolling down a smooth side of the Matterhorn. He observed now that the height was rather less than that of the second story of one of the stunted cottages he had noted on his return. He suddenly understood he had grown bigger, bigger in a bodily sense. He had doubts about any other. "'The hole in heaven,' he said. "'What a good name! What a good poet I was in those days! The hole in heaven! But does it let one in or let one out?' In the last level shafts of the fallen sun, the fantastic shadow of the long-eared quadruped, whom Pump had now tethered to a new and nearer pasture, fell across the last sunlit scrap of sand. Dalroy looked at the long, exaggerated shadow of the ass, and laughed that short explosive laugh he had uttered when the doors of the harems had been closed after the Turkish war. He was normally a man much too loquacious, but he never explained those laughs. Humphrey Pump plunged down again into the sunken nest, and began to broach the cask of rum in his own secret style, saying, We can get something else somehow tomorrow, for tonight we can eat cheese and drink rum, especially as there's a water on tap, so to speak. And now, Captain, sing us the song against songs. Patrick Dalroy drank a little rum out of a small medicine glass, which the generally unaccountable Mr. Pump unaccountably procured from his waistcoat pocket. But Patrick's color had risen, his brow was almost as red as his hair, and he was evidently reluctant. "'I don't see why I should sing all the songs,' he said. "'Why the devil don't you sing a song yourself? And now, come to think of it,' he cried, with an accumulating brogue not perhaps wholly unaffected by the rum, which he had not, in fact, drunk for years." "'And now I come to think of it, what about that song of yours? 
all me youth's coming back in this blessed and cursed place and i remember that song of yours that never existed nor ever will don't you remember humphrey pump that night when i sang ye no less than seventeen songs of me own composition i remember it very well answered the englishman with restraint and don't ye remember went on the exhilarated irishman with solemnity that unless ye could produce a poetic lyric of your own written and sung by yourself i threaten to to sing again said the impenetrable pump yes i know he calmly proceeded to take out of his pockets which were alas more like those of a poacher than an innkeeper a folded and faded piece of paper i wrote it when you asked me he said simply i have never tried to sing it but i'll sing it myself when you've sung your song against anybody singing at all all right cried the somewhat excited captain to hear a song from you why i'll sing anything this is the song against songs hump and again he let his voice out like a bellow against the evening silence the song of the sorrow of melisande is a weary song and a dreary song the glory of mariana's grange had got into great decay the song of the raven never more has never been called a cheery song and the brightest things in baudelaire are anything else but gay but who will write us a riding song or a hunting song or a drinking song fit for them that arose and rode when day and the wine were red but bring me a quart of claret out and i will write you a clinking song a song of war and a song of wine and a song to wake the dead the song of the fury of frogolet is a florid song and a torrid song the song of the sorrow of tara is sung to a harp unstrung the song of the cheerful shropshire kid i consider a perfectly horrid song and the song of the happy futurist is a song that can't be sung but who will write us a writing song or a fighting song or a drinking song fit for the fathers of you and me that knew how to think and thrive but the song of beauty and art and love is simply an utterly stinking song to double you up and drag you down and damn your soul alive take some more rum concluded the irish officer affably and let's hear your song at last with the gravity inseparable from the deep conventionality of country people mr pump unfolded the paper on which he had recorded the only antagonistic emotion that was strong enough in him to screw his infinite english tolerance to the pitch of song he read out the title very carefully and in full song against grocers by humphrey pump sole proprietor of the old ship pebblewick good accommodation for man and beast celebrated as the house at which both queen charlotte and jonathan wilde put up on different occasions and where the ice cream man is mistaken for bonaparte this song is written against grocers god made the wicked grocer for a mystery and a sign that men might shun the awful shops and go to inns and dine where the bacon's on the rafter and the wine is in the wood and god has made good laughter has seen that they are good the evil-hearted grocer would call his mother ma'am and bow at her and bob at her her aged soul to damn and rub his horrid hands and ask what article it was next though mortis in articulo should be her proper text his props are not his children but pert lads underpaid who call out cash and bang about to work his wicked trade he keeps a lady in a cage most cruelly all day and makes her count and calls her miss until she fades away the righteous minds of innkeepers induce them now and then to crack a bottle with a friend or treat unmoneyed men but who hath seen the grocer treat housemaids to his teas or crack a bottle of fish sauce or stand a man to cheese he sells the sands of araby as sugar for cash down he sweeps his shop and sells the dust the purest salt in town 
he crams the cans of poisoned meat poor subjects of the king and when they die by thousands why he laughs like anything the wicked grocer grosses in spirits and in wine not frankly and in fellowship as men in inns do dine but packed with soap and sardines and carried off by grooms for to be snatched by duchesses and drunk in dressing-rooms the hell instructed grocer has a temple made of tin and the ruin of good innkeepers is loudly urged therein but now the sands are running short from sugar of a sort the grocer trembles for his time just like his weight is short captain dalroy was getting considerably heated with his nautical liquor and his appreciation of pump's song was not merely noisy but active he leapt to his feet and waved his glass ye ought to be poet laureate hump ye're right ye're right we'll stand all this no longer he dashed wildly up the sand slope and pointed with the signpost towards the darkening shore where the low shed of corrugated iron stood almost isolated there's your tin temple he said let's burn it they were some way along the coast from the large watering place of pebblewick and between the gathering twilight and the rolling country it could not be clearly seen nothing was now in sight but the corrugated iron hall by the beach and three half-built red brick villas dalroy appeared to regard the hall and the empty houses with great malevolence look at it said he babylon he brandished the inn sign in the air like a banner and began to stride towards the place showering curses in forty days he called shall pebblewick be destroyed dogs shall lap the blood of j levison secretary and unicorns come back pat cried humphrey you've had too much rum lions shall howl in its high places vociferated the captain donkeys will howl anyhow said pump but i suppose the other donkey must follow and loading and untethering the quadruped he began to lead him along End of chapter 6、chapter、seven of the Flying Inn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter 7 The Society of Simple Souls. Under sunset, at once softer and more somber, under which the leaden sea took on a linton purple a tint appropriate to tragedy lady joan brett was once more drifting moodily along the sea-front the evening had been rainy and lowering the watering-place season was nearly over and she was almost alone on the shore but she had fallen into the habit of restlessly pacing the place and it seemed to satisfy some subconscious hunger in her rather mixed psychology Through all her brooding, her animal senses always remained abnormally active. She could smell the sea when it had ebbed almost to the horizon, and in the same way she heard, through every whisper of waves or wind, the swish or flutter of another woman's skirt behind her. There is, she felt, something unmistakable about the movements of a lady who is generally very dignified, and rather slow, and who happens to be in a hurry. She turned to look at the lady who was thus hastening to overtake her, lifted her eyebrows a little, and held out her hand. The interruption was known to her as Lady Enid Wimpole, cousin of Lord Ivywood, a tall and graceful lady who unbalanced her own elegance by a fashionable costume that was at once funereal and fantastic. Her fair hair was pale but plentiful. Her face was not only handsome and fastidious in the aquiline style, but when considered seriously, was sensitive, modest, and even pathetic. But her wan blue eyes seemed slightly prominent, with that expression of cold eagerness that is seen in the eyes of ladies who ask questions at public meetings. Joan Brett was herself, as she had said, a connection of the Ivywood family. But Lady Enid was Ivywood's first cousin, and for all practical purposes his sister, for she kept house for him and his mother, who was now so incredibly old 
that she only survived to satisfy conventional opinion in the character of a speechless and useless chaperone and ivywood was not the sort who would be likely to call out any activity in an old lady exercising that office nor for that matter was lady enid wimpole there seemed to shine on her the face of some kind of inhuman absent-minded common sense that shone on her cousins oh i'm so glad i've caught you up she said to joan lady ivywood wants you so much to come to us for the weekend or so while philip is still there he always admired your sonnet on cyprus so much and he wants to talk to you about this policy of his in turkey of course he's awfully busy but i shall be seeing him to-night after the meeting no living creature said lady joan with a smile ever saw him except before or after a meeting are you a simple soul asked lady enid carelessly am i a simple soul asked joan drawing her black brows together merciful heavens no what can you mean their meeting's on to-night at the small universal hall and philip's taking the chair explained the other lady he's very annoyed that he has to leave early to get up to the house but mr levison can take the chair for the last bit they've got misisra ammon got mrs who asked joan in honest doubt you make a game of everything said lady enid in cheerless amiability it's the man everyone's talking about you know as well as i do it's really his influence that has made the simple souls oh said lady joan brett then after a long silence she added who are the simple souls i should be interested in them if i could meet any and she turned her dark brooding face on the darkening purple sea do you mean to say my dear asked lady enid wimpole that you haven't met any of them yet no said joan looking at the last dark line of sea i never met but one simple soul in my life but you must come to the meeting cried lady enid with frosty and sparkling gaiety you must come at once philip is certain to be eloquent on a subject like this and of course misisra ammon is always so wonderful without any very distinct idea of where she was going or why she was going there joan allowed herself to be piloted to a low lead or tin shed beyond the last straggling hotels out of the echoing shell of which she could prematurely hear a voice that she thought she recognized when she came in lord ivywood was on his feet in exquisite evening dress but with a light overcoat thrown over the seat behind him beside him in less tasteful but more obvious evening dress was the little old man she had heard on the beach no one else was on the platform but just under it rather to joan's surprise sat miss browning her old typewriting friend in her old black dress industriously taking down lord ivywood's words in shorthand a yard or two off even more to her surprise sat miss browning's more domestic sister also taking down the same words in shorthand that is misisra ammon whispered lady enid earnestly pointing a delicate finger at the little old man beside the chairman i know him said joan where's the umbrella at least evident lord ivywood was saying that one of those ancestral impossibilities is no longer impossible the east and the west are one the east is no longer east nor the west west for a small isthmus has been broken and the atlantic and pacific are a single sea no man assuredly has done more of this mighty work of unity than the brilliant and distinguished philosopher to whom you will have the pleasure of listening to-night and i profoundly wish that affairs more practical for i will not call them more important did not prevent my remaining to enjoy his eloquence as i have so often enjoyed it before mr levison has kindly consented to take my place and i can do no more than express my deep sympathy with the aims and ideals which will be developed before you to-night i have long been increasingly convinced that underneath a certain mask of stiffness which the mohammedan religion has worn through certain centuries as a somewhat similar mask has been worn by the religion of the jews islam has in it the potentialities of being the most progressive of all religions so that a century or two to come we may see the cause of peace of science and of reform everywhere supported by islam as it is everywhere supported by israel 
not in vain i think is the symbol of that faith the crescent the growing thing while other creeds carry emblems implying more or less of finality for this great creed of hope its very imperfection is its pride and men shall walk fearlessly in new and wonderful paths following the increasing curve which contains and holds up before them the eternal promises of the orb it was characteristic of lord ivywood that though he was really in a hurry he sat down slowly and gravely amid the outburst of applause the quiet resumption of the speaker's seat like the applause itself was an artistic part of the peroration when the last clap or stamp had subsided he sprang up alertly his light great coat over his arm shook hands with the lecturer bowed to the audience and slid quickly out of the hall mr levison the swarthy young man with the drooping double eyeglass rather bashfully to the front took the empty seat on the platform and in a few words presented the eminent turkish mystic misisra ammon sometimes called the prophet of the moon lady joan found the prophet's english accent somewhat improved by good society but he still elongated the letter u in the same bleeding manner and his remarks had exactly the same rabidly wrong-headed ingenuity as his lecture upon english inns it appeared that he was speaking on the higher polygamy but he began with a sort of general defence of the moslem civilization especially against the charge of sterility and worldly ineffectiveness it is just in the practical things he was saying it is just in the practical things if you could come to consider them in a manner quite equal that our methods are better than your methods my ancestors invented the curved swords because one cuts better with a curved sword your ancestors possessed the straight swords out of some romantic fancy of being what you call straight or i will take a more plain example of which i have myself experience when i first had the honour of meeting lord ivywood i was unused to your various ceremonies and had a little difficulty just a little difficulty in entering mr claridge's hotel where his lordship had invited me a servant of the hotel was standing just beside me on the doorstep i stooped down to take off my boots and he asked me what i was doing i said to him my friend i am taking off my boots a smothered sound came from lady joan brett but the lecturer did not notice it and went on with a beautiful simplicity i told him that in my country when showing respect for any spot we do not take off our hats we take off our boots and because i would keep on my hat and take off my boots he suggested to me that i had been afflicted by allah in the head now was not that funny very said lady joan inside her handkerchief for she was choking with laughter something like a faint smile passed over the earnest faces of the two or three most intelligent of the simple souls but for most part the souls seemed very simple indeed helpless-looking people with limp hair and gowns like green curtains and their dry faces were as dry as ever but i explained to him i explained to him for a long time for a carefully occupied time that it was more practical more business-like more altogether for utility to take off the boots than to remove the hat let us i said to him consider what many complaints are made against the footwear what few complaints against the headwear you complain if in your drawing-rooms is the marching about of muddy boots are any of your drawing-rooms marked thus with the marching about of muddy hats how very many of your husbands kick you with the boot yet how few of your husbands on any occasion but you with the hat he looked round with a radiant seriousness which made lady joan almost as speechless for sympathy as she was for amusement with all that was most sound in his too complicated soul she realized the presence of a man really convinced the man on the doorstep he would not listen to me went on misisra ammon pathetically he said there would be a crowd if i stood on the doorstep holding in my hand my boots well i do not know why in your country 
you always send the young males to be the first of your crowds they certainly were making a number of noises the young males lady joan brett stood up suddenly and displayed enormous interest in the rest of the audience in the back parts of the hall she felt that if she looked for one moment more at the serious face with the jewish nose and the persian beard she would publicly disgrace herself or what was quite as bad for she was the generous sort of aristocrat publicly insult the lecturer she had a feeling that the sight of all the simple souls in bulk might have a soothing effect it had it had what might have been mistaken for a depressing effect lady joan resumed her seat with a controlled countenance now why asked the eastern philosopher do i tell so simple a little story of your london streets a thing happening any day the little mistake had no prejudicial effect lord ivywood came out at the end he made no attempt to explain the true view of so important matters to mr claridge's servant though mr claridge's servant remained on the doorstep but he commanded mr claridge's servant to restore to me one of my boots which had fallen down the front steps while i was explaining this harmlessness of the hat in the home so all was for me very well but why do i tell such little tales he spread out his hands again in his fan-like eastern style then he clapped them together so suddenly that joan jumped and looked instinctively for the entrance of five hundred negro slaves laden with jewels but it was only his emphatic gesture of eloquence he went on with an excited thickening of the accent because my friends this is the best example i could give of the wrong and slanderous character of the charge that we fail in our domesticities that we fail especially in our treatment of the womankind i appeal to any lady to any christian lady is not the boot more devastating more dreaded in the home than the hat the boot jumps he bound he run about he break things he leave on the carpet the earths of the garden the hat he remain quiet on his hat peg look at him on his hat peg how quiet and good he remain why not let him remain quiet also on his head lady joan applauded warmly as did several other ladies and the sage went on encouraged can you not therefore trust dear ladies this great religion to understand you concerning other things as it understands you regarding boots what is the common objection our worthy enemies make against our polygamy that it is disdainful of womanhood but how can this be so my friends when it allows the womanhood to be present in so large numbers when in your house of commons you put a hundred english members and just one little welsh member you do not say the welshman is on top he is our sultan may he live for ever if your jury contained eleven great large ladies and one little man you would not say this is unfair to the great large ladies why should you shrink then ladies from this great polygamical experiment which lord ivywood himself joan's dark eyes were still fixed on the wrinkled patient face of the lecturer but every word of the rest of the lecture was lost to her under her glowing spanish tint she had turned pale with extraordinary emotions but she did not stir a hair the door of the hall stood open and occasional sounds came even from that deserted end of the town two men seemed to be passing along the distant parade one of them was singing it was common enough for workmen to sing going home at night and the voice though a loud one would have been too far off for joan to hear the words only joan happened to know the words she could almost see them before her written in a round swaggering hand on a pink page of an old schoolgirl album at home she knew the words and the voice i come from castle patrick and my heart is on my sleeve and any sort of pistol boy can hit it with my leave it shines therefore an epaulette as golden as a flame as naked as me ancestors as noble as me name 
for i come from castle patrick and my heart is on my sleeve but a lady stole it from me on st gallo glasses eve startlingly and with strong pain there sprang up before joan's eyes a patch of broken heath with a very deep hollow of white sand blinding in the sun no words no name only the place the folks that live in liverpool their heart is in their boots they go to hell like lambs they do because they're hooter hoots where men may not be dancing though the wheels may dance all day and men may not be smoking but only chimneys may but i come from castle patrick and my heart is on my sleeve but a lady stole it from me on st polyander's eve the folks that live in black belfast their heart is in their mouth they see us making murders in the meadows of the south they think a plough's a wreck they do and cattle calls our creeds and they think we're burning witches when we're only burning weeds but i come from castle patrick and me heart is on me sleeve but a lady stole it from me on st barnabas eve the voice had stopped suddenly but the last lines were so much more distinct that it was certain the singer had come nearer and was not marching away it was only after all this and through a sort of cloud that lady joan heard the indomitable oriental bringing his whole eloquent address to a conclusion and if you do not refuse the sun that returns and rises in the east with every morning you will not refuse either this great social experiment this great polygamical method which also arose out of the east and always returns for this is that higher polygamy which always comes like the sun itself out of the orient but is only at its noontide splendor when the sun is high in heaven but she was vaguely conscious of mr levison the man with the dark face and the eyeglasses acknowledging the entrancing lecture in suitable terms and calling on any of the simple souls who might have questions to ask to ask them it was only when the simple souls had displayed their simplicity with the usual parade of well-bred reluctance and fussy self-effacement that any one addressed the chair and it was only after somebody had been addressing the chair for some time that joan gradually awoke to the fact that the address was somewhat unusual End of chapter 7 The Society of Simple Souls The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton Chapter 8 Vox Populi, Vox Dei I am sure, Mr. Levison, the secretary had said, with a somewhat constrained smile, that after the eloquent and epoch-making speech to which we have listened there will be some questions asked and we hope to have a debate afterwards i am sure somebody will ask a question then he looked interrogatively at one weary-looking gentleman in the fourth row and said mr hinch mr hinch shook his head with a pallid passion of refusal wonderful to watch and said i couldn't i really couldn't we should be very pleased said mr levison if any lady would ask a question in the silence that followed it was somewhat psychologically borne in on the whole audience that one particular great large lady as the lecturer would say sitting at the end of the second row was expected to ask a question her own waxwork immobility was witness both to the expectation and its disappointment. Are there any other questions? asked Mr. Levison, as if there had been any yet. He seemed to speak with a slight air of relief. There was a sort of stir at the back of the hall, and halfway down one side of it. Choked whispers could be heard of, Now then, Jarge! Go it, Jarge! Is there any questions? Gar! Mr. Levison looked up with an alertness somewhat akin to alarm. He realized for the first time that a few quite common men in coarse, unclean clothes had somehow strolled in through the open door. They were not true rustics, but the semi-rustic laborers that linger about the limits of the large watering places. There was no mister among them. There was a general tendency to call everybody George. 
Mr. Leveson saw the situation and yielded to it. He modeled himself on Lord Ivywood and did much what he would have done in all cases, but with a timidity Lord Ivywood would not have shown. And the same social training that made him ashamed to be with such men made him ashamed to own his shame. The same modern spirit that taught him to loathe such rags also taught him to lie about his loathing. I am sure we should be very glad, he said nervously, if any friends from outside care to join in our inquiry. Of course, we're all Democrats. And he looked round at the grand ladies with a ghastly smile. And believe in the voice of the people, and so on. If our friend at the back of the hall will put his question briefly, we need not insist, I think, on his putting it in writing. There were renewed hoarse encouragements to George, that rightly christened champion, and he wavered forward on legs tied in the middle with string. He did not appear to have had any seat since his arrival, and made his remarks standing halfway down what we may call the central aisle. "'Well, I want to ask the proprietor,' he began. "'Questions,' said Mr. Levison, swiftly seizing a chance for that construction of debate, which is the main business of a modern chairman, must be asked of the chair if they are points of order. If they concern the address, they should be asked of the lecturer. Well, I ask the lecturer, said the patient George, whether it ain't right that when you have the thing outside, you should have the thing inside. Horse applause at the back. Mr. Levison was evidently puzzled and already suspicious that something was quite wrong. But the enthusiasm of the prophet of the moon sprang up instantly at any sort of question and swept the chairman along with it. But it is the essence of our whole message, he cried, spreading out his arms to embrace the world, that the outer manifestation should be one with the inner manifestation. My friends! It is this very truth our friend has stated that is responsible for our apparent lack of symbolism in Islam. We appear to neglect the symbol because we insist on the satisfactory symbol. My friend in the middle will walk round all our mosques and say loudly, Where is the statue of Allah? But can my friend in the middle really execute a complete and generally approved statue of Allah? Miss Sisra Ammon sat down greatly satisfied with his answer, but it was doubted by many whether he had conveyed the satisfaction to his friend in the middle. That seeker after truth wiped his mouth with the back of his hand with an unsatisfied air and said, No offense, sir. But ain't it the law, sir, that if you have that outside, we're all right? I came in ear as natural as could be. But Gorlum, I never see a place like this afore. Hoarse laughter behind. No apology is needed, my friend, cried the eastern sage eagerly. I can conceive you are not perhaps duly conversant with such schools of truth. But the law is all, the law is Allah, the inmost unity of... Well, ain't it the law? repeated the dogged George, and every time he mentioned the law, the poor men, who are its chief victims, applauded loudly. I'm not one to make a fuss, I never was one to make a fuss, I'm a law-abiding man, I am. More applause. Ain't it the law that if so be such is your sign and such is your profession, you ought to serve us? I fear I not quite follow, cried the eager Turk. I ought to serve us, shouted a throng of thick voices from the back of the hall, which was already much more crowded than before. Serve you, cried Miss Sisra, leaping up like a spring released. The holy prophet came from heaven to serve you. The virtue and valor of a thousand years, my friend, has had no hunger but to serve you. We are of all faiths, the most the faith of service. Our highest prophet is no more than the servant of God, as I am, as you all are. 
even for our symbol we choose a satellite and honor the moon because it only serves the earth and does not pretend to be the sun i'm sure cried mr levison jumping up with a tactful grin that the lecturer has answered this last point in a most eloquent and effective way and the motor cars are waiting for some of the ladies who have come from some distance and i really think the proceedings all the artistic ladies were already getting on their wraps, with faces varying from bewilderment to blank terror. Only Lady Joan lingered, trembling with unexplained excitement. The hitherto speechless Hinch had slid up to the chairman's seat and whispered to him, You must get all the ladies away. I can't imagine what's up, but something's up. Well, repeated the patient George, so be it's the law. Where is it? Ladies and gentlemen, said Mr. Levison in his most ingratiating manner, I think we have had a most delightful evening and... No, we ain't! cried a new and nastier voice from a corner of the room. Where is it? That's what we got a right to know, said the law-abiding George. Where is it? Where's what? cried the nearly demented secretary in the chair. What do you want? The law-abiding Mr. George made a half-turn and a gesture towards the man in the corner and said, "'What's yours, Jim?' "'I'll have a drop of scotch,' said the man in the corner. Lady Enid Wimpole, who had lingered a little in loyalty to Joan, the only other lady still left, caught both her wrists and cried in a thrilling whisper, "'Oh, we must go to the car, dear. They're using the most awful language.' Away on the wettest edge of the sands by the sea, the prints of two wheels and four hoofs were being slowly washed away by a slowly rising tide, which was indeed the only motive of the man Humphrey Pump leading the donkey cart and leading it almost ankle deep in water. I hope you're sober again now, he said with some seriousness to his companion, a huge man, walking heavily and even humbly with a straight sword swinging to and fro at his hip, for honestly it was a mug's game to go and stick up the old sign before that tin place. I haven't often spoken to you like this, Captain, but I don't believe any other man in the county could get you out of the hole as I can. But to go down there and frighten the ladies, why there's been nothing so silly here since Bishop's folly. You could hear the ladies screaming before we left. I heard worse than that long before we left, said the large man without lifting his head. I heard one of them laugh. Christ, do you think I shouldn't hear her laugh? There was a silence. I didn't mean to speak sharp, said Humphrey Pump with that incorruptible kindliness which was the root of his Englishry, and may yet save the soul of the English. But it's the truth. I was pretty well bothered about how to get out of this business. You're braver than I am, you see, and I own I was frightened about both of us. If I hadn't known my way to the lost tunnel, I should be fairly frightened still. Known your way to what? asked the captain, lifting his red head for the first time. Oh, you know all about no more Ivywood's lost tunnel, said Pump carelessly. Why, we all used to look for it when we were boys. Only I happened to find it. Have mercy on an exile, said Delroy humbly. I don't know which hurt him most. The things he forgets are the things he remembers. Mr. Pump was silent for a little while and then said more seriously than usual. Well, the people from London say you must put up placards and statues and subscriptions and epitaphs and the Lord knows what to the people who found some new trick and made it come off. But only a man that knows his own land for forty miles round knows what a lot of people, and clever people too, there were who found new tricks and had to hide them because they didn't come off. There was Dr. Boone up by Gill and Hugby who held out against Dr. Collison and the vaccination. His treatment saved sixty patients who had got smallpox, and Dr. Collison's killed ninety-two patients who hadn't got anything. But Boone had to keep it dark, naturally because all his lady patients grew mustaches. It was a result of the treatment, but it wasn't a result he wishes to dwell on. Then there was old Dean Arthur who discovered balloons if ever a man did. He discovered them long before they were discovered, but people were suspicious about such things just then. 
there was a revival of the witch business in spite of all the parsons, and he had to sign a paper saying where he'd got the notion. Well, it stands to reason you wouldn't like to sign a paper saying you'd got it from the village idiot when you were both blowing soap bubbles. And that's all he could have signed, for he was an honest gentleman, the poor old dean. Then there was Jack Arlingham and the diving bell, but you remember all about that. Well, it was just the same with the man that made this tunnel, one of the mad ivy woods. There's many a man, Captain, that has a statue in the great London squares for helping to make the railway trains. There's many a man has his name in Westminster Abbey for doing something in discovering steamboats. Poor old Ivywood discovered both at once and had to be put under control. He had a notion that a railway train might be made to rush right into the sea and turn into a steamboat, and it seemed all right according as he worked it out. But his family were so ashamed of the thing that they didn't like the tunnel even mentioned. I don't think anybody knows where it is but me and Bungie Robinson. We shall be there in a minute or two. They've thrown the rocks about at this end and let the thick plantation grow at the other, but I've got a racehorse through before now to save it from Colonel Cheapstow's little games. And I think I can manage this donkey. Honestly, I think it's the only place we'll be safe in after what we've left behind us at the Pebblewick. But it's the best place in the world, there's no doubt, for lying low and starting afresh. Here we are. You think you can't get behind that rock, but you can. In fact, you have. Dalroy found himself with some bewilderment round the corner of a rock and in a long bore or barrel of blackness that ended in a very dim spot of green. Hearing the hoofs of the ass and the feet of his friend behind him, he turned his head, but could see nothing but the pitch darkness of a closed coal cellar. He turned again to the dim green speck, and marching forward was glad to see it grow larger and brighter like a big emerald, till he came out on a throng of trees, mostly thin but growing so thickly and so close to the cavernous entrance of the tunnel that it was quite clear the place was meant to be choked up by forests and forgotten. The light that came glimmering through the trees was so broken and tremulous that it was hard to tell whether it was daybreak or moonrise. I know there's water here, said Pump. They couldn't keep it out of the stonework when they made the tunnel, and old Ivy would hit the hydraulic engineer with a spirit level. With the bit of covert here and the sea behind us, we ought to be able to get food of one kind or another, when the cheese has given out, and donkeys can eat anything. By the way, he added with some embarrassment, you don't mind my saying it, Captain, but I think we'd better keep that room for rare occasions. It's the best room in England, and maybe the last, if these mad games are going on. It'll do us good to feel it's there, so we can have it when we want it. The cask's still nearly full. Dalroy put out his hand and shook the others. Hump, he said seriously, you're right. It's a sacred trust for humanity and we'll only drink it ourselves to celebrate great victories, in token of which I will take a glass now to celebrate our glorious victory over Levison and his tin tabernacle. He drained one glass and then sat down on the cask as if to put temptation behind him. His blue ruminant bull's eye seemed to plunge deeper and deeper into the emerald twilight of the trees in front of him, and it was long before he spoke again. At last he observed, I think you said, Hump, that a friend of yours, a gentleman named Bungy Robinson, I think, was also a habitué here? Yes, he knew the way, answered Pump, leading the donkey to the most suitable patch of pasturage. May we, do you think, have the pleasure of a visit from Mr. Robinson? inquired the captain. Not unless they're jolly careless up in Blackstone jails, replied Pump. And he moved the cheese well into the arch of the tunnel. Dalroy still sat with his square chin on his hand, staring at the mystery of the little wood. "'You seem absent-minded, Captain,' remarked Humphrey. "'The deepest thoughts are all commonplaces,' said Dalroy. "'That is why I believe in democracy, which is more than you do, you foul, blood-stained old British Tory. "'And the deepest commonplace of all is that vanitas vanitatem which is not pessimism, but is really the opposite of pessimism. It is man's futility that makes us feel he must be a god. And I think of this tunnel and how the poor old lunatic walked about on this grass, watching it being built, 
the soul in him on fire with the future. And he saw the whole world changed and the seas thronged with his new shipping. And now, and Dalroy's voice changed and broke, now there is good pasture for the donkey and it is very quiet here. Yes, said Pump, in some way that conveyed his knowledge that the captain was thinking of other things also. The captain went on dreamily. And I think about another Lord Ivywood recorded in history who also had a great vision. For it is a great vision, after all, and though the man is a prig, he is brave. He also wants to draw the tunnel between east and west to make the Indian Empire more British, to effect what he calls the orientation of England, and I call the ruin of Christendom. And I am wondering just now whether the clear intellect and courageous will of a madman will be strong enough to burst and drive that tunnel, as everything seems to show at this moment that it will, or whether there indeed be enough life and growth in your England to leave it at last as this is left, buried in English forests and wasted by an English sea. The silence fell between them again, and again there was only the slight sound the animal made in eating. As Dalroy had said, it was very quiet there. But it was not quiet in Pebblewick that night. When the riot act was read, and all the people who had seen the signboard outside fought all the people who hadn't seen the signboard outside, or when babies and scientists next morning, seeking for shells and other common objects of the seashore, found that their study included fragments of the outer clothing of Levison and scraps of corrugated iron. End of chapter 8 Recording by Nicola K. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton Chapter 9 The Higher Criticism and Mr. Hips Pebblewick boasted an enterprising evening paper of its own, called the Pebblewick Globe, and it was the great vaunt of the editor's life that he had got out an edition announcing the mystery of the vanishing signboard, almost simultaneously with its vanishing. In the rows that followed, sandwich men found no little protection from the blows indiscriminately given them behind and before in the large wooden boards they carried inscribed the vanishing pub pebblewick's fairy tale special and the paper contained a categorical and mainly correct account of what had happened or what seemed to have happened to the eyes of the amazed george and his crowd of sympathizers George Byrne, carpenter of this town, with Samuel Gripes, drayman in the service of Messrs. J. and Gubbins, brewers, together with a number of other well-known residents, passed by the new building erected on the West Beach for various forms of entertainment and popularly called the Small Universal Hall. Seeing outside it one of the old inn signs, now so rare, they drew the quite proper inference that the place retained the license to sell alcoholic liquors, which so many other places in this neighborhood have recently lost. The persons inside, however, appear to have denied all knowledge of the fact, and when the party, after some regrettable scenes in which no life was lost, came out on the beach again, it was found that the inn sign had been destroyed or stolen. All parties were quite sober and had indeed obtained no opportunity to be anything else. The mystery is underlying inquiry. But this comparatively realistic record was local and spontaneous, and owed not a little to the accidental honesty of the editor. Moreover, evening papers are often more honest than morning papers, because they are written by ill-paid and hard-worked underlings in a great hurry, and there is no time for more timid people to correct them. By the time the morning papers came out next day, a faint but perceptible change had passed over the story of the vanishing signboard. 
in the daily paper which had the largest circulation and the most influence in that part of the world the problem was committed to a gentleman known by what seemed to the non-journalistic world the singular name of hibbs however it had been affixed to him in jest in connection with the almost complicated caution with which all his public criticisms were qualified at every turn so that everything came to depend upon the conjunctions upon but and yet and though and similar words as his salary grew larger for editors and proprietors like that sort of thing and his old friends fewer for the most generous of friends cannot but feel faintly acid at a success which has in it nothing of the infectious flavour of glory he grew more and more to value himself as a diplomatist a man who always said the right thing but he was not without his intellectual nemesis for at last he became so very diplomatic as to be darkly and densely unintelligible people who knew him had no difficulty in believing that what he had said was the right thing the tactful thing the thing that should save the situation but they had great difficulty in discovering what it was in his early days he had had a great talent for one of the worst tricks of modern journalism the trick of dismissing the important part of a question and appearing to get to business on the unimportant part of it thus he would say whatever we may think of the rights and wrongs of the vivisection of pauper children we shall all agree that it should only be done in any event by fully qualified practitioners but in the later and darker days of his diplomacy he seemed rather to dismiss the important part of a subject and get to grips with some totally different subject following some timid and elusive train of associations of his own in his late bad manner as they say of painters he was just as likely to say whatever we may think of the rights and wrongs of the vivisection of pauper children no progressive mind can doubt that the influence of the vatican is on the decline his nickname had stuck to him in honor of a paragraph he was alleged to have written when the american president was wounded by a bullet fired by a lunatic in new orleans and which was said to have run the president passed a good night and his condition is greatly improved the assassin is not however a german as was at first supposed men stared at that mysterious conjunction till they wanted to go mad and to shoot somebody themselves hibbs however was a long lank man with straight yellowish hair and a manner that was externally soft and mild but secretly supercilious he had been when at cambridge a friend of levison and they had both prided themselves on being moderate politicians but if you have had your hat smashed over your nose by one who has very recently described himself as a law-abiding man and if you have had to run for your life with one coat-tail and encouraged to further bodily activity by having irregular pieces of a corrugated iron roof thrown after you by men more energetic than yourself you will find you emerge with emotions which are not solely those of a moderate politician hibbs however had already composed a leaderette on the pebblewick incident which rather pointed to the truth of the story so far as his articles ever pointed to anything his motives for veering vaguely in this direction were as usual complex he knew the millionaire who owned the paper had a hobby of spiritualism and something might always come out of not suppressing a marvellous story he knew that two at least of the prosperous artisans or small tradesmen who had attested the tale were staunch supporters of the party he knew that lord ivywood must be mildly but not effectually checked for lord ivywood was of the other party and there could be no milder or less effectual way of checking him than by allowing the paper to lend at least a temporary credit to a well-supported story that came from outside and certainly had not been like so many stories created in the office 
Amid all these considerations had Hibbs, however, steered his way to a more or less confirmatory article, when the sudden apparition of J. Levison's secretary in the sub-editor's room with a burst collar and broken eyeglasses led Mr. Hibbs into a long private conversation with him and a comparative reversal of his plans. But of course he did not write a new article. He was not of that divine order who make all things new. He chopped and changed his original article in such a way that it was something quite beyond the most bewildering article he had written in the past, and is still prized by those highly cultured persons who collect the worst literature of the world. It began, indeed, with the comparatively familiar formula, whether we take the more lax or the more advanced view of the old disputed problem of the morality or immorality of the wooden signboard as such, we shall all agree that the scenes enacted at Pebblewick were very discreditable to most, though not all, concerned. After that, tact degenerated into a riot of irrelevance. It was a wonderful article. The reader could get from it a faint glimpse of Mr. Hibbs's opinion on almost every other subject except the subject of the article. The first half of the next sentence made it quite clear that Mr. Hibbs, had he been present, would not have lent his active assistance to the massacre of St. Bartholomew or the massacres of September. But the second half of the sentence suggested with equal clearness that, since these two acts were no longer, as it were, in contemplation, and all attempts to prevent them would probably arrive a little late, he felt the warmest friendship for the French nation. He merely insisted that his friendship should never be mentioned except in the French language. It must be called an entente in the language taught to tourists by waiters. It must on no account be called an understanding, in a language understanded of the people. From the first half of the sentence following, it might safely be inferred that Mr. Hibbs had read Milton, or at least the passage about Sons of Belial. From the second half, that he knew nothing about bad wine, let alone good. The next sentence began with the corruption of the Roman Empire and contrived to end with Dr. Clifford. Then there was a weak plea for eugenics, and a warm plea against conscription, which was not true eugenics. That was all, and it was headed, The Riot at Pebblewick. Yet some injustice would be done to Hibbs, however, if we concealed the fact that this chaotic leader was followed by a quite a considerable mass of public correspondence. The people who write to newspapers are, it may be supposed, a small eccentric body, like most of those that sway a modern state. But at least, unlike the lawyers or the financiers or the members of Parliament or the men of science, they are people of all kinds scattered all over the country, of all classes, counties, ages, sects, sexes, and stages of insanity. The letters that followed Hibbs's article are still worth looking up in the dusty old files of his paper. A dear old lady in the densest part of the Midlands wrote to suggest that there might really have been an old ship wrecked on the shore during the proceedings. Mr. Levison may have omitted to notice it, or at that late hour of the evening it may have been mistaken for a signboard, especially by a person of defective sight. My own sight has been failing for some time, and I am still a diligent reader of your paper. If Mr. Hibbs's diplomacy had left one nerve in his soul undrugged, he would have laughed, or burst into tears, or got drunk, or gone into a monastery over a letter like that. As it was, he measured it with a pencil and decided that it was just too long to get into the column. Then there was a letter from a theorist, and a theorist of the worst sort. There is no great harm in the theorist who makes up a new theory to fit a new event. But the theorist who starts with a false theory and then sees everything as making it come true is the most dangerous enemy of human reason. The letter began like a bullet let loose by the trigger. Is not the whole question met by Exodus 4, 3? 
I enclose pamphlets in which I have proved the point quite plainly, and which none of the bishops or the so-called free church ministers have attempted to answer. The connection between the rod or pole and the snake so clearly indicated in Scripture is no less clear in this case. It is well known that those who follow after strong drink often announce themselves as having seen a snake. Is it not clear that those unhappy revelers beheld it in its transformed state as a pole? See also Deuteronomy 18.2. If our so-called religious leaders, etc. The letter went on for thirty-three pages, and Hibbs was perhaps justified in this case in thinking the letter rather too long. Then there was the scientific correspondent who said, Might it not be due to the acoustic qualities of the hall? He had never believed in the corrugated iron hall. The very word hall itself, he added playfully, was often so sharpened and shortened by the abrupt echoes of those repeated metallic curves that it had every appearance of being the word hell, and had caused many theological entanglements and some police prosecutions. In the light of these facts, he wished to draw the editor's attention to some very curious details about this supposed presence or absence of an inn sign. It would be noted that many of the witnesses, and especially the most respectable of them, constantly refer to something that is supposed to be outside. The word outside occurs at least five times in the depositions of the complaining persons. Surely, by all scientific analogy, we may infer that the unusual phrase in sign is an acoustic error for inside. The word inside would so naturally occur in any discussion either about the building or the individual when the debate was of a hygienic character. This letter was signed Medical Student and the less intelligent parts of it were selected for publication in the paper. Then there was a really humorous man who wrote and said there was nothing at all inexplicable or unusual about the case. He himself, he said, had often seen a signboard outside a pub when he went into it, and been quite unable to see it when he came out. This letter, the only one that had any quality of literature, was sternly set aside by Mr. Hibbs. Then came a cultured gentleman with a light touch, who merely made a suggestion. Had anyone read H. G. Wells' story about the kink in space? He contrived indescribably to suggest that no one had even heard of it except himself, or perhaps of Mr. Wells either. The story indicated that men's feet might be in one part of the world and their eyes in another. He offered the suggestion for what it was worth. The particular pile of letters on which Hibbs, however, threw it, showed only too clearly what it was worth. Then there was a man, of course, who called it all a plot of frenzied foreigners against Britain's shore. But as he did not make it quite clear whether the chief wickedness of these aliens had lain in sticking the sign up or in pulling it down, his remarks, the remainder of which referred exclusively to the conversational misconduct of an Italian ice-cream man whose side of the case seemed insufficiently represented, carried the less weight. And then, last, but the reverse of least, there plunged in all the people who think they can solve a problem they cannot understand by abolishing everything that has contributed to it. We all know these people. If a barber has cut his customer's throat because the girl has changed her partner for a dance or donkey ride on Hampstead Heath, there are always people to protest against the mere institutions that led up to it. This would not have happened if barbers were abolished, or if cutlery were abolished, or if the objection felt by girls to imperfectly grown beards were abolished, or if the girls were abolished, or if heaths and open spaces were abolished, or if dancing were abolished, or if donkeys were abolished. But donkeys, I fear, will never be abolished. There were plenty of such donkeys in the common land of this particular controversy. Some made it an argument against democracy, because poor George was a carpenter. 
Some made it an argument against alien immigration because Miss Isra Ammon was a Turk. Some proposed that ladies should no longer be admitted to any lectures anywhere because they had constituted a slight and temporary difficulty at this one without the faintest fault of their own. Some urged that all holiday resorts should be abolished. Some urged that all holidays should be abolished. Some vaguely denounced the seaside. Some still more vaguely proposed to remove the sea. All said that if this or that, stones or seaweed or strange visitors or bad weather or bathing machines were swept away with a strong hand, this which had happened would not have happened. They only had one slight weakness, all of them, that they did not seem to have the faintest notion of what had happened. And in this they were not inexcusable. Nobody did know what had happened. Nobody knows it to this day, of course, or it would be unnecessary to write this story. No one can suppose this story is written from any motive save that of telling the plain humdrum truth. That queer, confused cunning which was the only definable quality possessed by Hibbs, however, had certainly scored a victory so far, for the tone of the weekly papers followed him, with more intelligence and less trepidation. But they followed him. It seemed more and more clear that some kind of light and sceptical explanation was to be given of the whole business, and that the whole business was to be dropped. The story of the signboard and the ethical chapel of corrugated iron was discussed and somewhat disparaged in all the more serious and especially in the religious weeklies, though the low church papers seemed to reserve their distaste chiefly for the signboard and the high church papers chiefly for the chapel. All agreed that the combination was incongruous, and most treated it as fabulous. The only intellectual organs which seemed to think it might have happened were the spiritualist papers, and their interpretation had not that solidity which would have satisfied Mr. George. It was not until almost a year after that it was felt in philosophical circles that the last word had been said on the matter. An estimate of the incident and of its bearing on natural and supernatural history occurred in Professor Widge's celebrated Historicity of the Petropiscatorial Phenomena, which so profoundly affected modern thought when it came out in parts in the Hibbert Journal. Everyone remembers Professor Widge's main contention that the modern critic must apply to the thaumaturgics of the Lake of Tiberias the same principle of criticism which Dr. Bunk and others have so successfully applied to the thaumaturgics of the Canaan narrative. Authorities as final as Pink and Tosher, wrote the professor, have now shown with an emphasis that no emancipated mind is entitled to question that the aquavinic thaumaturgy at Cana is wholly inconsistent with the psychology of the master of the feast, as modern research has analyzed it, and indeed with the whole Judeo-Aramaic psychology at that stage of its development, as well as being painfully incongruous with the elevated ideals of the ethical teacher in question. But as we rise to higher levels of moral achievement, it will probably be found necessary to apply the Canaic principle to other and later events in the narrative. This principle has, of course, been mainly expounded by Husher, in the sense that the whole episode is unhistorical, while the alternative theory that the wine was non-alcoholic and was naturally infused into the water can claim on its side the impressive name of Minns. It is clear that if we apply the same alternative to the so-called miraculous draft of fishes, we must either hold with gilp that the fishes were stuffed representations of fishes artificially placed in the lake, see the Reverend y. Wise's Christo-Vegetarianism as a world system, where this position is forcibly set forth, or we must, on the Husherian hypothesis, deprive the piscatorial narrative of all claim to historicity whatever. The difficulty felt by the most daring critics, even Pook, in adopting this entirely destructive attitude is the alleged improbability of so detailed a narrative being founded on so slight a phrase as the anti-historical critics refer it to.
It is urged by Pook with characteristic relentless reasoning that, according to Husher's theory, a metaphorical but at least noticeable remark, such as, I will make you fishers of men, was expanded into a realistic chronicle of events which contains no mention, even in the passages evidently interpolated, of any men actually found in the nets when they were hauled up out of the sea, or, more properly, lagoon it must appear presumptuous or even bad taste for any one in the modern world to differ on any subject from pook but i would venture to suggest that the very academic splendour and unique standing of the venerable professor whose ninety-seventh birthday was so beautifully celebrated in chicago last year may have forbidden him all but intuitive knowledge of how errors arise among the vulgar i crave pardon for mentioning a modern case known to myself not indeed by personal presence but by careful study of all the reports which presents a curious parallel to such ancient expansions of a text into an incident in accordance with husher's law it occurred at pebblewick in the south of england the town had long been in a state of dangerous religious excitement the great religious genius who has since so much altered our whole attitude to the religions of the world misisra ammon had been lecturing on the sands to thousands of enthusiastic hearers their meetings were often interrupted both by children's services run on the most ruthless lines of orthodoxy and by the league of the red rosette the formidable atheist and anarchist organization as if this were not enough to swell the whirlpool of fanaticism the old popular controversy between the milnian and the complete sublapsarians broke out again on the fated beach it is natural to conjecture that in the thickening atmosphere of theology in pebblewick some controversialist quoted the text an evil and adulterous generation seek for a sign but no sign shall be given it save the sign of the prophet Jonas. A mind like that of Pook will find it hard to credit, but it seems certain that the effect of this text on the ignorant peasantry of southern England was actually to make them go about looking for a sign, in the sense of those old tavern signs now so happily disappearing. The sign of the prophet Jonas they somehow translated in their stunted minds into a signboard of the ship out of which Jonah was thrown. They went about literally looking for the sign of the ship, and there are some cases of their suffering Smale's hallucination and actually seeing it. The whole incident is a curious parallel to the gospel narrative and a triumphant vindication of Husher's law. Lord Ivywood paid a public compliment to Professor Widge, saying that he had rolled back from his country what might have been an ocean of superstitions. But, indeed, poor Hibbs had struck the first and stunning blow that scattered the brains of all men. End of chapter 9 Recording by Nicola K. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton Chapter 10 The Character of Poodle There lay about in Lord Ivywood's numerous gardens, terraces, outhouses, stable-yards, and similar places, a dog that came to be called by the name of Quoodle. Lord Ivywood did not call him Quoodle. Lord Ivywood was almost physically incapable of articulating such sounds. Lord Ivywood did not care for dogs. He cared for the cause of dogs, of course, and he cared still more for his own intellectual self-respect and consistency. He would never have permitted a dog in his house to be physically ill-treated, nor, for that matter, a rat, nor for that matter, even a man. But if Quoodle was not physically ill-treated, he was at least socially neglected, and Quoodle did not like it. For dogs care for companionship more than for kindness itself. 
Lord Ivywood would probably have sold the dog, but he consulted experts, as he did on everything he didn't understand, and many things that he did, and the impression he gathered from them was that the dog, technically considered, would fetch very little, mostly, it seemed, because of the mixture of qualities that it possessed. It was a sort of mongrel bull-terrier, but with rather too much of the bulldog, and this fact seemed to weaken its price as much as it strengthened its jaw. His lordship also gained a hazy impression that the dog might have been valuable as a watchdog if it had not been able to follow game like a pointer, and that even in the latter walk of life it would always be discredited by an unfortunate talent for swimming as well as a retriever. But Lord Ivywood's impressions may very well have been slightly confused, as he was probably thinking about the Black Stone of Mecca, or some such subject at the moment. The victim of this entanglement of virtues, therefore, still lay about in the sunlight of Ivywood, exhibiting no general result of that entanglement except the most appalling ugliness. Now, Lady Joan Brett did appreciate dogs. It was the whole of her type and a great deal of her tragedy that all that was natural in her was still alive under all that was artificial, and she could smell hawthorn or the sea as far off as a dog can smell his dinner. Like most aristocrats, she could carry cynicism almost to the suburbs of the city of Satan. She was quite as irreligious as Lord Ivywood, or rather more. She could be quite equally frigid or supercilious when she felt inclined, and in the great social talent of being tired, she could beat him any day of the week. But the difference remained in spite of her sophistries and ambitions, that her elemental communications were not cut, and his were. For her the sunrise was still the rising of a sun, and not the turning on of a light by a convenient cosmic servant. For her the spring was really the season in the country, and not merely the season in town. For her, cocks and hens were natural appendages to an English house, and not, as Lord Ivywood had proved to her from an encyclopedia, animals of Indian origin recently imported by Alexander the Great. And so, for her, a dog was a dog, and not one of the higher animals nor one of the lower animals, nor something that had the sacredness of life, nor something that ought to be muzzled, nor something that ought not to be vivisected. She knew that in every practical sense proper provision would be made for the dog, as indeed provision was made for the yellow dogs in Constantinople by Abdul Hamid, whose life Lord Ivywood was writing for the Progressive Potentate series. Nor was she in the least sentimental about the dog, or anxious to turn him into a pet. It simply came natural to her in passing, to rub all his hair the wrong way, and call him something which she instantly forgot. The man who was mowing the garden lawn looked up for a moment, for he had never seen the dog behave in exactly that way before. Quoodle arose, shook himself, and trotted on in front of the lady, leading her up an iron side staircase, of which, as it happened, she had never made use before. It was then, most probably, that she first took any special notice of him, and her pleasure like that which she took in the sublime profit from Turkey, was of a humorous character. For the complex quadruped had retained the bow legs of the bulldog, and seen from behind reminded her ridiculously of a swaggering little major waddling down to his coob. The dog and the iron stairway between them led her into a series of long rooms, 
one opening into the other. They formed part of what she had known in earlier days as the disused wing of the Ivywood house, which had been neglected or shut up, probably because it bore some defacements from the fancies of the mad ancestor, the memory of whom the present Lord Ivywood did not think helpful to his own political career, but it seemed to Joan that there were indications of a recent attempt to rehabilitate the place. There was a pail of whitewash in one of the empty rooms, a stepladder in another, here and there a curtain rod, and at last in the fourth room a curtain. It hung all alone on the old woodwork, but it was a very gorgeous curtain, being a kind of orange gold relieved with wavy bars of crimson, which somehow seemed to suggest the very spirit and presence of serpents though they had neither eyes nor mouths among them. In the next of the endless series of rooms she came upon a kind of ottoman, striped with green and silver, standing alone on the bare floor. She sat down on it from a mixed motive of fatigue and of impudence, for she dimly remembered a story which she had always thought one of the funniest in the world, about a lady only partly initiated in theosophy, who had been in the habit of resting on a similar object, only to discover afterward that it was a Mahatma covered with his eastern garment and prostrate and rigid in ecstasy. She had no hopes of sitting on a Mahatma herself, but the very thought of it made her laugh because it would make Lord Ivywood look such a fool. She was not sure whether she liked or disliked Lord Ivywood, but she felt quite certain that it would gratify her to make him look a fool. The moment she had sat down on the ottoman, the dog, who had been trotting beside her, sat down also, and on the edge of her skirt. After a minute or two she rose, and the dog rose, and she looked yet further down that long perspective of large rooms, in which men like Philip Ivywood forget that they are only men. The next was more ornate, and the next yet more so. It was plain that the scheme of decoration that was in progress had been started at the other end. She could now see that the long lane ended in rooms that from afar off looked like the end of a kaleidoscope. Rooms like nests made only from hummingbirds or palaces built of fixed fireworks. Out of this furnace of fragmentary colors, she saw Ivywood advancing toward her, with his black suit and his white face accented by the contrast. His lips were moving, for he was talking to himself, as many orators do. He did not seem to see her and she had to strangle a subconscious and utterly senseless cry, He is blind! The next moment he was welcoming her intrusion with the well-bred surprise and rather worldly simplicity suitable to such a case, and Joan fancied she understood why his face had seemed a little bleaker and blinder than usual. It was by contrast. He was carrying clutch to his forefinger, as his ancestors might have carried a falcon clutched to the wrist, a small, bright-colored, semi-tropical bird, the expression of whose head, neck, and eye was the very opposite of his own. Joan thought she had never seen a living creature with a head so lively and insulting. His provocative eye and pointed crest seemed to be offering to fight fifty gamecocks. It was no wonder, she told herself, that by the side of this gaudy gutter snipe with feathers, Ivywood's faint colored hair and frigid face looked like the hair and face of a corpse walking. You'll never know what this is, said Ivywood in his most charming manner. You've heard of him a hundred times and never had a notion of what he was. This is the bulbul. I never knew, replied Joan, 
i am afraid i never cared i always thought it was something like a nightingale ah yes answered ivywood but this is the real bulbul peculiar to the east pycnonotus hammerhus you are thinking of dahlia's golzi i suppose i am replied lady joan with a faint smile it is an obsession when shall i not be thinking of dahlia's galsworthy was it galsworthy then feeling quite touched by the soft austerity of her companion's face she caressed the gaudy and pugnacious bird with one finger and said it's a dear little thing the quadruped intimately called poodle did not approve of all this at all like most dogs he liked to be with human beings when they were silent and he extended a magnificent toleration to them as long as they were talking to each other but conversational attention paid to any other animal at all remote from a mongrel bull terrier wounded mr poodle in his most sensitive and gentlemanly feelings he emitted a faint growl joan with all the instincts that were in her bent down and pulled his hair about once more and felt the instant necessity of diverting the general admiration from pinknotus hammerhus she turned it to the decoration at the end of the refurnished wing for they had already come to the last of the long suite of rooms which ended in some unfinished but exquisite panelling in white and coloured woods inlaid in the oriental manner at one corner the whole corridor ended by curving into a round turret chamber overlooking the landscape and which joan who had known the house in childhood was sure was an innovation on the other hand a black gap still left in the lower left-hand corner of the oriental woodwork suddenly reminded her of something she had forgotten surely she said after much mere aesthetic ecstasy there used to be a staircase there leading to the old kitchen garden or the old chapel or something ivywood nodded gravely yes he said it did lead to the ruins of a medieval chapel as you say and the truth is it led to several things that i cannot altogether consider a credit to the family in these days all that scandal and joking about the unsuccessful tunnel your mother may have told you of it well it did us no good in the county i'm afraid so as it's a mere scrap of land bordering on the sea i have fenced it off and let it grow wild but i am boarding up the end of the room here for quite another reason i want you to come and see it he led her into the round corner turret in which the new architecture ended and joan with her thirst for the beautiful could not stifle a certain thrill of beatitude at the prospect five open windows of a light and exquisite saracenic outline looked out over the bronze and copper and purple of the autumn parks and forests to the peacock colors of the sea there was neither house nor living thing in sight and familiar as she had been with that coast she knew she was looking out from a new angle of vision on a new landscape of ivywood you can write sonnets said ivywood with something more like emotion in his voice than she had ever heard in it what comes first into your mind with these open windows i know what you mean said joan after a silence the same half oft yes he said that is how i felt of perilous seas and fairylands forlorn there was another silence and the dog sniffed round and round the circular turret chamber i want it to be like that said ivywood in a low and singularly moved intonation i want this to be the end of the house i want this to be the end of the world 
Don't you feel that this is the real beauty of all this Eastern art? That it is colored like the edges of things, like the little clouds of morning in the islands of the blessed. Do you know? And he lowered his voice yet more. It has the power over me of making me feel as if I were myself, absent and distant. Some oriental traveler who was lost and for whom men were looking. When I see that greenish lemon yellow enamel there let into the white, I feel that I am standing thousands of leagues from where I stand. You are right, said Joan, looking at him with some wonder. I have felt like that myself. This art, went on Ivywood as in a dream, does indeed take the wings of the morning and abide in the uttermost parts of the sea. They say it contains no form of life, but surely we can read its alphabet as easily as the red hieroglyphics of sunrise and sunset, which are on the fringes of the robe of God. I never heard you talk like that before, said the lady, and again stroked the vivid violet feathers of the small eastern bird. Mr. Quoodle could stand it no longer. He had evidently formed a very low opinion of the torrid chamber, and of oriental art generally, but seeing Joan's attention once more transferred to his rival, he trotted out into the longer room, and finding the gap in the woodwork which was soon to be boarded up, but which still opened on to an old dark staircase, he went galumphing down the stairs. Lord Ivywood gently placed the bird on the girl's own finger, and went to one of the open windows, leaning out a little. Look here, he said, doesn't this express what we both feel? Isn't this the sort of fairy tale house that ought to hang on the last wall of the world? and he motioned her to the window sill, just outside which hung the bird's empty cage, beautifully wrought in brass or some of the yellow metals. Why, that is the best of all, cried Lady Joan. It makes one feel as if it really were the Arabian Nights, as if this were a tower of the gigantic genie with turrets up to the moon, and this were an enchanted prince cage in a golden palace suspended by the evening star. Something stirred in her dim but teeming subconscious, something like a chill or change like that by which we half know that weather has altered or distant and unnoticed music suddenly ceased. Where is the dog? she asked suddenly. Ivy would turn with a mild gray eye. Was there a dog here? he asked. Yes, said Lady Joan Brett, and gave him back the bird, which he restored carefully to its cage. The dog, after whom she inquired, had in truth trundled down a dark, winding staircase and turned into the daylight, into a part of the garden he had never seen before, nor indeed had anybody else for some time past. It was altogether tangled and overgrown with weeds, and the only trace of human handiwork, the wreck of an old Gothic chapel, stood waist-high in numberless nettles and soiled with crawling fungoids. Most of these merely discolored the gray, crumbling stone with shades of bronze or brown, but some of them, particularly on the side farthest from the house, were of orange or purple tints almost bright enough for Lord Ivywood's oriental decoration. Some fanciful eyes that fell on the place afterward found something like an allegory in those graven and broken saints, or archangels, feeding such fiery and ephemeral parasites as those toadstools, like blood or gold. But Mr. Quoodle had never set himself up as an allegorist, and he merely trotted deeper and deeper into the gray-green English jungle. He grumbled very much at the thistles and nettles, almost as a city man will grumble at the jostling of a crowd. But he continued to press forward, with his nose near the ground, 
as if he had already smelt something that interested him. And indeed he had smelt something in which a dog, except on special occasions, he is much more interested than he is in dogs. Breaking through a last barrier of high and hoary purple thistles, he came out on a semicircle of somewhat clearer ground, dotted with slender trees, and having by way of back scene the brown brick arch of an old tunnel. The tunnel was boarded up with a very irregular fence or mask, made of motley wooden laths, and looked somehow rather like a pantomime cottage. In front of this, a sturdy man in very shabby shooting clothes was standing attending to a battered old frying pan, which he held over a rather irregular flame, which, small as it was, smelt strongly of burnt rum. In the frying pan, and also on the top of a cask or barrel, that served for a table hard by, were a number of the gray, brown, and even orange fungi which were plastered over the stone angels and dragons of the fallen chapel. Hello, old man, said the person in the shooting jacket with tranquility, and without looking up from his cooking. Come to pay us a visit. Come along, then. He flashed one glance at the dog and returned to the frying pan. If your tail were two inches shorter, you'd be worth a hundred pounds. Had any breakfast? The dog trotted across to him and began nosing and sniffing around his dilapidated leather gaiters. The man did not interrupt his cookery, on which his eyes were fixed and both his hands were busy, but he crooked his knee and foot so as to caress the quadruped in a nerve under the angle of the jaw, the stimulation of which, as some men of science have held, is for a dog what a good cigar is for a man. At the same moment, a huge voice like an ogre's came from within the masked tunnel, calling out, And who are ye talking to? A very crooked kind of window in the upper part of the pantomime cottage burst open, and an enormous head, with erect, startling, and almost scarlet hair, and blue eyes as big as a bullfrog's, was thrust out above the scene. Hump! cried the ogre. Me moral counsels have been thrown away. In the last week I've sung you fourteen and a half songs of me own composition, instead of which you go about stealing dogs. You're following in the path of Parson What's-His-Name in every way, I'm afraid. No, said the man with the frying pan, impartially. Parson White Lady struck a very good path for doubling on Pebblewick. That I was glad to follow. But I think he was quite silly to steal dogs. He was young and brought up pious. I know too much about dogs to steal one. Well, asked the large red-haired man, and how do you get a dog like that? I let him steal me, said the person, stirring the pan. And indeed the dog was sitting erect and even arrogant at his feet, as if he was a watchdog at a high salary, and had been there before the building of the tunnel. End of chapter 10 Recording by Bill Mosley, Frelsberg, Texas, USA Chapter 11 of The Flying Inn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter 11 Vegetarianism in the Drawing Room. The company that assembled to listen to the Prophet of the Moon on the next occasion of his delivering any formal address was much more select than the comparatively mixed and middle-class society of the simple souls. Miss Browning and her sister, Mrs. Mackintosh, were indeed present, for Lord Ivywood had practically engaged them both as private secretaries, and kept them pretty busy, too. There was also Mr. Levison, 
because Lord Ivywood believed in his organizing power, and also Mr. Hibbs, because Mr. Leverson believed in his political judgment, whenever he could discover what it was. Mr. Levison had straight, dark hair and looked nervous. Mr. Hibbs had straight, fair hair and also looked nervous. But the rest of the company were more of Ivywood's own world, or the world of high finance with which it mixes both here and on the continent. Lord Ivywood welcomed, with something approaching to warmth, a distinguished foreign diplomatist, who was indeed none other than the silent German representative who had sat beside him in that last conference on the island of the Olives. Dr. Gluck was no longer in his quiet black suit, but wore an ornate diplomatic uniform with a sword and Prussian, Austrian, or Turkish orders, for he was going on from Ivywood to a function at court but his curl of red lips, his screw of black moustache, and his unanswering almond eyes had no more changed than the face of a wax figure in a barber's shop window. The prophet had also effected an improvement in his dress. When he had orated on the sands, his costume, except for the fez, was the shabby but respectable costume of any rather unsuccessful English clerk but now that he had come among aristocrats who petted their souls as they did their senses, there must be no such incongruity. He must be a proper, fresh-picked oriental tulip or lotus. So, he wore long, flowing robes of white, relieved here and there by flame-colored threads of tracery, and round his head was a turban of a kind of pale golden green. He had to look as if he had come flying across Europe on the magic carpet, or fallen a moment before from his paradise in the moon. The ladies of Lord Ivywood's world were much as we have already found them. Lady Enid Wimpole still overwhelmed her earnest and timid face with a tremendous costume that was more like a procession than a dress. It looked rather like the funeral procession of Aubrey Beardsley. Lady Joan Brett still looked like a very beautiful Spaniard with no illusions left about her castle in Spain. The large and resolute lady who had refused to ask any questions at Misaizra's earlier lecture, and who was known as Lady Crump, the distinguished feminist, still had the air of being so full and bursting with questions fatal to man as to have passed the speaking and reached the speechless stage of hostility. Throughout the proceedings she contributed nothing but bursting silence and a malevolent eye. And old Lady Ivywood, under the oldest and finest lace and the oldest and finest manners, had a look like death on her, which can often be seen in the parents of pure intellectuals. She had that face of a lost mother that is more pathetic than the face of a lost child. "'And what are you going to delight us with today?' Lady Enid was asking of the prophet. "'My lecture,' answered Misaizra gravely, "'is on the pig.' It was part of a simplicity really respectable in him that he never saw any incongruity in the arbitrary and isolated texts or symbols out of which he spun his thousand insane theories. Lady Enid endured the impact of this singular subject for debate without losing that expression of wistful sweetness which she wore on principle when talking to such people. "'The pig, he is a large subject,' continued the prophet, making curves in the air as if embracing some particularly prized specimen. "'He includes many subjects. It is to me very strange that the Christians should so laugh and be surprised because we hold ourselves to be defiled by pork, we and also another of the peoples of the book.' but surely you Christians yourselves consider the pig as a manner of pollution, since it is your most usual expression of your despising, of your very great dislike. You say swine, my dear lady. You do not say animals far more unpopular, such as the alligator. I see, said the lady. How wonderful! If you are annoyed, went on the encouraged and excited gentleman, if you are annoyed with anyone, with a, what you say, a lady's maid, you do not say to her, horse. You do not say to her, camel. Ah, no, said Lady Enid earnestly. 
pig of a lady's maid, you say in your colloquial English, continued the prophet triumphantly. And yet, this great and awful pig, this monster whose very name, when whispered, you think will wither all your enemies, you allow, my dear lady, to approach yet closer to you. You incorporate this great pig in the substance of your own person. Lady Enid Wimpole was looking a little dazed at last, at this description of her habits, and Joan gave Lord Ivywood a hint that the lecturer had better be transferred to his legitimate sphere of lecturing. Ivywood led the way into a larger room that was full of ranked chairs, with a sort of lectern at the other end, and flanked on all four sides, with tables laden with all kinds of refreshments. It was typical of the strange, half-fictitious enthusiasm and curiosity of that world, that one long table was set out entirely with vegetarian foods, especially of an eastern sort, like a table spread in the desert for a rather fastidious Indian hermit, but that tables covered with game patties, lobster and champagne, were equally provided, and very much more frequented. Even Mr. Hibbs, who would honestly have thought entering a public house more disgraceful than entering a brothel, could not connect any conception of disgrace with Lord Ivywood's champagne. For the purpose of the lecture was not wholly devoted to the great and awful pig, and the purpose of the meeting even less. Lord Ivywood, the white furnace of whose mind was always full of new fancies hardening into ambitions, wanted to have a debate on the diet of East and West, and felt that Miss Istra might very appropriately open with an account of the Moslem veto on pork, or other coarse forms of flesh food. He reserved it to himself to speak second. The prophet began, indeed, with some of his dizziest flights. He informed the company that they, the English, had always gone in hidden terror and loathing of the pig as a sacred symbol of evil. He proved it by the common English custom of drawing a pig with one's eyes shut. Lady Joan smiled, and yet she asked herself, in a doubt that had been darkening round her about many modern things lately, whether it was really much more fanciful than many things the scientists told her, as the traces of marriage by capture which they found in that ornamental and even frivolous being the best man. He said that the dawn of greater enlightenment is shown in the use of the word gammon, which still expresses disgust at the porcine image, but no longer fear of it, but rather a rational disdain and disbelief. Rowley, said the prophet solemnly, and then after a long pause, holy gammon and spinach. Lady Joan smiled again, but again asked herself if it was much more far-fetched than a history book she had read, which proved the unpopularity of Catholicism in Tudor times from the word hocus-pocus. He got into a most amazing labyrinth of philology between the red primeval sins of the first pages of Genesis and the common English word ham. But again, Joan wondered whether it was much wilder than the other things she had heard said about primitive man by people who had never seen him. He suggested that the Irish were set to keep pigs because they were a low and defiled caste, and the serfs of the pig-scorning Saxon. And Joan thought it was about as sensible as what the dear old archdeacon had said about Ireland years ago, which had caused an Irishman of her acquaintance to play the Shan Van Vaux and then smash the piano. Joan Brett had been thoughtful for the last few days. It was partly due to the scene in the turret, where she had struck a sensitive and artistic side of Philip Ivywood she had never seen before, and partly to disturbing news of her mother's health, which, though not menacing, made her feel hypothetically how isolated she was in the world. On all previous occasions she had merely enjoyed the mad lecturer now at the reading desk, Today she felt a strange desire to analyze him, and imagine how a man could be so connected, and so convinced, and yet so wildly wide of the mark. As she listened carefully, looking at the hands in her lap, she began to think she understood. The lecturer did really try to prove that the porcine image had never been used in English history or literature except in contempt. 
and the lecturer really did know a very great deal about english history and literature much more than she did much more than the aristocrats round her did but she noticed that in every case what he knew was a fragmentary fact in every case what he did not know was the truth behind the fact what he did not know was the atmosphere what he did not know was the tradition she found herself ticking off the cases like counts in an indictment miss isra ammon knew what next to none of the english present knew that richard the third was called a boar by an eighteenth-century poet and a hog by a fifteenth-century poet what he did not know was the habit of sport and of heraldry he did not know what joan knew instantly though she had never thought of it before in her life that beasts courageous and hard to kill are noble beasts by the law of chivalry therefore the boar was a noble beast and a common crest for great captains miss isra tried to show that richard had only been called a pig after he was cold pork at bosworth miss isra ammon knew what next to none of the english present knew that there never was such a person as lord bacon the phrase is a falsification of what should be lord verulam or lord st albans what he did not know was exactly what joan did know though it had never crossed her mind till that moment that when all is said and done a title is a sort of joke while a surname is a serious thing bacon was a gentleman and his name was bacon whatever titles he took but miss isra seriously tried to prove that bacon was a term of abuse applied to him during his unpopularity or after his fall miss isra ammon knew what next to none of the english present knew that the poet shelley had a friend called hogg who treated him on one occasion with grave treachery he instantly tried to prove that the man was only called hogg because he had treated shelley with grave treachery and he actually adduced the fact that another poet practically contemporary was called hogg as completing the connection with shelley what he did not know was just what joan had always known without knowing it the kind of people concerned the traditions of aristocrats like the shelleys or of borderers like the ettrick shepherd the lecturer concluded with a passage of impenetrable darkness about pig iron and pigs of lead which joan did not even venture to understand she could only say that if it did not mean that some day our diet might become so refined that we ate lead and iron she could form no fancy of what it did mean can philip ivywood believe this kind of thing she asked herself and even as she did so philip ivywood rose he had as pitt and gladstone had an impromptu classicism of diction his words wheeling and deploying into their proper places like a well-disciplined army in its swiftest advance and it was not long before joan perceived that the last phase of the picture obscure and monstrous as it seemed gave ivywood exactly the opening he wanted indeed she felt no doubt that he had arranged for it beforehand it is within my memory said lord ivywood though it need in no case have encumbered yours that when it was my duty to precede the admired lecturer whom i now feel it a privilege even to follow i submitted a suggestion which however simple would appear to many paradoxical i affirmed or implied the view that the religion of mahomet was in a peculiar sense a religion of progress this is so contrary not only to historical convention but to common platitude that i shall find no ground either of surprise or censure if it takes a perceptible time before it sinks into the mind of the english public but i think ladies and gentlemen that this period is notably abbreviated by the remarkable exposition which we have heard to-day for this question of the attitude of islam toward food affords as excellent an example of its special mode of progressive purification as the more popular example of its attitude toward drink for it illustrates that principle which i have ventured to call the principle of the crescent the principle of perpetual growth toward an implied and infinite perfection 
the great religion of islam does not of itself forbid the eating of flesh foods but in accordance with that principle of growth which is its life it has pointed the way to a perfection not yet perhaps fully attainable by our nature it has taken a plain and strong example of the dangers of meat-eating and hung up the repellent carcass as a warning and a sign in the gradual emergence of mankind from a gross and sanguinary mode of sustenance the semite has led the way he has led as it were a symbolic embargo upon the beast typical the beast of beasts with the instinct of the true mystic he selected for exemption from such cannibal feasts the creature which appeals to both sides of the higher vegetarian ethic the pig is at once the creature whose helplessness most moves our pity and whose ugliness most repels our taste it would be foolish to affirm that no difficulty arises out of the different stages of moral evolution in which the different races find themselves thus it is constantly said and such things are not said without some excuse in document or incident that followers of the prophet have specialized in the arts of war and have come into a contact not invariably friendly with those hindus of india who have specialized in the arts of peace in the same way the hindus it must be confessed have been almost as much in advance of islam in the question of meat as islam is in advance of christianity in the matter of drink it must be remembered again and again ladies and gentlemen that every allegation we have of any difference between hindu and moslem comes through a christian channel and is therefore tainted evidence but in this matter even can we not see the perils of disregarding such plain danger signals as the veto on pork did not an empire nearly slip out of our hands because our hands were greased with cow fat and did not the well of kaunpur brim with blood instead of water because we would not listen to the instinct of the oriental about the shedding of sacred blood but if it be proposed with whatever graduation to approach that repudiation of flesh food which buddhism mainly and islam partly recommends it will always be asked by those who hate the very vision of progress where do you draw the line may i eat oysters may i eat eggs may i drink milk you may you may eat or drink anything essential to your stage of evolution so long as you are evolving toward a clearer and cleaner ideal of bodily life if he said gravely i may employ a phrase of flippancy I would say that you may eat six dozen oysters to-day, but I should strongly advise five dozen oysters to-morrow. For how else has all progress in public or private manners been achieved? Would not the primitive cannibals be surprised at the strange distinction we draw between men and beasts? All historians pay high honor to the Huguenots and the great Huguenot prince, Henri Quatre none need deny that his aspiration that every frenchman should have a chicken in his pot was for the period a high aspiration it is no disrespect to him that we mounting to higher levels and looking down longer perspectives consider the chicken and this august march of discovery passes figures higher than that of henry of navarre i shall always have a high place as islam has always given a high place to that figure, mythical or no, which we find presiding over the foundations of Christianity. I cannot doubt that the fable, incredible and revolting otherwise, which records the rush of swine into the sea, was an allegory of his early realization that a spirit, evil indeed, does reside in all animals in so far as they tempt us to devour them. I cannot doubt that the prodigal leaving his sins among the swine is another illustration of the great thesis of the prophet of the moon but here also progress and relativity are relentless in their advance and not a few of us may have risen to-day to the point of regretting that the joyful sounds around the return of the prodigal should be marred by the moaning of a calf for the rest he who asks us whither we go knows not the meaning of progress if we come at last to live on light as men said of the chameleon if some cosmic magic closed to us now as radium was but recently closed 
allows us to transmute the very metals into flesh without breaking into the bloody house of life, we shall know these things when we have achieved them. It is enough for us now if we have achieved a spiritual station, in which at least the living head we lop has not eyes to reproach us, and the herbs we gather cannot cry against our cruelty like the mandrake. Lord Ivywood resumed his seat, his colourless lips still moving. By some previous arrangement, probably, Mr. Levison rose to move a motion about vegetarianism. Mr. Levison was of opinion that the Jewish and Moslem veto on pork had been the origin of vegetarianism. He thought it was a great step, and showed how progressive the creed could be. He thought the persecution of the Hindus by Muslims had probably been much exaggerated. He thought our experience in the Indian mutiny showed we considered the feeling of Easterners too little in such matters. He thought vegetarianism in some ways an advance on Orthodox Christianity. He thought we must be ready for yet further advances, and he sat down. And as he had said precisely, clause by clause, everything that Lord Ivywood had said, it is needless to say that that nobleman afterward congratulated him on the boldness and originality of his brilliant speech. At a similar sort of preconcerted signal, Hibbs, however, rose rather vaguely to his feet to second the motion. He rather prided himself on being a man of few words in the vocal sense. He was no orator as Brutus was. It was only with pen in hand, in an office lined with works of reference, that he could feel that sense of confused responsibility that was the one pleasure of his life. But on this occasion he was brighter than usual, partly because he liked being in a lord's house, partly because he had never tasted champagne before, and he felt as if it agreed with him, partly because he saw in the subject of progress an infinite opportunity of splitting hairs. Whatever, said Hibbs, with a solemn cough, Whatever we may think of the old belief that Moslems have differed from Buddhism in a regrettable way, there can be no doubt the responsibility lay with the Christian churches. Had the free churches put their foot down and met Messrs. Opelstein's demand, we should have heard nothing of these old differences between one belief and another. As it was, it reminded him of Napoleon. He gave his own opinion for what it was worth, but he was not afraid to say at any cost, even there and in that company, that this business of Asiatic vegetation had occupied less of the time of the Wesleyan Conference than it should have done. He would be the last to say, of course, that any one was in any sense to blame. They all knew Dr. Kuhn's qualifications. They all knew as well as he did that a more strenuous social worker than Charles Chatter had never rallied the forces of progress. But that which was not really an indiscretion might be represented as an indiscretion, and perhaps we had had enough of that just lately. It was all very well to talk about coffee, but it should be remembered, with no disrespect to those in Canada to whom we owe so much, that all that happened before 1891. No one had less desire to offend our ritualistic friends than he did, but he had no hesitation in saying that the question was a question that could be asked, and though no doubt, from one point of view, the goats... Lady Joan moved sharply in her chair as if gripped by sudden pain, and indeed she had suddenly felt the chronic and recurrent pain of her life. She was brave about bodily pain, as are most women, even luxurious women but the torment that from time to time returned and tore her was one to which many philosophical names have been given, but no name so philosophical as boredom. She felt she could not stand a minute more of Mr. Hibbs. She felt she would die if she heard about the goats, from one or any point of view. She slipped from her chair and somehow slid round the corner in pretense of seeking one of the tables of refreshment in the new wing. She was soon among the new oriental apartments, now almost completed. But she took no refreshments, though attenuated tables could still be found here and there. She threw herself on an ottoman, and stared toward the empty and elfin turret chamber, in which Ivywood had made her understand that he also 
could thirst for beauty and desire to be at peace. He certainly had a poetry of his own, after all, a poetry that never touched earth, the poetry of Shelley rather than Shakespeare. His phrase about the fairy turret was true. It did look like the end of the world. It did seem to teach her that there is always some serene limit at last. She started and half rose on her elbow with a small laugh. A dog of ludicrous but familiar appearance came shuffling toward her, and she lifted herself in the act of lifting him. She also lifted her head and saw something that seemed to her, in a sense more Christian and catastrophic, very like the end of the world. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of the Flying Inn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter Twelve: Vegetarianism in the Forest. Humphrey Pump's cooking of a fungus in an old frying pan, which he had found on the beach, was extremely typical of him. He was, indeed, without any pretense of book learning, a certain kind of scientific man that science has really been unfortunate in losing. He was the old-fashioned English naturalist, like Gilbert White or even Isaac Walton, who learned things not academically like an American professor, but actually like an American Indian. And every truth a man has found out as a man of science is always subtly different from any truth he has found out as a man, because a man's family, friends, habits, and social type have always got well under way before he has thoroughly learned the theory of anything. For instance, any eminent botanist at a soiree of the Royal Society could tell you, of course, that other edible fungi exist, as well as mushrooms and truffles. But long before he was a botanist, still less an eminent botanist, he had begun, so to speak, on a basis of mushrooms and truffles. He felt, in a vague way, that these were really edible, that mushrooms were a moderate luxury proper to the middle classes, while truffles were a much more expensive luxury, more suitable to the smart set but the old English naturalists, of whom Isaac Walton was perhaps the first, and Humphrey Pump perhaps the last, had in many cases really begun at the other end, and found by experience, often most disastrous experience, that some fungi are wholesome and some are not, but the wholesome ones are, on the whole, the majority. So a man like Pump was no more afraid of a fungus as such than he was of an animal as such, he no more started with the supposition that a grey or purple growth on a stone must be a poisonous growth than he started with the supposition that a dog who came to him out of the wood must be a mad dog. Most of them he knew. Those he did not know he treated with rational caution, but to him, as a whole race, these weird-hued and one-legged goblins of the forests were creatures friendly to man. You see he said to his friend, the captain, eating vegetables isn't half bad, so long as you know what vegetables there are, and eat all of them that you can. But there are two ways where it goes wrong among the gentry. First, they've never had to eat a carrot or a potato, because it was all there was in the house. So they've never learned how to be really hungry for carrots, as that donkey might be. They only know the vegetables that are meant to help the meat. They know you take duck and peas, and when they turn vegetarian, they can only think of the peas without the duck. They know you take lobster in a salad, and when they turn vegetarian, they can only think of the salad without the lobster. But the other reason is worse. There's plenty of good people, even round here, and still more in the north, who get meat very seldom. But then, when they do get it, they gobble it up like good uns but the trouble with the gentry is different. The trouble is, the same sort of gentry that don't want to eat meat don't really want to eat anything. The man called a vegetarian who goes to Ivywood House is generally like a cow trying to live on a blade of grass a day. You and I, Captain, 
have pretty well been vegetarians for some time, so as not to break into the cheese, and we haven't found it so difficult because we eat as much as we can. It's not so difficult as being teetotalers, answered Dalroy, so as not to break into the cask. But I'll never deny that I feel the better for that, too, on the whole. But only because I could leave off being one whenever I chose. And, now I come to think of it, he cried with one of his odd returns of animal energy, if I'm to be a vegetarian, why shouldn't I drink? Why shouldn't I have a purely vegetarian drink? Why shouldn't I take vegetables in their highest form, so to speak? The modest vegetarians ought obviously to stick to wine or beer, plain vegetarian drinks, instead of filling their goblets with the blood of bulls and elephants, as all conventional meat-eaters do, I suppose. What is the matter? Nothing, answered Pump. I was looking out for somebody who generally turns up about this time, but I think I'm fast. I should never have thought so from the look of you, answered the captain, but what I'm saying is that the drinking of decent fermented liquor is just simply the triumph of vegetarianism. Why, it's an inspiring idea. I could write a sort of song about it, as, for instance, You will find me drinking rum like a sailor in a slum, you will find me drinking beer like a Bavarian. You will find me drinking gin in the lowest kind of inn, because I am a rigid vegetarian. Why, it's a vista of verbal felicity and spiritual edification. It has I not know how many hundred aspects. Let's see, how could the second verse go? Something like, So I cleared the inn of wine, and I tried to climb the sign, and I tried to hail the constable as Marion. But he said I couldn't speak, and he bowled me to the beak, because I was a happy vegetarian. I really think something instructive to the human race may come out of all this. Hello, is that what you're looking for? The quadruped quoodle came in out of the woods a whole minute later than the usual time, and took his seat beside Humphrey's left foot with a preoccupied air. "'Good old boy,' said the captain. "'You seem to have taken quite a fancy to us. "'I doubt, Hump, if he's properly looked after up at the house. "'I particularly don't want to talk against Ivywood, Hump. "'I don't want his soul to be able, in all eternity, "'to accuse my soul of a mean detraction. "'I want to be fair to him, because I hate him like hell, "'and he has taken from me all for which I lived. "'But I don't think, with all this in my mind, I don't think I say anything beyond what he would own himself, for his brain is clear, when I say that he could never understand an animal. And so he could never understand the animal side of a man. He doesn't know to this day, Hump, that your sight and hearing are sixty times quicker than his. He doesn't know that I have a better circulation. That explains the extraordinary people he picks up and acts with. He never looks at them as you and I look at that dog. There was a fellow calling himself Gluck, who was, mainly by Ivywood's influence, I believe, his colleague on the Turkish conferences, being supposed to represent Germany. My dear Hump, he was a man that a great gentleman like Ivywood ought not to have touched with a barge pole. It's not the race he was, if it was one race, it's the sort he was, a coarse, common, Levantine Nark and Eavesdropper. But you mustn't lose your temper, Hump. I implore you, Hump, to control this tendency to lose your temper when talking at any length about such people. Have recourse, Hump, to that consoling system of versification which I have already explained to you. Oh, I knew a Dr. Gluck, and his nose it had a hook, and his attitudes were anything but Aryan so I gave him all the pork that I had upon a fork, because I am myself a vegetarian. If you are, said Humphrey Pump, you'd better come and eat some vegetables. The white hat can be eaten cold, or raw for that matter, but blood spots want some cooking. You are right, Hump, said Dalroy, seating himself with every appearance of speechless greed. I will be silent. As the poet says, I am silent in the club, I am silent in the pub, I am silent on a bally peak in Darien, 
for i stuff away for life shoving peas in with a knife because i am at heart a vegetarian he fell to his food with great gusto dispatched a good deal of it in a very short time threw a glance of gloomy envy at the cask and then sprang to his feet again he caught up the inn sign from where it leant against the pantomime cottage and planted it like a pike in the ground beside him then he began to sing again in an even louder voice than before o lord ivywood may lop and his privilege is sylvan and riparian and is also free to top but do you know said hump also finishing his lunch that i'm rather tired of that particular tune tired is it said the indignant irishman then i'll sing you a longer song to an even worse tune about more and more vegetarians and you shall see me dance as well and i shall dance till you burst into tears and offer me the half of your kingdom and i shall ask for mr levison's head on the frying pan for this let me tell you is a song of oriental origin celebrating the caprices of an ancient babylonian sultan and should be performed in palaces of ivory with palm trees and a bulbul accompaniment and he began to bellow another and older lyric of his own on vegetarianism nebuchadnezzar the king of the jews suffered from new and original views he crawled on his hands and knees it said with grass in his mouth and a crown on his head with a wow tie etc those in traditional paths that trod thought the thing was a curse from god but a pioneer men always abuse like nebuchadnezzar the king of the jews dalroy as he sang this actually began to dance about like a ballet girl an enormous and ridiculous figure in the sunlight waving the wooden sign around his head quoodle opened his eyes and pricked up his ears and seemed much interested in these extraordinary evolutions suddenly with one of those startling changes that will transfigure the most sedentary dogs quoodle decided that the dance was a game and began to bark and bound round the performer sometimes leaping so far into the air as almost to threaten the man's throat but though the sailor naturally knew less about dogs than the countryman he knew enough about them as about many other things not to be afraid and the voice he sang with might have drowned out the baying of a pack black lord foulon the frenchman slew thought it a futurist thing to do he offered them grass instead of bread so they stuffed him with grass when they cut off his head with a wow tiedly etc for the pride of his soul he perished then but of course it is always the pride that men a man in advance of his age accuse like nebuchadnezzar the king of the jews simeon scudder of sticks in maine thought of the thing and was at it again he gave good grass and water in pails to a thousand irishmen hammering rails with a wow tiedly etc appetites differ and tied to a stake he was tarred and feathered for conscience sake but stoning the prophets is ancient news like nebuchadnezzar the king of the jews in an abandon unusual even for him he had danced his way down through the thistles into the jungle of weeds risen round the sunken chapel and the dog now fully convinced that it was not only a game but an expedition perhaps a hunting expedition ran barking in front of him along the path that his own dog's paws had already burst through the tangle before patrick dalroy well knew what he was doing or even remembered that he still carried the ridiculous signboard in his hand he found himself outside the open porch of a sort of narrow tower at the angle of a building which to the best of his recollection he had never seen before Quoodle instantly ran up four or five steps in the dark staircase inside, and then, lifting his ears again, looked back for his companion. There is, perhaps, such a thing as asking too much of a man. If there is, it was asking too much of Patrick Dalroy to ask him not to accept so eccentric an invitation. Hurriedly plunging his unwieldy wooden ensign upright in the thick of thistles and grass, he bent his gigantic neck and shoulders to enter the porch and proceeded to climb the stairs 
it was quite dark, and it was only after at least two twists of the stone spiral that he saw light ahead of him, and then it was a sort of rent in the wall that seemed to him as ragged as the mouth of a Cornish cave. It was also so low that he had some difficulty in squeezing his bulk through it, but the dog had jumped through with an air of familiarity, and once more looked back to see him follow. If he had found himself inside any ordinary domestic interior, he would instantly have repented his escapade and gone back. But he found himself in surroundings which he had never seen before, or even, in one sense, believed possible. His first feeling was that he was walking in the most sealed and secret suite of apartments in the castle of a dream. All the chambers had that air of perpetually opening inwards which is the soul of the Arabian Nights. And the ornament was of the same tradition, gorgeous and flamboyant, yet featureless and stiff. A purple mansion seemed to be built inside a green mansion, and a golden mansion inside that. And the quaintly cut doorways or fretted lattices all had wavy lines like a dancing sea, and for some reason, seasickness for all he knew, this gave him a feeling as if the place were beautiful but faintly evil, as if it were bored and twisted for the fallen palace of the worm. But he had also another sensation which he could not analyze, for it reminded him of being a fly on the ceiling or the wall. Was it the hanging gardens of Babylon coming back to his imagination, or the castle east of the sun and west of the moon? Then he remembered that in some boyish illness he had stared at a rather moorish sort of wallpaper, which was like rows and rows of brightly colored corridors, empty and going on forever. And he remembered that a fly was walking along one of the parallel lines, and it seemed to his childish fancy that the corridors were all dead in front of the fly, but all came to life as he passed. "'By George!' he cried. "'I wonder whether that's the real truth about East and West.' that the gorgeous East offers everything needed for adventures except the man to enjoy them. It would explain the tradition of the Crusades uncommonly well. Perhaps that's what God meant by Europe and Asia. We dress the characters, and they paint the scenery. Well, anyhow, three of the least Asiatic things in the world are lost in this endless Asiatic palace, a good dog, a straight sword, and an Irishman but as he went down this telescope of tropical colors, he really felt something of that hard fatalistic freedom of the heroes, or should we say villains, in the Arabian Nights. He was prepared for any impossibility. He would hardly have been surprised if from under the lid of one of the porcelain pots standing in a corner had come a serpentine string of blue or yellow smoke, as if some wizard's oil were within he would hardly have been surprised if from under the curtains or closed doors had crawled out a snaky track of blood, or if a dumb negro dressed in white had come out with a bowstring, having done his work. He would not have been surprised if he had walked suddenly into the still chamber of some sultan asleep, whom to wake was a death in torments. And yet he was very much more surprised by what he did see, and when he saw it, he was certain at last that he was only wandering in the labyrinth of his own brain, for what he saw was what was really in the core of all his dreams. What he saw, indeed, was more appropriate to that inmost eastern chamber than anything he had imagined. On a divan of blood-red and orange cushions lay a startlingly beautiful woman, with a skin almost swarthy enough for an Arab's, and who might well have been the princess proper to such an Arabian tale. But in truth it was not her appropriateness to the scene, but rather her inappropriateness, that made his heart bound. It was not her strangeness, but her familiarity, that made his big feet suddenly stop. The dog ran on yet more rapidly, and the princess on the sofa welcomed him warmly, lifting him on his short hind legs. Then she looked up and seemed turned to stone. Bismillah, said the oriental traveller affably, may your shadow never grow less, or more, as the ladies would say. The commander of the faithful has deputed his least competent slave to bring you back a dog. 
owing to temporary delay in collecting the fifteen largest diamonds in the moon he has been compelled to send the animal without any collar those responsible for the delay will instantly be beaten to death with the tails of dragons the frightful shock which had not yet left the lady's face brought him back to responsible speech in short he said in the name of the prophet dog i say joan i wish this wasn't a dream it isn't said the girl speaking for the first time and i don't know yet whether i wish it was well argued the dreamer rationally what are you any time if you are not a dream or a vision and what are all these rooms if they aren't a dream or rather a nightmare this is the new wing of ivywood house said the lady addressed as joan speaking with great difficulty lord ivywood has fitted them up in the eastern style he is inside conducting a most interesting debate in defence of eastern vegetarianism i only came out because the room was rather hot vegetarian cried dalroy with abrupt and rather unreasonable exasperation that table seems to fall a bit short of vegetarianism and he pointed to one of the long narrow tables laid somewhere in almost all the central rooms and loaded with elaborate cold meats and expensive wines he must be liberal-minded cried joan who seemed to be on the verge of something possibly temper he can't expect people suddenly to begin being vegetarians when they've never been before it has been done said dalroy tranquilly walking across to look at the table i say your ascetical friends seem to have made a pretty good hole in the champagne you may not believe it joan but i haven't touched what you call alcohol for a month with which words he filled with champagne a large tumbler intended for claret cup and swallowed it at a draught lady joan brett stood up straight but trembling now what's really wrong pat she cried oh don't be silly you know i don't care about the alcohol or all that but you're in the man's house uninvited and he doesn't know that wasn't like you he shall know all right said the large man quietly i know the exact price of a tumbler of that champagne and he scribbled some words in pencil on the back of a bill of fare on the table and then carefully laid three shillings on top of it and there you do philip the worst wrong of all cried lady joan flaming white you know as well as i do anyhow that he would not take your money patrick dalroy stood looking at her for some seconds with an expression on his broad and unusually open face which she found utterly puzzling curiously enough he observed at last and with absolutely even temper curiously enough it is you who are doing philip ivywood a wrong i think him quite capable of breaking england or creation but i do honestly think he would never break his word and what is more i think the more arbitrary and literal his word had been the more he would keep it you will never understand a man like that till you understand that he can have devotion to a definition even a new definition he can really feel about an amendment to an act of parliament inserted at the last moment as you feel about england or your mother oh don't philosophize cried joan suddenly can't you see this has been a shock i only want you to see the point he replied lord ivywood clearly told me with his own careful lips that i might go in and pay for fermented liquor in any place displaying a public sign outside and he won't go back on that definition or on any definition if he finds me here he may quite possibly put me in prison on some other charge as a thief or a vagabond or what not but he will not grudge me the champagne and he will accept the three shillings and i shall honour him for his glorious consistency i don't understand said joan one word of what you are talking about which way did you come how can i get you away you don't seem to grasp that you're in ivywood house you see there's a new name outside the gate observed patrick conversationally and led the lady to the end of the corridor by which he had entered 
and into its ultimate turret chamber. Following his indications, Lady Joan peered a little over the edge of the window, where hung the brilliant purple bird in its brilliant golden cage. Almost immediately below, outside the entrance to the half-closed stairway, stood a wooden tavern sign, as solid and still as if it had been there for centuries. "'All back at the sign of the old ship, you see,' said the captain. "'Can I offer you anything in a ladylike way?' There was a vast impudence in the slight, hospitable movement of his hand that disturbed Lady Joan's features with an emotion other than any she had desired to show. "'Well,' cried Patrick, with wild geniality, "'I've made you laugh again, my dear.' He caught her to him as in a whirlwind, and then vanished from the fairy turret like a blast, leaving her standing with her hand up to her wild black hair. End of chapter 12「Thirteen of the Flying Inn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter 13. The Battle of the Tunnel. What Joan Brett really felt, as she went back from the second tete-a-tete -tete she had experienced in the turret, it is doubtful if any one will ever know but she was full of the pungent feminine instinct to drive at practice, and what she did clearly realize was the pencil-writing Dalroy had left on the back of Lord Ivywood's menu. Heaven alone knew what it was, and, as it pleased her profane temper to tell herself, she was not satisfied with heaven alone knowing. She went swiftly back, with swishing skirts, to the table where it had been left, but her skirts fell more softly, and her feet trailed slower and more in her usual manner as she came near the table. For standing at it was Lord Ivywood, reading the card with tranquil lowered eyelids that set off perfectly the long and perfect oval of his face. He put down the card with a quite natural action, and, seeing Joan, smiled at her in his most sympathetic way. "'So you've come out, too,' he said, so have I. It's really too hot for anything. Dr. Gluck is making an uncommonly good speech, but I couldn't stop even for that. Don't you think my eastern decorations are rather a success, after all? A sort of vegetarianism in design, isn't it? He led her up and down the corridors, pointing out lemon-colored crescents or crimson pomegranates in the scheme of ornament, with such utter detachment that they twice passed the open mouth of the hall of debate, and Joan could distinctly hear the voice of the diplomatic Gluck saying, Indeed, we owe our knowledge of the pollution of the pork primarily to the Jews and not the Mavlumth. I do not fear that prejudice against the Jews, which is too common in my family and all the aristocratic and military Prussian families. I think we Prussian aristocrats owe everything to the Jews. The Jews have given to our old Teutonic rugged virtues just that touch of refinement, just that intellectual superiority which... And then the voice would die away behind, as Lord Ivywood lectured luxuriantly, and very well, on the peacock tail in decoration, or some more extravagant eastern version of the Greek key. But the third time they turned, they heard the noise of subdued applause, and the breaking up the meeting and people came pouring forth. With stillness and swiftness, Ivywood pitched on the people he wanted and held them. He buttonholed Levison, and was evidently asking him to do something which neither of the two liked doing. "'If your lordship insists,' she heard Levison whispering, "'of course I will go myself, but there is a great deal to be done here with your lordship's immediate matters, and if there were any one else,' If Philip, Lord Ivywood, had ever looked at a human being in his life, he would have seen that J. Levison, secretary, was suffering from a very ancient human malady, excusable in all men, and rather more excusable in one who has had his top hat smashed over his eyes and has run for his life. As it was, he saw nothing but merely said, Oh, well, get someone else. What about your friend Hibbs? 
levison ran across to hibbs who was drinking another glass of champagne at one of the innumerable buffets hibbs said levison rather nervously will you do lord ivywood a favour he says you have so much tact it seems possible that a man may be hanging about the grounds just below that turret there he is a man it would certainly be lord ivywood's public duty to put into the hands of the police if he is there but then again he is quite capable of not being there at all i mean of having sent his message from somewhere else and in some other way naturally lord ivywood doesn't want to alarm the ladies and perhaps turn the laugh against himself by getting up a sort of police raid about nothing he wants some sensible tactful friend of his to go down and look around the place it's a sort of disused garden and report if there's any one about i'd go myself but i'm wanted here hibbs nodded and filled another glass but there's a further difficulty went on levison he's a clever brute it seems a remarkable and a dangerous man were his lordship's words and it looks as if he'd spotted a very good hiding place a disused tunnel leading to the sands just beyond the disused garden and chapel it's a smart choice you see for he can bolt into the woods if any one comes from the shore or on to the shore if any one comes from the woods but it would take a good time even to get the police here and it would take ten times longer to get em round to the sea end of the tunnel especially as the sea comes up to the cliffs once or twice between here and pebblewick so we mustn't frighten him away or he'll get a start if you meet any one down there talk to him quite naturally and come back with the news we won't send for the police till you come talk as if you were just wandering like himself his lordship wishes your presence to appear quite accidental wishes my presence to appear quite accidental repeated hibbs gravely when the feverish levison had flashed off satisfied hibbs took a glass or two more of wine feeling that he was going on a great diplomatic mission to please a lord then he went through the opening picked his way down the stair and somehow found his way out into the neglected garden and shrubbery it was already evening, and an early moon was brightening over the sunken chapel with its dragon-colored scales of fungus. The night breeze was very fresh, and had a marked effect on Mr. Hibbs. He found himself taking a meaningless pleasure in the scene, especially in one fungus that was white with brown spots. He laughed shortly, to think that it should be white with brown spots. Then he said, with carefully accurate articulation, his lordship wishes my presence to appear quite accidental then he tried to remember something else that levison had said he began to wade through the waves of weed and thorn past the chapel but he found the soil much more uneven and obstructive than he had supposed he slipped and sought to save himself by throwing one arm round a broken stone angel at a corner of the heap of gothic fragments but it was loose and rocked in its socket Mr. Hibbs presented for a moment the appearance of waltzing with the angel in the moonlight in a very amorous and irreverent manner. Then the statue rolled over one way, and he rolled over the other, and lay on his face in the grass, making inaudible remarks. He might have lain there for some time, or at least found some difficulty in rising, but for another circumstance. The dog Quoodle, with characteristic officiousness, had followed him down the dark stairs and out of the doorway, and, finding him in this unusual posture, began to bark as if the house were on fire. This brought a heavy human footstep from the more hidden parts of the copse, and in a minute or two the large man with the red hair was looking down at him in undisguised wonder. Hibbs said, in a muffled voice which came obscurely from under his hidden face, wish my presence to appear quite accidental it does said the captain can i help you up are you hurt he gently set the prostrate gentleman on his feet and looked genuinely concerned the fall had somewhat sobered lord ivywood's representative and he really had a red graze on his left cheek that looked more ugly than it was i am so sorry said patrick dalroy cordially come and sit down in our camp 
my friend pump will be back presently and he's a capital doctor his friend pump may or may not have been a capital doctor but the captain himself was certainly a most inefficient one so small was his talent for diagnosing the nature of a disease at sight that having given mr hibbs a seat on a fallen tree by the tunnel he proceeded to give him in mere automatic hospitality a glass of rum mr hibbs eyes awoke again when he had sipped it but they awoke to a new world wherever may be our individual pinions he said and looked into space with an expression of humorous sagacity he then put his hand lazily in his pocket as if to find some letter he had to deliver he found nothing but his old journalistic notebook which he had often carried when there was a chance of interviewing anybody the feel of it under his fingers changed the whole attitude of his mind he took it out and said and what would you say of vegetarianism colonel pump i think it palls replied the recipient of this complex title staring shall we say asked hibbs brightly turning a leaf in his notebook shall we say long been strong vegetarian by conviction no i have only once been convicted answered dalroy with restraint and i hope to lead a better life when i come out hopes lead better life murmured hibbs writing eagerly with the wrong end of his pencil and what would you say was best vegetable food for really strong vegetarian by conviction thistles said the captain warily but i don't know much about it you know lord ivy was strong vegetarian by conviction said mr hibbs shaking his head with unction lord ivy was says tact talk to him naturally and so i do that's what i do talk to him naturally humphrey pump came through the clearer part of the wood leading the donkey who had just partaken of the diet recommended to a vegetarian by conviction the dog sprang up and ran to them pump was perhaps the most naturally polite man in the world and said nothing but his eyes had accepted with one snap of surprise the other fact also not unconnected with diet which had escaped dalroy's notice when he administered rum as a restorative lord ivy was says murmured the journalistic diplomatist lord ivy was says talk as if you were just wandering that's it that's tact that's what i've got to do talk as if i was just wandering long way round to other end tunnel sea and cliffs don't suppose they can swim he seized his notebook again and looked in vain for his pencil good subject correspondence can policemen swim policemen said dalroy in a dead silence the dog looked up and the innkeeper did not get to ivy wo one thing reasoned the diplomatist get policemen beach other end other thing no good do one thing not do other thing no good do other thing not do other thing wish my presence appear quite accidental ha i'll harness the donkey said pump will he go through that door asked dalroy with a gesture toward the entrance of the rough boarding with which they had faced the tunnel or shall i smash it all at once he'll go through all right answered pump i saw to that when i made it and i think i'll get him to the safe end of the tunnel before i load him up the best thing you can do is pull up one of those saplings to bar the door with that'll delay em a minute or two though i think we've got warning in pretty easy time he led his donkey to the cart and carefully harnessed the donkey like all men cunning in the old healthy sense he knew that the last chance of leisure ought to be leisurely in order that it may be lucid then he led the whole equipment through the temporary wooden door of the tunnel the inquisitive quoodle of course following at his heels excuse me if i take a tree said dalroy politely to his guest like a man reaching across another man for a match and with that he rent up a young tree by its roots as he had done on the island of the olives 
and carried it on his shoulder like the club of Hercules. Up in Ivywood House, Lord Ivywood had telephoned twice to Pebblewick. It was a delay he seldom suffered, and, though he never experienced impatience in unnecessary words, he expressed it in unnecessary walking. He would not yet send for the police without news from his ambassador, but he thought a preliminary conversation with some police authorities he knew well might advance matters. Seeing Levison rather shrunk in a corner, he wheeled round in his walk and said abruptly, "'You must go and see what has happened to Hibbs. If you have any other duties here, I authorize you to neglect them. Otherwise I can only say—' At this moment the telephone rang, and the impatient nobleman rushed for his delayed call with a rapidity he seldom showed. There was simply nothing for Levison to do except to do as he was told, or be sacked. He walked swiftly toward the staircase, and only stopped once at the table where Hibbs had stood, and gulped down two goblets of the same wine. But let no man attribute to Mr. Levison the loose and luxurious social motives of Mr. Hibbs. Mr. Levison did not drink for pleasure. In fact, he hardly knew what he was drinking. His motive was something far more simple and sincere, a sentiment forcibly described in legal phraseology as going in bodily fear. He was partly nerved, but by no means reconciled to his adventure, when he crept carefully down the stairs and peered about the thicket for any signs of his diplomatic friend. He could find neither distant sight nor a sound to guide him, except a sort of distant singing, which greatly increased in volume of sound as he pursued it. The first words he heard seemed to run something like, No more the milk of cows shall pollute my private house, than the milk of the wild mares of the barbarian. I shall stick to port and sherry, for they are so very, very, so very, very, very vegetarian. Levison did not know the huge and horrible voice in which these words were shouted, but he had a most strange and even sickening suspicion that he did know the voice, however altered, the quavering and rather refined voice that joined in the chorus and sang, Because they are so veggie, so veggie, 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 vegetarian. Terror lit up his wits, and he made a wild guess at what had happened. With a gasp of relief, he realized that he had now good excuse for returning to the house with the warning. He ran there like a hare, still hearing the great voice from the woods like the roaring of a lion in his ear. He found Lord Ivywood in consultation with Dr. Gluck, and also with Mr. Bullrose the agent, whose frog-like eyes hardly seemed to have recovered yet from the fairy tale of the flying signboard in the English lane but who, to do him justice, was more plucky and practical than most of Lord Ivywood's present advisers. "'I'm afraid Mr. Hibbs has inadvertently,' stammered Levison. "'I'm afraid he has... I'm afraid the man is making his escape, my lord. You had better send for the police.' Ivywood turned to the agent. "'You go and see what's happening,' he said simply. "'I will come myself when I've rung them up and get some of the servants up with sticks and things. Fortunately, the ladies have gone to bed. Hello, is that the police station? Bullrose went down into the shrubbery and had, for many reasons, less difficulty in crossing it than the hilarious Hibbs. The moon had increased to an almost unnatural brilliancy, so that the whole scene was like a rather silver daylight, and in this clear medium he beheld a very tall man with erect red hair and a colossal cylinder of cheese carried under one arm, while he employed the other to wag a big forefinger at a dog with whom he was conversing. It was the agent's duty and desire to hold the man, whom he recognized from the signboard mystery, in play and conversation, and prevent his final escape. But there are some people who really cannot be courteous, even when they want to be, and Mr. Bullrose was one of them. "'Lord Ivywood,' he said abruptly, "'wants to know what you want.' "'Do not, however, fall into the common error, Quoodle,' Dalroy was saying to the dog, whose unfathomable eyes were fixed on his face. 
of supposing that the phrase good dog is used in its absolute sense. A dog is good or bad negatively to a limited scheme of duties created by human civilization. What are you doing here? said Mr. Bullrose. A dog, my dear Quoodle, continued the captain, cannot be either so good or so bad as a man. Nay, I should go farther. I would almost say a dog cannot be so stupid as a man. He cannot be utterly wanting as a dog, as some men are as men. Answer me, you there, roared the agent. It is all the more pathetic, continued the captain, to whose monologue Quoodle seemed to listen with magnetized attention. It is all the more pathetic because this mental insufficiency is sometimes found in the good, though there are, I should imagine, at least an equal number of opposite examples. The person standing a few feet off us, for example, is both stupid and wicked. But be very careful, Quoodle, to remember that any disadvantage under which we place him should be based on the moral and not his mental defects. Should I say to you at any time, go for him, Quoodle, or hold him, Quoodle, be certain in your own mind, please, that it is solely because he is wicked and not because he is stupid that I am entitled to do so. The fact that he is stupid should not justify me in saying, hold him, Quoodle, with the realistic intonation I now employ. Curse you, call him off, cried Mr. Bullrose, retreating, for Quoodle was coming toward him, with the bulldog part of his pedigree very prominently displayed like a pennon. Should Mr. Bullrose find it expedient to climb a tree, or even a signpost, proceeded Dalroy, for indeed the agent had already clasped the pole of the old ship, which was stouter than the slender trees standing just around it, you will keep an eye on him, Quoodle, and, I doubt not, constantly remind him that it is his wickedness, and not, as he might hastily be inclined to suppose, stupidity that has placed him on so conspicuous an elevation. Some of you'll wish yourself dead for this, said the agent, who was by this time clinging to the wooden sign like a monkey on a stick, while Kudo watched him from below with an unsated interest. Some of you'll see something. Here comes his lordship and the police, I reckon. Good morning, my lord, said Dalroy, as Ivywood, paler than ever in the strong moonshine, came through the thicket toward them. It seemed to be his fate that his faultless and hueless face should always be contrasted with richer colors for even now it was thrown up by the gorgeous diplomatic uniform of Dr. Gluck, who walked just behind him. "'I'm glad to see you, my lord,' said Dalroy, in a stately manner. "'It is always so awkward doing business with an agent, especially for the agent.' "'Captain Dalroy,' said Lord Ivywood, with a more serious dignity, "'I am sorry we meet again like this, and such things are not of my seeking.' It is only right to tell you that the police will be here in a moment. Quite time, too, said Dalroy, shaking his head. I never saw anything so disgraceful in my life. Of course, I am sorry it's a friend of yours, and I hope the police will keep Ivywood House out of the papers. But I won't be a party to one law for the rich and another for the poor, and it would be a great shame if a man in that state got off altogether merely because he had got the stuff at your house. I do not understand you, said Lord Ivywood. What are you talking of? Why, of him, replied the captain with a genial gesture toward a fallen tree trunk that lay a yard or two from the tunnel wall. The poor chap the police are coming for. Lord Ivywood looked at the forest log by the tunnel which he had not glanced at before, and in his pale eyes, perhaps for the first time, stood a simple astonishment. Above the log appeared two duplicate objects, which, after a prolonged stare, he identified as the soles of a pair of patent leather shoes, offered to his gaze, as if demanding his opinion in the matter of re-soling. They were all that was visible of Mr. Hibbs, who had fallen backward off his woodland seat, and seemed contented with his new situation. His lordship put up the pince-nez that made him look ten years older, 
and said with a sharp, steely accent, What is all this? The only effect of his voice upon the faithful Hibbs was to cause him to feebly wave his legs in the air in recognition of a feudal superior. He clearly considered it hopeless to attempt to get up, so Dalroy, striding across to him, lugged him up by his shirt collar and exhibited him, limp and wild-eyed, to the company. "'You won't want many policemen to take him to the station,' said the captain. "'I'm sorry, Lord Ivywood. I'm afraid it's no use your asking me to overlook it again. We can't afford it.' And he shook his head implacably. "'We've always kept a respectable house, Mr. Pump and I. The old ship has a reputation all over the country, in quite a lot of different parts, in fact. People in the oddest places have found it a quiet family house.' nothing gat about in the old ship. And if you think you can send all your staggering revelers, Captain Dalroy, said Ivywood simply, you seem to be under a misapprehension, which I think it would be hardly honorable to leave undisturbed. Whatever these extraordinary events may mean, and whatever be fitting for the case of this gentleman, when I spoke of the police coming, I meant they were coming for you and your confederate. For me? cried the captain, with a stupendous air of surprise. Why, I have never done anything naughty in my life. You have been selling alcohol contrary to Clause 5 of the act of— But I've got a sign, cried Dalroy excitedly. You told me yourself it was all right if I'd got a sign. Oh, do look at our new sign, the sign of the agile agent. Mr. Bullrose had remained silent, feeling his position none of the most dignified, and hoping his employer would go away. But Lord Ivywood looked up at him, and thought he had wandered into a planet of monsters. As he slowly recovered himself, Patrick Dalroy said briskly, All quite correct and conventional, you see. You can't run us in for not having a sign. We've rather an extra lifelike one. And you can't run us in as rogues and vagabonds either visible means of subsistence, and he slapped the huge cheese under his arm with his great flat hand, so that it reverberated like a drum. Quite visible. Perceptible, he added, holding it out suddenly almost under Lord Ivywood's nose. Perceptible to the naked eye through your lordship's eyeglasses. He turned abruptly, burst open the pantomime door behind him, and bowled the big cheese down the tunnel with a noise like thunder, which ended in a cry of acceptation in the distant voice of Mr. Humphrey Pump. It was the last of their belongings left at this end of the tunnel, and Dalroy turned again, a man totally transfigured. "'And now, Ivywood,' he said, "'what can I be charged with? Well, I have a suggestion to make. I will surrender to the police quite quietly when they come, if you will do me one favor. Let me choose my crime.' I don't understand you, answered the other coolly. What crime? What favor? Captain Dalroy unsheathed the straight sword that still hung on his now shabby uniform. The slender blade sparkled pleasantly in the moonlight as he pointed it straight at Dr. Gluck. Take away his sword from the little pawnbroker, he said. It's about the length of mine, or will change if you like. Give me ten minutes on that strip of turf and then it may be, Ivy Wood, that I shall be removed from your public path in a way a little worthier of enemies who have once been friends than if you tripped me up with Bow Street runners, of whose help every ancestor you have would have been ashamed. Or, on the other hand, it may be that when the police come there will be something to arrest me for. There was a long silence, and the elf of irresponsibility peeped out again for an instant in Dalroy's mind. Mr. Bullrose will see fair play for you from a throne above the lists, he said. I have already put my honor in the hands of Mr. Hibbs. I must decline Captain Dalroy's invitation, said Ivywood at last in a curious tone. Not so much because... Before he could proceed, Levison came racing across the copse, hallooing, The police are here! Dalroy, who loved leaving everything to the last instant, tore up the sign, with Bullrose literally hanging to it, shook him off like a ripe fruit, 
and then plunged into the tunnel, the clamorous quoodle at his heels. Before even Ivywood, the promptest of his party, could reach the spot, he had clashed to the wood door and bolted it across with his wooden staple. He had not had time even to sheath his sword. "'Break down this door,' said Lord Ivywood calmly. "'I noticed they haven't finished loading their cart.' Under his directions, and vastly against their will, Bullrose and Levison lifted the tree-trunk vacated by Hibbs, and swinging it thrice as a battering-ram, burst in the door. Lord Ivywood instantly sprang into the entrance. A voice called out to him quietly from the other end of the tunnel. There was something touching and yet terrible about a voice so human coming out of that inhuman darkness. If Philip Ivywood had been really a poet, and not rather its opposite, an asthete, he would have known that all the past and people of England were uttering their oracle out of the cavern. As it was, he only heard a publican wanted by the police. Yet even he paused, and indeed seemed spellbound. My lord, I would like a word. I learned my catechism, and never was with the radicals. I want you to look at what you've done to me. You've stolen a house that was mine, as that one's yours. You've made me a dirty tramp, that was a man respected in church and market. Now you send me where I might have cells, or the cat. If I might make so bold, what do you suppose I think of you? Do you think because you go up to London and settle it with the lords in Parliament and bring back a lot of papers and long words, that makes any difference to the man you do it to? By what I can see, you're just a bad and cruel master, like those God punished in the old days, like Squire Varney the weasels killed in Holy Wood. Well, Parson always said one might shoot at robbers, and I want to tell your lordship, he ended respectfully, that I have a gun. Ivywood instantly stepped into the darkness, and spoke in a voice shaken with some emotion, the nature of which was never certainly known. "'The police are here,' he said, "'but I'll arrest you myself.' A shot shrieked and rattled through the thousand echoes of the tunnel. Lord Ivywood's legs doubled and twisted under him, and he collapsed on the earth with a bullet above his knee. Almost at the same instant, a shout and a bark announced that the cart had started as a complete equipage. It was even more than complete, for the instant before it moved, Mr. Quoodle had sprung into it, and as it was driven off, sat erect in it, looking solemn. End of chapter 13《The Flying Inn》by G. K. Chesterton Chapter 14 The Creature That Man Forgets Despite the natural hubbub round the wound of Lord Ivywood, and the difficulties of the police in finding their way to the shore, the fugitives of the Flying Inn must almost certainly have been captured but for a curious accident, which also flowed, as it happened, from the great Ivywood debate on vegetarianism. The comparatively late hour at which Lord Ivywood had made his discovery had been largely due to a very long speech which Joan had not heard, and which was delivered immediately before the few concluding observations she had heard from Dr. Gluck. The speech was made by an eccentric, of course. Most of those who attended, and nearly all of those who talked, were eccentric in one way or another. But he was an eccentric of great wealth and good family, an M.P., a J.P., a relation of Lady Enid, a man well known in art and letters. In short, a personality who could not be prevented from being anything he chose, from a revolutionist to a bore. Dorian Wimpole had first become famous outside his own class, under the fanciful title of the Poet of the Birds. A volume of verse, expanding the several notes or cries of separate songbirds, into fantastic soliloquies of these feathered philosophers, had really contained a great deal of ingenuity and elegance. Unfortunately, he was one of those who always tend to take their own fancies seriously, in whose otherwise legitimate extravagance there is too little of the juice of jest. Hence, in his later works, when he explained the fable of the angel, by trying to prove that the fowls of the air were creatures higher than man or the anthropoids, his manner was felt to be too austere. And when he moved an amendment to Lord Ivywood's scheme for the model village called Peaceways, 
urging that its houses should all follow the more hygienic architecture of nests hung in trees, many regretted that he had lost his light touch. But when he went beyond birds and filled his poems with conjectural psychology about all the zoological gardens, his meaning became obscure, and Lady Susan had even described it as his bad period. It was all the more uncomfortable reading because he poured forth the imaginary hymns, love songs, and war songs of the lower animals without a word of previous explanation. Thus, if someone seeking for an ordinary drawing-room song came on lines that were headed a desert love song, in which began, her head is high against the stars, her hump is heaved in pride, the compliment to the lady would at first seem startling until the reader realized that all the characters in the idol were camels. Or, if he began a poem simply entitled The March of Democracy, and found in the first lines, Comrades marching evermore, fix your teeth in floor and door, he might be doubtful about such a policy for the masses, until he discovered that it was supposed to be addressed by an eloquent and aspiring rat to the social solidarity of his race. Lord Ivywood had nearly quarreled with his poetic relative over the uproarious realism of the verses called A Drinking Song, until it was carefully explained to him that the drink was water, and that the festive company consisted of bisons. His vision of the perfect husband, as it exists in the feelings of the young female walrus, is thoughtful and suggestive, but would doubtless receive many emendations from anyone who had experienced those feelings. And in his sonnet called Motherhood, he has made the young scorpion consistent and convincing, yet somehow not wholly lovable. In justice to him, however, it should be remembered that he attacked the most difficult cases on principle, declaring that there was no earthly creature that a poet should forget. He was of the blonde type of his cousin, with flowing fair hair and mustache and a bright blue absent-minded eye. He was very well dressed in the carefully careless manner, with a brown velvet jacket and the image on his ring of one of those beasts men worshipped in Egypt. His speech was graceful and well-worded and enormously long, and it was all about an oyster. He passionately protested against the suggestion of some humanitarians who were vegetarians in other respects, but maintained that organisms so simple might fairly be counted as exceptions. Man, he said, even at his miserable best, was always trying to excommunicate some one citizen of the cosmos, to forget some one creature that he should remember. Now it seemed that creature was the oyster. He gave a long account of the tragedy of the oyster, a really imaginative and picturesque account, full of fantastic fishes and coral crags crawling and climbing, and bearded creatures streaking the seashore in the green darkness in the cellars of the sea. What a horrid irony it is, he cried, that this is the only one of the lower creatures whom we call a native. We speak of him, and of him alone, as if he were a native of the country, whereas indeed he is an exile in the universe. What can be conceived more pitiful than the eternal frenzy of the impotent amphibian? What is more terrible than the tear of an oyster? Nature herself has sealed it with the hard seal of eternity. The creature man forgets bears against him a testimony that cannot be forgotten. For the tears of widows and of captives are wiped away at last like the tears of children. They vanish like the mists of morning or the small pools after a flood. But the tear of the oyster is a pearl. The poet of the birds was so excited with his own speech that, after the meeting, he walked out with a wild eye to the motor car, which had been long awaiting him, the chauffeur giving some faint signs of relief. "'Toward home, for the present,' said the poet, and stared at the moon with an inspired face. He was very fond of motoring, finding it fed him with inspirations, and he had been doing it from an early hour that morning, having enjoyed a slightly lessened sleep. He had scarcely spoken to anybody until he spoke to the cultured crowd at Ivywood. He did not wish to speak to anyone for many hours yet. His ideas were racing. He had thrown on a fur coat over his velvet jacket, but he let it fly open, having long forgotten the coldness and the splendor of the moonstruck night. He realized only two things, the swiftness of his car and the swiftness of his thoughts. He felt, as it were, a fury of omniscience. He seemed flying with every bird that sped or spun above the woods, with every squirrel that had leapt and tumbled within them, with every tree that had swung under and sustained the blast. Yet in a few moments he leaned forward and tapped the glass frontage of the car, and the chauffeur, suddenly squaring his shoulders, jarringly stopped the wheels. Dorian Wimpole had just seen something in the clear moonlight by the roadside which appealed both to this and to the other side of his tradition, something that appealed to Wimpole as well as to Dorian. Two shabby-looking men, one in tattered gaiters and the other in what looked like the remains of fancy dress with the addition of hair, of so wild a red that it looked like a wig, were halted under the hedge, apparently loading a donkey-cart. 
at least two rounded, rudely cylindrical objects, looking more or less like tubs, stood out in the road beside the wheels, along with a sort of loose wooden post that lay along the road beside them. As a matter of fact, the man in the old gaiters had just been feeding and watering the donkey, and was now adjusting its harness more easily. But Dorian Wimpole naturally did not expect that sort of thing from that sort of man. There swelled up in him the sense that his omnipotence went beyond the poetical, that he was a gentleman, a magistrate, an M.P., and J.P., and so on. This callousness or ignorance about animals should not go on while he was a J.P., especially since Ivywood's last act. He simply strode across to the stationary cart and said, You are overloading that animal, and it is forfeited, and you must come with me to the police station. Humphrey Pump, who was very considerate to animals, and had always tried to be considerate to gentlemen, in spite of having put a bullet into one of their legs, was simply too astounded and distressed to make any answer at all. He moved a step or two backward and stared with brown, blinking eyes at the poet, the donkey, the cask, the cheese, and the signboard laying in the road. But Captain Delroy, with the quicker recovery of his national temperament, swept the poet and magistrate a vast, fantastic bow, and said with agreeable impudence, "'Interested in donkeys, no doubt?' "'I am interested in all things men forget,' answered the poet with a fine touch of pride, "'but mostly in those like this that are most easily forgotten.' Somehow from those two first sentences Pump realized that these two eccentric aristocrats had unconsciously recognized each other. The fact that it was unconscious seemed, somehow, to exclude him all the more. He stirred a little the moonlit dust of the road with his rather dilapidated boots, and eventually strolled across to speak to the chauffeur. "'Is the next police station far from here?' he asked. The chauffeur answered with one syllable of which the nearest literal rendering is Deneau. Other spellings have been attempted, but the sentiment expressed is that of agnosticism. But something of special brutality of abbreviation made the shrewd and therefore sensitive Mr. Pump look at the man's face, and he saw it was not only the moonlight that made it white. With that dumb delicacy that was so English in him, Pump looked at the man again, and saw he was leaning heavily on the car with one arm, and saw that the arm was shaking. He understood his countrymen enough to know that whatever he said he must say in a careless manner. I hope it's nearer to your place. You must be a bit done up. Ow oh, hell! said the driver, and spat on the road. Pump was sympathetically silent, and Mr. Wimpole's chauffeur broke out incoherently, as if in another place. Blarsted beauties of de break, and no breakfast. Blarsted lunch heavy wood, and no lunch. Blasted black everlasting hours outside, where he is a psych and champagne, and then it's a darnkey. You don't mean to say, said Pump, in a very serious voice, that you've had no food today? Ow, oh, no, replied the cockney, with the irony of the deathbed. Ow, oh, of course not. Pump strolled back into the road again, picked up the cheese in his left hand, and landed it on the seat beside the driver. Then his right hand went to one of his large, loose, equivocal pockets, and the blade of a big jackknife caught and recaught the steady splendors of the moon. The driver stared for several instants at the cheese, with the knife shaking in his hand. Then he began to hack it, and in that white, witch-like light, the happiness of his face was almost horrible. Pump was wise in all such things, and knew that just as a little food will sometimes prevent sheer intoxication, so a little stimulant will sometimes prevent sudden and dangerous indigestion. It was practically impossible to make the man stop eating cheese. It was far better to give him a very little of the rum, especially as it was a very good rum, and better than anything he could find in any of the public houses that were still permitted. He walked across the road again and picked up the small cask which he put on the other side of the cheese, and from which he filled, in his own manner, the little cup he carried in his pocket. But at the sight of this, the cockney's eyes lit up at once with terror and desire. But you can't do it! he whispered hoarsely. It's the police. It's gal for that, with no doctor's letter, nor signboard, nor nothing. Mr. Humphrey Pump made yet another march back into the road. When he got there he hesitated for the first time, but it was quite clear from the attitude of the two insane aristocrats, who were arguing and posturing in the road, that they would notice nothing except each other. He picked the loose post off the road and brought it to the car, humorously propping it erect in the aperture between keg and cheese. The little glass of rum was wavering in the poor chauffeur's hand, exactly as the big knife had done, but when he looked up and actually saw the wooden sign above him, he seemed not so much to pluck up his courage, but rather to drag up some forgotten courage from the foundations of some unfathomable sea. It was indeed the forgotten courage of the people. He looked once at the bleak black pine woods around him, and took the mouthful of golden liquid at a gulp as if it were a fairy potion. He sat silent and then, very slowly, a sort of stony glitter began to come into his eyes. The brown and vigilant eyes of Humphrey Pump were studying him with some anxiety or even fear. He did look rather like a man enchanted or turned to stone, but he spoke very suddenly. "'The blighter!' he said. 
I'll give him Al. I'll give him bleeding Al. I'll give him something what he don't expect. What do you mean? asked the innkeeper. Why? answered the chauffeur with abrupt composure. I'll give him a little donkey. Mr. Pump looked troubled. Do you think, he observed, affecting to speak lightly, that he's fit to be trusted even with a little donkey? Oh, yes, said the man. He's very amiable with donkeys, and donkeys we is to be amiable with them. Pump still looked at him doubtfully, appearing or affecting not to follow his meaning. Then he looked equally anxious across at the other two men, but they were still talking. Different as they were in every other way, they were of the sort who forget everything, class, quarrel, time, place, and physical facts in front of them, in the lust of lucid explanation and equal argument. Thus, when the captain began by lightly alluding to the fact that after all it was his donkey, since he had bought it from a tinker for a just price, the police station practically vanished from Wimpole's mind, and I fear the donkey cart also. Nothing remained but the necessity of dissipating the superstition of personal property. I own nothing, said the poet, waving his hands outward. I own nothing save in the sense that I own everything, and all depends whether wealth or power be used for or against the higher purposes of the cosmos. Indeed, replied Delroy. And how does your motor car serve the higher purposes of the cosmos? It helps me, said Mr. Wimpole, with honorable simplicity, to produce my poems. And if it could be used for some higher purpose, if such a thing could be, if some new purpose had come into the cosmos's head by accident, inquired the other, I suppose it would cease to be your property. Certainly, replied the dignified Dorian. I should not complain, nor have you any title to complain when the donkey ceases to be yours when you depress it in the cosmic scale. What makes you think, asked Delroy, that I wanted to depress it? It is my firm belief, replied Dorian Wimpole sternly, that you wanted to ride on it, for indeed the captain had once repeated his playful gesture of putting his large leg across. Is not that so? No, answered the captain innocently. I never ride on a donkey. I'm afraid of it. Afraid of a donkey? cried Wimpole incredulously. Afraid of an historical comparison, said Delroy. There was a short pause, and Wimpole said coolly enough, Oh, well, we've outlived those comparisons. Easily, answered the Irish captain. It is wonderful how easily one outlives someone else's crucifixion. In this case, said the other grimly, I think it is the donkey's crucifixion. Why, you must have drawn that old Roman caricature of the crucified donkey, said Patrick Delroy with an air of some wonder. How well you have worn, while you look so young. Well, of course, if this donkey is crucified, he must be uncrucified, but are you quite sure, he added very gravely, that you know how to uncrucify a donkey? I assure you it's one of the rarest of human arts, all a matter of knack. It's like the doctors with the rare diseases, you know. The necessity so seldom arises. Granted that, by the higher purposes of the cosmos, I am unfit to look after this donkey, I must still feel a faint shiver of responsibility in passing him on to you. Will you understand this donkey? He is a delicate-minded donkey. He is a complex donkey. How can I be certain that, on so short an acquaintance, you will understand every shade of his little likes and dislikes? The dog Quoodle, who had been sitting as still as the Sphinx under the shadow of the pine trees, waddled out for an instant into the middle of the road and then returned. He ran out when a slight noise, as of rotary grinding, was heard, and ran back when it had ceased. But Dorian Wimpole was much too keen on his philosophical discovery to notice either dog or wheel. I shall not sit on its back anyhow, he said proudly. But if that were all, it would be a small matter. It is enough for you that you have left it in the hands of the only person who could really understand it, one who searches the skies and seas so as not to neglect the smallest creature. This is a very curious creature, said the captain anxiously. He has all sorts of odd antipathies. He can't stand a motor car, for instance, especially one that throbs like that while it's standing still. He doesn't mind a fur coat so much, but if you wear a brown velvet jacket under it, he bites you. And you must keep him out of the way of a certain kind of people. I don't suppose you've met them, but they always think that anybody with less than two hundred a year is drunk and very cruel, and that anybody with more than two thousand a year is conducting the day of judgment. If you will keep our dear donkey from the society of such persons. Hello, hello, hello! He turned in genuine disturbance and dashed after the dog who had dashed after the motor car and jumped inside. The captain jumped in after the dog to pull him out again, but before he could do so he found the car was flying along too fast for any such leap. He looked up and saw the sign of the old ship erect in the front like a rigid banner, and Pump with his cask and cheese sitting solidly beside the driver. The thing was more of an earthquake and transformation to him even than to any of the others, but he rose waveringly to his feet and shouted out to Wimpole, You've left it in the right hands. I've never been cruel to a motor. 
In the moonlight of the magic pine wood far behind, Dorian and the donkey were left looking at each other. To the mystical mind, when it is a mind at all, which is by no means always the case, there are no two things more impressive and symbolical than a poet and a donkey. And the donkey was a very gentle donkey, and the poet was a very gentle poet, however lawfully he might be mistaken for the other animal at times. The interest of the donkey and the poet will never be known. The interest of the poet and the donkey was perfectly genuine, and survived even that appalling private interview in the owlish secrecy of the woods. But I think even the poet would have been enlightened if he had seen the white, set, frantic face of the man on the driver's seat of his vanishing motor. If he had seen it, he might have remembered the name, or perhaps even begun to understand the nature of a certain animal, which is neither the donkey nor the oyster, but the creature whom man has always found it easiest to forget, since the hour he forgot God in a garden. End of chapter 14「Chapter Fifteen of the Flying Inn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicola K. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter Fifteen. THE SONGS OF THE CAR CLUB More than once, as the car flew through black and silver fairy lands of fir wood and pine wood, Dalroy put his head out of the side window and remonstrated with the chauffeur without effect. He was reduced at last to asking him where he was going. "'I'm going home," said the driver in an undecipherable voice. "'I'm a-going home to my mar." "'And where does she live?' asked Dalroy, with something more like diffidence than he had ever shown before in his life. "'Wiles,' said the man. "'But I ain't seen her since I was born. But she'll do.' "'You must realize,' said Dalroy, with difficulty, "'that you may be arrested. It's the man's own car. And he's left behind with nothing to eat, so to speak.' "'He's got his donkey,' grunted the man. "'Let the stinker eat his donkey.' with thistle sauce. He would if he was as hollow as I was. Humphrey Pump opened the glass window that separated him from the rear part of the car, and turned to speak to his friend over his square elbow and shoulder. I'm afraid, he said, he won't stop for anything just yet. He's as mad as Moody's aunt, as they say. "'Do they say it?' asked the captain, with a sort of anxiety. "'They never said it in Ithaca.' "'Honestly, I think you'd better leave him alone,' answered Pump, with his sagacious face. "'He'd just run us into a Scotch express, like Dandy Mutton did, when they said he was driving carelessly. "'We can send the car back to Ivywood somehow later on, and really I don't think it'll do the gentleman any harm to spend a night with a donkey. "'The donkey might teach him something, I tell you.' "'It's true he denied the principle of private property,' said Dalroy, reflectively. "'But I fancy he was thinking of a plain house fixed on the ground. "'A house on wheels such as this he might perhaps think a more permanent possession. "'But I never understood it.' "'And again he passed a weary palm across his open forehead. "'Have you ever noticed, Hump, what is really odd about those people?' The car shot on amid the comfortable silence of Pump, and then the Irishman said again, "'That poet in the pussycat clothes wasn't half bad. Lord Ivywood isn't cruel, but he's inhuman. But that man wasn't inhuman. He was ignorant, like most cultured fellows. But what's odd about them is that they try to be simple and never clear away a single thing that's complicated. If they have to choose between beef and pickles, they always abolish the beef.' If they have to choose between a meadow and a motor, they forbid the meadow. Shall I tell you the secret? These men only surrender the things that bind them to other men. Go and dine with a temperance millionaire, and you won't find he's abolished the hors d'oeuvre, or the five courses, or even the coffee. What he's abolished is the port and sherry, because poor men like that as well as rich. Go a step farther, and you won't find he's abolished the fine silver forks and spoons, but he's abolished the meat, because poor men like meat, when they can get it. 
go a step farther, and you won't find he goes without gardens or gorgeous rooms which poor men can't enjoy at all. But you will find he boasts of early rising because sleep is a thing poor men can still enjoy, about the only thing they can still enjoy. Nobody ever heard of a modern philanthropist giving up petrol or typewriting or troops of servants. No, no. What he gives up must be some simple and universal thing. He will give up beef or beer or sleep, because these pleasures remind him that he is only a man. Humphrey Pump nodded, but still answered nothing and the voice of the sprawling Delroy took one of its upward turns of a sort of soaring flippancy which commonly embodied itself in remembering some song he had composed. Such, he said, was the case of the late Mr. Mandragon, so long popular in English aristocratic society as a bluff and simple democrat from the West, until he was unfortunately sandbagged by six men whose wives he had had shot by private detectives on his incautiously landing on American soil. Mr. Mandragon, the millionaire, he wouldn't have wine or wife. He couldn't endure complexity. He lived the simple life. He ordered his lunch by megaphone in manly simple tones, and used all his motors for canvassing voters and twenty telephones. Besides a dandy little machine, cunning and neat as ever was seen, with a hundred pulleys and cranks between, made of iron and kept quite clean, to hoist him out of his healthful bed on every day of his life, and wash him and brush him and shave him and dress him to live the simple life. Mr. Mandragon was most refined and quietly neatly dressed, say all the American newspapers that know refinement best, quiet and neat the hair and hat, and the coat quiet and neat, a trouser worn upon either leg while boots adorned the feet, and not, as any one might expect, a tiger skin all striped and specked, and a peacock hat with the tail erect, a scarlet tunic with sunflowers decked that might have had a more marked effect and pleased the pride of a weaker man that yearned for wine or wife but fame and the flagon for mr mandragon obscured the simple life mr mandragon the millionaire i am happy to say is dead he enjoyed a quiet funeral in a crematorium shed and he lies there fluffy and soft and grey and certainly quite refined when he might have rotted to flowers and fruit with adam and all mankind or been eaten by bears that fancy blood or burnt on a big tall tower of wood in a towering flame as a heathen should or even sat with us here at food merrily taking twopenny rum and cheese with a pocket-knife but these were luxuries lost for him that lived for the simple life Mr. Pump had made many attempts to arrest this song, but they were as vain as all attempts to arrest the car. The angry chauffeur seemed, indeed, rather inspired to further energy by the violent vocal noises behind, and Pump again found it best to fall back on conversation. "'Well, Captain,' he said amicably, "'I can't quite agree with you about those things. Of course you can trust foreigners too much, as poor Thompson did.' But then you can go too far the other way. Aunt Sarah lost a thousand pounds that way. I told her again and again he wasn't a nigger. But she wouldn't believe me. And of course that was just the kind of thing to offend an ambassador if he was an Austrian. It seems to me, Captain, you aren't quite fair to these foreign chaps. Take these Americans now. There were many Americans went by Pebblewick, you may suppose. But in all the lot there was never a bad lot, never a nasty American, nor a stupid American, nor, well, never an American that I didn't rather like. I know, said Dalroy, you mean there was never an American who did not appreciate the old ship. I suppose I do mean that, answered the innkeeper, and somehow I feel the old ship might appreciate the American, too. You English are an extraordinary lot, said the Irishman, with a sudden and sombre quietude. I sometimes feel you may pull through after all. After another silence, he said, You're always right, Hump, and one oughtn't to think of Yankees like that. The rich are the scum of the earth in every country, and a vast proportion of the real Americans are among the most courteous, intelligent, self-respecting people in the world. Some attribute this to the fact that a vast proportion of the real Americans are Irishmen. 
Pump was still silent, and the captain resumed in a moment. All the same, he said, is very hard for a man, especially a man of a small country like me, to understand how it must feel to be an American, especially in the matter of nationality. I shouldn't like to have to write the American National Anthem, but fortunately there is no great probability of the commission being given. The shameful secret of my inability to write an American patriotic song is one that will die with me. Well, what about an English one, said Pump, sturdily? You might do worse, Captain. English, you bloody tyrant, said Patrick indignantly. I could no more fancy a song by an Englishman than you could one by that dog. Mr. Humphrey Pump gravely took the paper from his pocket, on which he had previously inscribed the sin and desolation of grocers, and felt in need of another of his innumerable pockets for a pencil. Hello, cried Dalroy, are you going to have a shy at the ballad of Coodle? Coodle lifted his ears at his name. Mr. Pump smiled a slight and embarrassed smile. He was secretly proud of Dalroy's admiration for his previous literary attempts, and he had some natural knack for verse as a game, as he had for all games, and his reading, though desultory, had not been merely rustic or low. On condition, he said deprecatingly, that you write a song for the English. Oh, very well, said Patrick, with a huge sigh that really indicated the very opposite of reluctance. We must do something till the thing stops, I suppose, and this seems a blameless parlour game. Songs of the Car Club. Sounds quite aristocratic. And he began to make marks with a pencil on the fly-leaf of a little book he had in his pocket. Wilson's knocked Ambrosian. Every now and then, however, he looked up and delayed his own composition by watching Pump and the dog, whose proceedings amused him very much, for the owner of the old ship sat sucking his pencil and looking at Mr. Coodle with eyes of fathomless attention. Every now and then he slightly scratched his brown hair with the pencil and wrote down a word. And the dog Coodle, with that curious canine power of either understanding or most brazenly pretending to understand what is going on, sat erect with his head at an angle as if he were sitting for his portrait. Hence it happened that though Pump's poem was a little long, as are often the poems of inexperienced poets, and though Dalroy's poem was very short, being much hurried toward the end, the long poem was finished some time before the short one. Therefore it was that there was first produced for the world the song more familiarly known as No Noses, or more correctly called the Song of Coodle. Part of it ran eventually thus. They haven't got no noses, the fallen sons of Eve. Even the smell of roses is not what they supposes, but more than mind discloses, and more than men believe. They haven't got no noses, they cannot even tell, when door and darkness closes, the park a Jew encloses, where even the law of Moses will let you steal a smell. The brilliant smell of water, the brave smell of a stone, the smell of dew and thunder and old bones buried under, are things in which they blunder and err if left alone. The wind from winter forests, the scent of scentless flowers, the breath of brides adorning, the smell of snare and warning, the smell of Sunday morning God gave to us for ours. And Coodle here discloses all things that Coodle can. They haven't got no noses. They haven't got no noses, and goodness only noses, the noselessness of man. This poem also shows traces of haste in its termination, and the present editor, who has no aim save truth, is bound to confess that parts of it were supplied in the criticisms of the captain, and even enriched in later and livelier circumstances by the poet of the birds himself. At the actual moment, the chief features of this realistic song about dogs was a crashing chorus of bow-wow-wow begun by Mr. Patrick Delroy, but immediately imitated much more successfully by Mr. Coodle. In the face of all this, Delroy suffered some real difficulty in fulfilling the bargain by reading out his much shorter poem about what he imagined an Englishman might feel. Indeed, there was something very rough and vague in his very voice as he read it out as of one who had not found the key to his problem. The present compiler, who has no aim save truth, must confess that the verses ran as follows. 
St. George, he was for England, and before he killed the dragon, he drank a pint of English ale out of an English flagon, for though he fast right readily, in hair shirt or in mail, it isn't safe to give him cakes unless you give him ale. St. George, he was for England, and right gallantly set free, the lady left for dragon's meat and tied up to a tree. But since he stood for England and knew what England means, unless you give him bacon, you mustn't give him beans. St. George, he was for England, and shall wear the shield he wore, when we go out in armour with the battle cross before. But though he is jolly company and very pleased to dine, it isn't safe to give him nuts unless you give him wine. Very philosophical song, that, said Dalroy, shaking his head solemnly, full of deep thought. I really think that is about the truth of the matter, in the case of the Englishman. Your enemies say you're stupid and you boast of being illogical, which is about the only thing you do that really is stupid, as if anybody ever made an empire or anything else by saying that two and two make five, or as if anyone was ever the stronger for not understanding anything, if it were only tip-cat or chemistry. But this is true about you, Hump. You English are supremely an artistic people, and therefore you go by associations, as I said in my song. You won't have one thing without the other thing that goes with it. And as you can't imagine a village without a squire and parson, or a college without port and old oak, you get the reputation of a conservative people. But it's because you're sensitive, Hump, not because you're stupid, that you won't part with things. It's lies, lies and flattery, they tell you, Hump when they tell you you're fond of compromise. I tell ye, Hump, every real revolution is a compromise. Do ye think Wolf Tone or Charles Stuart Parnell never compromised? But it's just because you're afraid of a compromise that you won't have a revolution. If you really overhauled the old ship or Oxford, you'd have to make up your mind what to take and what to leave, and it would break your heart, Humphrey Pump. He stared in front of him with a red and ruminant face, and at length added, somewhat more gloomily, This aesthetic way we have, Pump, has only two little disadvantages, which I will now explain to you. The first is exactly what has sent us flying in this contraption. When the beautiful, smooth, harmonious thing you've made is worked by a new type and a new spirit, then I tell you it would be better for you a thousand times to be living under the thousand paper constitutions of Condorcet and Sieyès. When the English oligarchy is run by an Englishman who hasn't got an English mind, then you have Lord Ivywood and all this nightmare, of which God could only guess the end. The car had beaten some roods of dust behind it, and he ended still more darkly. And the other disadvantage, my amiable aesthete, is this. If ever in blundering about the planet you come on an island in the Atlantic, Atlantis, let us say, which won't accept all your pretty picture, to which you can't give everything, why you will probably decide to give nothing. You will say in your hearts, perhaps they will starve soon and you will become for that island the deafest and the most evil of all the princes of the earth it was already daybreak and pump who knew the english boundaries almost by intuition could tell even through the twilight that the tale of the little town they were leaving behind was of a new sort the sort to be seen in the western border the chauffeur's phrase about his mother might merely have been a music-hall joke but certainly he had driven darkly in that direction White morning lay about the grey stony streets like spilt milk. A few proletarian early risers, wearier at morning than most men at night, seemed merely of opinion that it was no use crying over it. The two or three last houses, which looked almost too tired to stand upright, seemed to have moved the captain into another sleepy explosion. There are two kinds of idealists, as everybody knows, or must have thought of. There are those who idealize the real, and those who precious seldom realize the ideal. Artistic and poetical people like the English generally idealize the, the real. This I have expressed in a song, which, no, really, protested the innkeeper. Really now, Captain, this I have expressed in a song, repeated Delroy, in a very adamantine manner, which I will now sing with every circumstance of leisure, loudness, or any other. He stopped, because the flying universe seemed to stop. 
charging hedgerows came to a halt as if challenged by the bugle the racing forest stood rigid the last few tottering houses stood suddenly at attention for a noise like a pistol shot from the car itself had stopped all that race as a pistol shot might start any other the driver clambered out very slowly and stood about in various tragic attitudes around the car he opened an unsuspected number of doors and windows in the car and touched things and twisted things and felt things i must back as best i can to that there garage sir he said in a heavy and husky tone they had not heard from him before then he looked round on the long woods and the last houses and seemed to gnaw his lip like a great general who has made a great mistake his brow seemed as black as ever yet his voice when he spoke again had fallen many further degrees towards its dull and daily tone yer see this is a bit bad he said it'll be a beastly job even at the best places if i'm getting back at all getting back repeated dalroy opening the blue eyes of a bull back where well yer see said the chauffeur reasonably i was bloody keen to show em it was me drove the car and not em by a bit of bad luck i done damage to his car well if you can stick in his car captain patrick dalroy sprang out of the car so rapidly that he almost reeled and slipped upon the road the dog sprang after him barking furiously hump said patrick quietly i've found out everything about you i know what always bothered me about the englishman then after an instant's silence he said that frenchman was right who said i forget how he put it that you march to trafalgar square to rid yourself of your temper not to rid yourself of your tyrant our friend was quite ready to rebel rushing away to rebel sitting still was too much for him do you read punch i am sure you do pump and punch must be almost the only survivors of the victorian age do you remember an old joke in an excellent picture representing two ragged irishmen with guns waiting behind a stone wall to shoot a landlord one of the irishmen says the landlord is late and adds i hope no accidents happen to the poor gentleman well it's all perfectly true i knew that irishman in intimately but i want to tell you a secret about him he was an englishman the chauffeur had backed with breathless care to the entrance of the garage which was next door to a milkman's or merely separated from it by a black and lean lane looking no larger than the crack of a door it must however have been larger than it looked because captain dalroy disappeared down it he seemed to have beckoned the driver after him at any rate that functionary instantly followed the functionary came out again in an almost guilty haste touching his cap and stuffing loose papers into his pocket then the functionary returned yet again from what he called the garage carrying larger and looser things over his arm all this did mr humphrey pump observe not without interest the place remote as it was was evidently a rendezvous for motorists otherwise a very tall motorist throttled and masked in the most impenetrable degree would hardly have strolled up to speak to him still less would the tall motorist have handed him a similar horrid disguise of wraps and goggles in a bundle over his arm least of all would any motorist however tall have said to him from behind the cap and goggles put on these things hump and then we'll go into the milk shop i'm waiting for the car which car my seeker after truth why the car i'm going to buy for you to drive the remorseful chauffeur after many adventures did actually find his way back to the little moonlit wood where he had left his master and the donkey but his master and the donkey had vanished end of chapter fifteen recording by nicole k Chapter Sixteen of the Flying Inn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicola K. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. 
Chapter Sixteen The Seven Moods of Dorian That timeless clock of all lunatics, which was so bright in the sky that night, may really have had some elfin luck about it, like a silver penny. Not only had it irritated Mr. Hibbs into the mysteries of Dionysius, and Mr. Bullrose into the arboreal habits of his ancestors, but one night of it made a very considerable and rather valuable change in Mr. Dorian Wimpole, the poet of the birds. He was a man neither foolish nor evil, any more than Shelley, only a man made sterile by living in a world of indirectness and insincerity with words rather than with things he had not had the smallest intention of starving his chauffeur he did not realize that there was worse spiritual murder in merely forgetting him but as hour after hour passed over him alone with the donkey and the moon he went through a raging and shifting series of frames of mind such as his cultured friends would have described as moods the first mood i regret to say was one of black and grinding hatred he had no notion of the chauffeur's grievance and could only suppose he had been bribed or intimidated by the demonic donkey torturers but Mr. Wimpole was much more capable at that moment of torturing a chauffeur than Mr. Pump had ever been of torturing a donkey. For no sane man can hate an animal. He kicked the stones into the road, sending them flying into the forest, and wished that each one of them was a chauffeur. The bracken by the roadside he tore up by the roots, as representing the hair of the chauffeur, to which it bore no resemblance. He hit with his fist such trees as I suppose seemed in form and expression most reminiscent of the chauffeur, but desisted from this, finding that in this apparently one-sided contest the tree had rather the best of it. But the whole wood and the whole world had become a kind of omnipresent and pantheistic chauffeur, and he hit at him everywhere. The thoughtful reader will realize that Mr. Wimpole had already taken a considerable upward stride in what he would have called the cosmic scale. The next best thing to really loving a fellow creature is really hating him especially when he is a poorer man separated from you otherwise by mere social stiffness the desire to murder him is at least an acknowledgment that he is alive many a man has owed the first white gleams of the dawn of democracy in his soul to a desire to find a stick and beat the butler and we have it on the unimpeachable local authority of mr humphrey pump that squire merriman chased his librarian through three villages with a horse pistol and was a radical ever after his rage also did him good merely as a relief and he soon passed into a second and more positive mood of meditation the damnable monkeys go on like this he muttered and then they call the donkey one of the lower animals ride on a donkey would he I'd like to see the donkey riding on him for a bit. Good old man. The patient ass turned mild eyes on him when he patted it, and Dorian Wimpole discovered with a sort of subconscious surprise that he really was fond of the donkey. Deeper still in his subliminal self, he knew that he had never been fond of an animal before. His poems about fantastic creatures had been quite sincere and quite cold. When he said he loved a shark, he meant he saw no reason for hating a shark, which was right enough. There is no reason for hating a shark, however much reason there may be for avoiding one. There is no harm in a kraken if you keep it in a tank or in a sonnet. But he also realized that his love of creatures had been turned round and was working from the other end. The donkey was a companion and not a monstrosity. It was dear because it was near not because it was distant. The oyster had attracted him because it was utterly unlike a man, unless it be counted a touch of masculine vanity to grow a beard. The fancy is no idler than that he had himself used, in suggesting a sort of feminine vanity in the permanence of a pearl. 
but in that maddening vigil among the mystic pines he found himself more and more drawn toward the donkey because it was more like a man than anything else around him because it had eyes to see and ears to hear and the latter even unduly developed he that hath ears to hear let him hear he said scratching those grey hairy flappers with affection haven't you lifted your eyes toward heaven and will you be the first to hear the last trumpet the ass rubbed his nose against him with what seemed almost like a human caress and dorian caught himself wondering how a caress from an oyster could be managed everything else around him was beautiful but inhuman only in the first glory of anger could he really trace in a tall pine tree the features of an ex taxicab man from kennington trees and ferns had no living ears that they could wag nor mild eyes that they could move he patted the donkey again but the donkey had reconciled him to the landscape and in his third mood he began to realize how beautiful it was on a second study he was not sure it was so inhuman rather he felt that its beauty at least was half human that the aureole of the sinking moon behind the woods was chiefly lovely because it was like the tender colored aureole of an early saint and that the young trees were after all noble because they held up their heads like virgins cloudily there crowded into his mind ideas with which it was imperfectly familiar especially an idea which he had heard called the image of god it seemed to him more and more that all these things from the donkey to the very docks and ferns by the roadside were dignified and sanctified by their partial resemblance to something else it was as if they were baby drawings the wild crude sketches of nature in her first sketch-books of stone he had flung himself on a pile of pine needles to enjoy the gathering darkness of the pine woods as the moon sank behind them there is nothing more deep and wonderful than really impenetrable pine woods where the nearer trees show against the more shadowy a tracery of silver upon grey and of grey upon black it was by this time in pure pleasure and idleness that he picked up a pine needle to philosophize about it think of sitting on needles he said yet i suppose this is the sort of needle that eve in the old legend used in eden ay and the old legend was right too think of sitting on all the needles in london think of sitting on all the needles in sheffield think of sitting on any needles except on all the needles of paradise oh yes the old legend was right enough the very needles of god are softer than the carpets of men he took a pleasure in watching the weird little forest animals creeping out from under the green curtains of the wood he reminded himself that in the old legend they had been as tame as the ass as well as being as comic he thought of adam naming the animals and said to a beetle i should call you budger the slugs gave him great entertainment and so did the worms he felt a new and realistic interest in them which he had not known before it was indeed the interest that a man feels in a mouse in a dungeon the interest of any man tied by the leg and forced to see the fascination of small things creatures of the wormy kind especially crept out at very long intervals yet he found himself waiting patiently for hours for the pleasure of their acquaintance one of them rather specially arrested his eye because it was a little longer than most worms and seemed to be turning its head in the direction of the donkey's left foreleg also it had a head to turn which most worms have not dorian wimpole did not know much about exact natural history except what he had once got up very thoroughly from an encyclopedia for the purposes of a sympathetic villanelle but as this information was entirely concerned with the conjectural causes of laughter in the hyena it was not directly helpful in this case but though he did not know much natural history he knew some he knew enough to know that a worm ought not to have a head and especially not a squared and flattened head shaped like a spade or a chisel 
He knew enough to know that a creeping thing with a head of that pattern survives in the English countrysides, though it is not common. In short, he knew enough to step across the road and set a sharp and savage boot heel on the neck and spine of the creature, breaking it into three black bits that writhed once more before they stiffened. Then he gave out a great explosive sigh. The donkey, whose leg had been in such danger, looked at the dead adder with eyes that had never lost their moony mildness. Even Dorian himself looked at it for a long time, and with feelings he could neither arrest nor understand, before he remembered that he had been comparing the little wood to Eden. And even in Eden, he said at last. And then the words of Fitzgerald failed upon his lips. And while he was warring with such words and thoughts, something happened about him and behind him. Something he had written about a hundred times and read about a thousand something he had never seen in his life. It flung faintly across the broad foliage a wan and pearly light, far more mysterious than the lost moonshine. It seemed to enter through all the doors and windows of the woodland, pale and silent, but confident, like men that keep a tryst. Soon its white robes had threads of gold and scarlet, and the name of it was Morning. For some time past, loud and in vain, all the birds had been singing to the poet of the birds. But when that minstrel actually saw broad daylight breaking over wood and road, the effect on him was somewhat curious. He stood staring at it in gaping astonishment, until it had fulfilled the fullness of its shining fate, and the pine cones and the curling ferns and the live donkey and the dead viper were almost as distinct as they could be at noon or even in a pre-Raphaelite picture. And then the fourth mood fell upon him like a bolt from the blue, and he strode across and took the donkey's bridle as if to lead it along. "'Damn it all!' he cried in a voice as cheerful as the cock-crow that rang recently from the remote village. "'It's not everybody who's killed a snake.' Then he added reflectively, "'I bet Dr. Gluck never did.' Come along, donkey, let's have some adventures. The finding and fighting of positive evil is the beginning of all fun, and even of all farce. All the wild woodland looked jolly now the snake was killed. It was one of the fallacies of his literary clique to refer all natural emotions to literary names, but it might not untruly be said that he had passed out of the mood of Maeterlinck into the mood of Whitman, and out of the mood of Whitman into the mood of Stevenson. He had not been a hypocrite when he asked for gilded birds of Asia, or purple polypi out of the southern seas. He was not a hypocrite now, when he asked for mere comic adventures along a common English road. It was his misfortune and not his fault, if his first adventure was his last, and was much too comic to laugh at. Already the wan morning had warmed into a pale blue, and was spotted with those little plump pink clouds which must surely have been the origin of the story that pigs might fly. The insects of the grass chattered so cheerfully that every green tongue seemed to be talking. The skyline on every side was broken only by objects that encouraged such swashbucklering comedy. There was a windmill that Chaucer's Miller might have inhabited, or Cervantes' champion charged. There was an old leaden church spire that might have been climbed by Robert Clive. Away toward Pebblewick and the sea, there were the two broken stumps of wood, which Humphrey Pump declares to this day to have been the stands for an unsuccessful children's swing, but which tourists always accept as the remains of the antique gallows. In the gaiety of such surroundings, it is small wonder if Dorian and the donkey stepped briskly along the road. The very donkey reminded him of Sancho Panza. He did not wake out of this boisterous reverie of the white road and the wind till a motor-horn had first hooted and then howled, till the ground had shaken with the shock of a stoppage, and till a human hand fell heavily and tightly on his shoulder. He looked up and saw the complete costume of a police inspector. He did not worry about the face, and there fell on him the fifth or unexpected mood, which is called by the vulgar astonishment. 
In despair, he looked at the motor car itself that had anchored so abruptly under the opposite hedge. The man at the steering wheel was so erect and unresponsive that Dorian felt sure he was feasting his eyes on yet another policeman. But on the seat behind was a very different figure, a figure that baffled him all the more because he felt certain he had seen it somewhere. The figure was long and slim with sloping shoulders, and the costume which was untidy yet contrived to give the impression that it was tidy on other occasions. The individual had bright yellow hair, one lock of which stuck straight up and was exalted, like the little horn in his favorite scriptures. Another tuft of it, in a bright but blinding manner, fell across and obscured the left optic, as in literal fulfillment of the parable of a beam in the eye. The eyes, with or without beams in them, looked a little bewildered, and the individual was always nervously resettling his necktie for the individual went by the name of Hibbs, and had only recently recovered from experiences wholly new to him. "'What on earth do you want?' he asked Wimpole of the policeman. His innocent and startled face, and perhaps other things about his appearance, evidently caused the inspector to waver. "'Well, it's about this ere donkey, sir,' he said. "'Do you think I stole it?' cried the indignant aristocrat. "'Well, of all the mad worlds, a pack of thieves steal my limousine, "'I save their damned donkey's life at the risk of my own, "'and I'm run in for stealing.' "'The clothes of the indignant aristocrat probably spoke louder than his tongue. "'The officer dropped his hand, and after consulting some papers in his hand, "'walked across to consult with the unkempt gentleman, gentleman in the car. "'That seems to be a similar cart and donkey,' Dorian heard him saying, but the clothes don't seem to fit your description of the men you saw. Now Mr. Hibbs had extremely vague and wild recollections of the men he saw. He could not even tell what he had done, and what he had merely dreamed. If he had spoken sincerely, he would have described a sort of green nightmare of forests, in which he found himself in the power of an ogre about twelve feet high, with scarlet flames for hair, and dressed rather like Robin Hood but a long course of what is known as keeping the party together had made it as unnatural to him to tell anyone, even himself, what he really thought about anything, as it would have been to spit or to sing. He had at present only three motives and strong resolves. One, not to admit that he had been drunk. Two, not to let anyone escape whom Lord Ivywood might possibly want to question and three, not to lose his reputation for sagacity and tact. This party has a brown velvet suit, you see, and a fur overcoat, the inspector continued, and in the notes I have from you, you say the man wore a uniform. When we say uniform, said Mr. Hibbs, frowning intellectually, when we say uniform, of course we must distinguish some of our friends who don't quite see eye to eye with us, you know, and he smiled with tender leniency. Some of our friends wouldn't like it called a uniform, perhaps. But, of course, well, it wasn't a police uniform, for instance. Ha! Ha! I should hope not, said the official shortly. So, in a way, however, said Hibbs, clutching his verbal talisman at last, it might be brown velvet in the dark. The inspector replied to this helpful suggestion with some wonder. "'But it was a moon, like limelight,' he protested. "'Yars, yars!' cried Hibbs in a high tone that can only be described as a hasty drawl. "'Yars discolors everything, of course, the flowers and things.' "'But look here,' said the inspector, "'you said the principal man's hair was red.' "'A blonde type, a blonde type,' said Hibbs, waving his hand with a solemn lightness. "'Reddish, yellowish, brownish sort of hair, you know.' Then he shook his head and said with the heaviest solemnity the word was capable of carrying, Teutonic, purely Teutonic. The inspector began to feel some wonder that, even in the confusion following on Lord Ivywood's fall, he had been put under the guidance of this particular guide. The truth was that Levison, once more masking his own fears under his usual parade of hurry, had found Hibbs at a table by an open window, with wild hair and sleepy eyes, picking himself up with some sort of medicine. 
Finding him already fairly clear-headed in a dreary way, he had not scrupled to use the remains of his bewilderment to dispatch him with the police in the first pursuit. Even the mind of a semi-recovered drunkard, he thought, could be trusted to recognize anyone so unmistakable as the captain. But though the diplomatist's debauch was barely over, his strange, soft fear and cunning were awake. He felt fairly certain the man in the fur coat had something to do with the mystery, as men with fur coats do not commonly wander about with donkeys. He was afraid of offending Lord Ivywood, and at the same time afraid of exposing himself to a policeman. "'You have large discretion,' he said gravely. "'Very right, you should have large discretion in the interests of the public. I think you would be quite authorized for the present in preventing the man's escape.' "'And the other man?' inquired the officer, with knitted brow. "'Do you suppose he has escaped?' The other man repeated Hibbs, however, regarding the distant windmill through the half-closed lids, as if this were a new fine shade introduced into an already delicate question. "'Well, hang it all,' said the police officer. "'You must know whether there were two men or one.' Gradually it dawned, in a grey dawn of horror, over the brain of Hibbs that this was what he specially couldn't know. He had always heard and read in comic papers that a drunken man sees double and beholds two lamp-posts, one of which is, as the higher critic would have said, purely subjective. For all he knew, being a mere novice, inebriation might produce the impression of the two men in his dreamlike adventure, when in truth there had only been one. Two men, you know, one man he said with a sort of moody carelessness. Well, we can go into their numbers later. They can't have a very large following. Here he shook his head very firmly. Quite impossible. And as the late Lord Goshen used to say, you can prove anything by statistics. And here came an interruption from the other side of the road. And how long am I to wait here for you and your Goshens, you silly goat, were the intemperate wood notes issuing from the poet of the birds. I'm shot if I'll stand this. Come along, donkey, and let's pray for a better adventure next time. These are very inferior specimens of your own race. And seizing the bridle of the ass again, he strode past them swiftly, and almost as if urging the animal to a gallop. Unfortunately, this disdainful dash for liberty was precisely what was wanting to weigh down the rocking intelligence of the inspector on the wrong side. If Wimpole had stood still a minute or two longer, the official, who was no fool, might have ended in disbelieving Hibbs's story altogether. As it was, there was a scuffle, not without blows on both sides, and eventually the Honourable Dorian Wimpole, donkey and all, was marched off to the village, in which there was a police station, in which was a temporary cell, in which a sixth mood was experienced. His complaints, however, were at once so clamorous and so convincing, and his coat was so unquestionably covered with fur, that after some questioning and cross-purposes they agreed to take him in the afternoon to Ivywood House, where there was a magistrate incapacitated by a shot only recently extracted from his leg. They found Lord Ivywood lying on a purple ottoman in the midst of his Chinese puzzle of Oriental apartments. He continued to look away as they entered, as if expecting with Roman calm the entrance of a recognized enemy. But Lady Enid Wimpole, who was attending to the wants of the invalid, gave a sharp cry of astonishment, and the next moment the three cousins were looking at each other. One could almost have guessed they were cousins, all being, as Mr. Hibbs subtly put it, a blonde type. But two of the blonde types expressed amazement, and one blonde type merely rage. I am sorry, Dorian, said Ivywood, when he had heard the whole story. These fanatics are capable of anything, I fear, and you very rightly resent their stealing your car. You are wrong, Philip, answered the poet emphatically. I do not even faintly resent their stealing my car. What I do resent is the continued existence on God's earth of this fool, pointing to the serious... Hibbs, and of that fool, pointing to the inspector. 
and yes by thunder of that fool too and he pointed straight at lord ivywood and i tell you frankly philip if there really are as you say two men who are bent on smashing your schemes and making your life a hell i am very happy to put my car at their disposal and now i'm off you'll stop to dinner inquired ivywood with frigid forgiveness no thanks said the disappearing bard i'm going up to town the seventh mood of dorian wimpole had a grand finale at the cafe royal and consisted largely of oysters end of chapter 16 recording by nicola k Chapter 17 of The Flying Inn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter 17 The Poet in Parliament. During the singular entrance and exit of Dorian Wimpole, M.P., J.P., etc., Lady Joan was looking out of the magic casements of that turret room which was now literally, and not only poetically, the last limit of Ivywood House. The old broken hole and black staircase up which the lost dog Quoodle used to come and go had long ago been sealed up and cemented with a wall of exquisite eastern workmanship. All through the patterns, Lord Ivywood had preserved and repeated the principle that no animal shape must appear but like all lucid dogmatists he perceived all the liberties his dogma allowed him and he irradiated this remote end of ivywood with sun and moon and solar and starry systems with the milky way for a dado and a few comets for comic relief the thing was well done of its kind as were all the things that philip ivywood got done for him and if all the windows of the turret were closed with their peacock curtains a poet with anything like a Hibsian appreciation of the family champagne might almost fancy he was looking out across the sea on a night crowded with stars. And, what was yet more important, even my Sisra, that exact thinker, could not call the moon a live animal without falling into idolatry. But Joan, looking out of real windows on a real sky and sea, thought no more about the astronomical wallpaper than about any other wallpaper. She was asking herself in sullen emotionalism, and for the thousandth time, a question she had never been able to decide. It was the final choice between an ambition and a memory, and there was this heavy weight in the scale, that the ambition would probably materialize, and the memory probably wouldn't. It has been the same weight in the same scale a million times since Satan became the prince of this world but the evening stars were strengthening over the old seashore, and they also wanted weighing, like diamonds. As once before, at the same stage of brooding, she heard behind her the swish of Lady Enid's skirts, that never came so fast, save for a serious cause. Joan, please do come. Nobody but you, I do believe, could move him. Joan looked at Lady Enid and realized that the lady was close on crying. She turned a trifle pale, and asked quietly for the question. Philip says he's going to London now, with that leg and all, cried Enid, and he won't let us say a word. But how did it all happen? asked Joan. Lady Enid Wimpole was quite incapable of explaining how it all happened, so the task must for the moment devolve on the author. The simple fact was that Ivywood, in the course of turning over magazines on his sofa, happened to look at a paper from the Midlands. The Turkish news, said Mr. Levison, rather nervously, is on the other side of the page. But Lord Ivywood continued to look at the side of the paper that did not contain the Turkish news, with the same dignity of lowered eyelids and unconscious brow with which he had looked at the captain's message when Joan found him by the turret. On the page covered merely with casual provincial happenings was a paragraph, Echo of Pebblewick Mystery reported reappearance of the vanishing inn underneath was printed in smaller letters an almost incredible report from whittington 
announces that the mysterious sign of the old ship has once more been seen in this country though it has long been relegated by scientific investigators to the limbo of old rustic superstitions according to the local version mr simmons a dairyman of whittington was serving in his shop when two motorists entered one of them asking for a glass of milk they were in the most impenetrable motoring panoply with darkened goggles and waterproof collars turned up so that nothing can be recalled of them personally except that one was a person of unusual stature in a few moments this latter individual went out of the shop again and returned with a miserable specimen out of the street one of the tattered loafers that linger about our most prosperous towns tramping the streets all night and even begging in defiance of the police the filth and disease of the creature were so squalid that mr simmons at first refused to serve him with the glass of milk which the taller motorist wished to provide for him at length however mr simmons consented and was immediately astonished by an incident against which he certainly had a more assured right to protest the taller motorist saying to the loafer but man you're blue in the face made a species of signs to the smaller motorist who thereupon appears to have pierced a sort of cylindrical trunk or chest that seemed to be his only luggage and drawn from it a few drops of a yellow liquid which he deliberately dropped into the ragged creature's milk it was afterward discovered to be rum and the protests of mr simmons may be imagined the tall motorist however warmly defended his action having apparently some wild idea that he was doing an act of kindness why i found the man nearly fainting he said if you'd picked him off a raft he couldn't be more collapsed with cold and sickness and if you'd picked him off a raft you'd have given him rum yes by st patrick if you were a bloody pirate and made him walk the plank afterward mr simmons replied with dignity that he did not know how it was with rafts and could not permit such language in his shop he added that he would lay himself open to a police prosecution if he permitted the consumption of alcohol in his shop since he did not display a sign the motorist then made the amazing reply but you do display a sign you jolly old man did you think I couldn't find my way to the sign of the old ship, you sly boots? Mr. Simmons was now fully convinced of the intoxication of his visitors, and, refusing a glass of rum rather boisterously offered him, went outside his shop to look round for a policeman. To his surprise, he found the officer engaged in dispersing a considerable crowd, which was staring up at some object behind him. On looking round, he states in his deposition, he saw what was undoubtedly one of the low tavern signs at one time common in england he was wholly unable to explain its presence outside his premises and as it undoubtedly legalized the motorist's action the police declined to move in the matter later the two motorists have apparently left the town unmolested in a small second-hand two-seater there is no clue to their destination except it be indicated by a single incident it appears that when they were waiting for the second glass of milk one of them drew attention to a milk can of a shape seemingly unfamiliar to him which was of course the mountain milk now so much recommended by doctors the taller motorist who seemed in every way strangely ignorant of modern science and social life asked his companion where it came from receiving of course the reply that it is manufactured in the model village of peaceways under the personal superintendence of its distinguished and philanthropic inventor dr meadows upon this the taller person who appeared highly irresponsible actually bought the whole can observing as he tucked it under his arm that it would help him to remember the address later our readers will be glad to hear that the legend of the old ship sign has once more yielded to the wholesome skepticism of science our representative reached whittington after the practical jokers or whatever they were had left but he searched the whole frontage of mr simmons's shop and we are in a position to assure the public that there is no trace of the alleged sign lord ivywood laid down the newspaper and looked at the rich and serpentine embroideries on the wall with the expression that a great general might have if he saw a chance of really ruining his enemy if he would also ruin all his previous plans of campaign 
His pallid and classic profile was as immovable as a cameo, but anyone who had known him at all would have known that his brain was going like a motor car that had broken the speed limit long ago. Then he turned his head and said, Please tell Hicks to bring round the long blue car in half an hour. It can be fitted up for a sofa. And ask the gardener to cut a pole of about four feet nine inches and put a cross piece for a crutch. I'm going to London tonight. Mr. Levison's lower jaw literally fell with astonishment. The doctor said three weeks, he said. If I may ask it, where are you going? St. Stephen's, Westminster, answered Ivywood. Surely, said Mr. Levison, I could take a message. You could take a message, assented Ivywood. I'm afraid they would not allow you to make a speech. It was a moment or two afterward that Enid Wimpole had come into the room and striven in vain to shake his decision. Then it was that Joan had been brought out of the turret and saw Philip standing, sustained upon a crutch of garden timber, and admired him as she had never admired him before. While he was being helped downstairs, while he was being propped in the car with such limited comfort as possible, she did really feel in him something worthy of his ancient roots, worthy of such hills and of such a sea, for she felt God's wind from nowhere, which is called the will, and is man's only excuse upon this earth. In the small toot of the starting motor, she could hear a hundred trumpets, such as might have called her ancestors and his to the glories of the Third Crusade. Such imaginary military honors were not, at least in the strategic sense, undeserved. Lord Ivywood really had seen the whole map of the situation in front of him, and swiftly formed a plan to meet it, in a manner not unworthy of Napoleon. The realities of the situation unrolled themselves before him, and his mind was marking them one by one as with a pencil. First, he knew that Dalroy would probably go to the model village. It was just the sort of place he would go to. He knew Dalroy was almost constitutionally incapable of not kicking up some kind of row in a place of that kind. Second, he knew that if he missed Dalroy at this address, it was very likely to be his last address. He and Mr. Pump were quite clever enough to leave no more hints behind. Third, he guessed by careful consideration of map and clock that they could not get to so remote a region in so cheap a car under something like two days, nor do anything very conclusive in less than three. Thus he had just time to turn round in. Fourth, he realized that ever since that day when Dalroy swung round the signboard and smote the policeman into the ditch, Dalroy had swung round the Ivywood Act on Lord Ivywood. He, Lord Ivywood, had thought, and might well have thought rightly, that by restricting the old signposts to a few places so select that they can afford to be eccentric, and forbidding such artistic symbols to all other places, he could sweep fermented liquor for all practical purposes out of the land. The arrangement was exactly that at which all such legislation is consciously or unconsciously aiming. A signboard could be a favor granted by the governing class to itself. If a gentleman wished to claim the liberties of a bohemian, the path would be open. If a bohemian wished to claim the liberties of a gentleman, the path would be shut. So gradually Lord Ivywood had thought, the old signs which can alone sell alcohol will dwindle down to mere curiosities like audit ale or the mead that may still be found in the new forest. The calculation was by no means unstatesmanlike but like many other statesmanlike calculations it did not take into account the idea of deadwood walking about so long as his flying foes might set up their sign anywhere it mattered little whether the result was enjoyment or disappointment for the populace in either case it must mean constant scandal or riot if there was one thing worse than the appearance of the old ship it was its disappearance he realized that his own law was letting them loose every time, for the local authorities hesitated to act on the spot in defiance of a symbol now so exclusive and therefore impressive. He realized that the law must be altered, must be altered at once, must be altered, if possible, before the fugitives broke away from the model village of Peaceways. He realized that it was Thursday. 
This was the day on which any private member of Parliament could introduce any private bill of the kind called non-contentious, and pass it without a division, so long as no particular member made any particular fuss. He realized that it was improbable that any particular member would make any particular fuss about Lord Ivywood's own improvement on Lord Ivywood's own act. Finally, he realized that the whole case could be met by so slight an improvement as this. Change the words of the act, which he knew by heart, as happier men might know a song. If such a sign be present, liquids containing alcohol can be sold on the premises. To these other words. Liquids containing alcohol can be sold, if previously preserved for three days on the premises. It was mate in a few moves. Parliament could never reject or even examine so slight an emendation, and the revolution of the old ship and the late king of Ithaca would be crushed for ever. It does undoubtedly show, as we have said, something Napoleonic in the man's mind, that the whole of this excellent and even successful plan was complete long before he saw the great glowing clock on the towers of Westminster, and knew he was in time. It was unfortunate, perhaps, that about the same time, or not long after, another gentleman of the same rank, and indirectly of the same family, having left the restaurant in Regent Street and the tangle of Piccadilly, had drifted serenely down Whitehall, and had seen the same great golden goblin's eye on the tall tower of St. Stephen. The poet of the birds, like most esthetes, had known as little of the real town as he had of the real country but he had remembered a good place for supper, and as he passed certain great cold clubs, built of stone and looking like Assyrian sarcophagi, he remembered that he belonged to many of them, and so when he saw afar off, sitting above the river, what had been very erroneously described as the best club in London, he suddenly remembered that he belonged to that too. He could not at the moment recall what constituency in South England it was that he sat for, but he knew he could walk into the place if he wanted to. He might not have so expressed the matter, but he knew that in an oligarchy things go by respect for persons and not for claims, by visiting cards and not by voting cards. He had not been near the place for years, being permanently paired against a famous patriot who had accepted an important government appointment in a private madhouse. Even in his silliest days he had never pretended to feel any respect for modern politics, and made all haste to put his leaders, and the mad patriots' leaders, on the well-selected list of the creatures whom man forgets. He had made one really eloquent speech in the house, on the subject of guerrillas, and then found he was speaking against his party. It was an indescribable sort of place, anyhow. Even Lord Ivywood did not go to it, except to do some business, that could be done nowhere else, as was the case that night. Ivywood was what is called a peer by courtesy. His place was in the commons, and for the time being on the opposition side. But though he visited the house but seldom, he knew far too much about it to go into the chamber itself. He limped into the smoking room, though he did not smoke, procured a needless cigarette and a much needed sheet of note paper and composed a curt but careful note to the one member of the government whom he knew must be in the house. Having sent it up to him, he waited. Outside, Mr. Dorian Wimpole also waited, leaning on the parapet of Westminster Bridge and looking down the river. He was becoming one of the oysters in a more solemn and solid sense than he had hitherto conceived possible, and also with a strictly vegetarian beverage which bears the noble and starry name of Newitz. He felt at peace with all things, even in a manner with politics. It was one of those magic hours of evening when the red and golden lights of men are already lit along the river, and look like the lights of goblins, but daylight still lingers in a cold and delicate green. He felt about the river something of that smiling and glorious sadness which two Englishmen have expressed under the figure of the white wood of an old ship fading like a phantom, Turner in painting and Henry Newbolt in poetry. He had come back to earth like a man fallen from the moon. He was at bottom not only a poet, but a patriot, and a patriot is always a little sad. 
yet his melancholy was mixed up with that immutable yet meaningless faith which few englishmen even in modern times fail to feel at the unexpected sight either of westminster or of that height on which stands the temple of st paul while flows the sacred river while stands the sacred hill he murmured in some schoolboy echo of the ballad of lake regillus while flows the sacred river while stands the sacred hill the proud old pantaloons and nincompoops who yawn at the very length of their own lies in that accursed sanhedrim where people put each other's hats on in a poisonous room with no more windows than hell shall have such honor still relieved by this rendering of macaulay in the style known among his cultured friends as ver libre or poesy set free from the shackles of formal metre he strolled toward the members entrance and went in lacking lord ivywood's experience he strolled into the commons chamber itself and sat down on a green bench under the impression that the house was not sitting he was however gradually able to distinguish some six or eight drowsy human forms from the seats on which they sat and to hear a senile voice with an essex accent saying all on one note and without beginning or end in a manner which is quite impossible to punctuate no wish at all that this proposal should be regarded except in the right way and have tried to put it in the right way and cannot think the honourable member was altogether adding to his reputation in putting it in what those who think we must of course consider the wrong way and i for one am free to say that if in his desire to settle this great question he takes this hasty course and this revolutionary course about slate pencils he may not be able to prevent the extremists behind him from applying it to lead pencils and while i should be the last to increase the heat and the excitement and the personalities of this debate if i could possibly help it i must confess that in my opinion the honourable gentleman has himself encouraged that heat and personality in a manner that he now doubtless regrets i have no desire to use abusive terms indeed you mr speaker would not allow me of course to use abusive terms but i must tell the honourable member face to face that the perambulators with which he has twitted me cannot be germane to this discussion i should be the last person dorian wimpole had softly risen to go when he was arrested by the sight of someone sliding into the house and handing a note to the solitary young man with heavy eyelids who was at that moment governing all england from the treasury bench seeing him go out dorian had a sickening sweetness of hope as he might have said in his earlier poems that something intelligible might happen after all and followed him out almost with alacrity the solitary and sleepy governor of great britain went down into the lower crypts of its temple of freedom and turned into an apartment where wimpole was astonished to see his cousin ivywood sitting at a little table with a large crutch leaning beside him as serene as long john silver the young man with the heavy eyelids sat down opposite him and they had a conversation which Wimpole, of course, did not hear. He withdrew into an adjoining room, where he managed to procure coffee and a liqueur, an excellent liqueur which he had forgotten, and of which he had more than one glass. But he had so posted himself that Ivywood could not come out without passing him, and he waited for what might happen with exquisite patience. The only thing that seemed to him queer was that every now and then a bell rang in several rooms at once and whenever the bell rang lord ivywood nodded as if he were part of the electrical machinery and whenever lord ivywood nodded the young man turned and sped upstairs like a mountaineer returning in a short time to resume the conversation on the third occasion the poet began to observe that many others from the other rooms could be heard running upstairs at the sound of this bell and returning with the slightly less rapid step which expresses relief after a duty done yet did he not know that this duty was representative government and that it is thus that the cry of cumberland or cornwall can come to the ears of an english king suddenly the sleepy young man sprang erect uninspired by any bell and strode out once more the poet could not help hearing him say as he left the table jotting down something with a pencil 
Alcohol can be sold if previously preserved for three days on the premises. I think we can do it, but you can't come on for half an hour. Saying this, he darted upstairs again, and when Dorian saw Ivywood come out laboriously afterward on his large country crutch, he had exactly the same revulsion in his favor that Joan had had. Jumping up from his table, which was in one of the private dining rooms, he touched the other on the elbow and said, I want to apologize to you, Philip, for my rudeness this afternoon. Honestly, I am sorry. Pine woods and prison cells try a man's temper. But I had no rag of excuse for not saying that for neither of them were you to blame. I'd no notion you were coming up to town tonight, with your leg and all. You mustn't knock yourself up like this. Do sit down a minute. It seemed to him that the bleak face of Philip softened a little. How far he really softened will never be known until such men as he are understood by their fellows. It is certain that he carefully unhooked himself from his crutch and sat down opposite his cousin, whereupon his cousin struck the table so that it rang like a dinner bell and called out, Waiter! as if he were in a crowded restaurant. Then before Lord Ivywood could protest, he said, It's awfully jolly that we've met. I suppose you've come up to make a speech. I should like to hear it. We haven't always agreed, but, by God, if there's anything good left in literature, it's your speeches reported in a newspaper. That thing of yours that ended death and the last shutting of the iron doors of defeat, why, well, you must go back to Strafford's last speech for such English. Do let me hear your speech. I've got a seat upstairs, you know. If you wish it, said Ivywood hurriedly, but I shan't make much of a speech tonight. And he looked at the wall behind Wimpole's head, with thunderous wrinkles thickening on his brow. It was essential to his brilliant and rapid scheme, of course, that the commons should make no comment at all on his little alteration in the law. An attendant hovered near in response to the demand for a waiter, and was much impressed by the presence and condition of Lord Ivywood. But as that exalted cripple resolutely refused anything in the way of liquor, his cousin was so kind as to have a little more himself, and resumed his remarks. It's about this public house affair of yours, I suppose. I'd like to hear you speak on that. Perhaps I'll speak myself. I've been thinking about it a good deal all day, and a good deal of last night, too. Now, here's what I should say to the house, if I were you. To begin with, can you abolish the public house? Are you important enough now to abolish the public house? Whether it's right or wrong, can you, in the long run, prevent haymakers having ale any more than you can prevent me having this glass of chartreuse? The attendant, hearing the word, once more drew near, but heard no further order, or rather, the orders he heard were such as he was less able to cope with. Remember the curate, said Dorian abstractedly, shaking his head at the functionary. Remember the sensible little high church curate, who, when asked for a temperance sermon, preached on the text, Suffer us not to be overwhelmed in the water floods? Indeed, indeed, Philip, you are in deeper waters than you know. You will abolish ale. You will make Kent forget hop poles, and Devonshire forget cider. The fate of the inn is to be settled in that hot little room upstairs. Take care its fate and yours are not settled in the inn. Take care Englishmen don't sit in judgment on you as they do on many another corpse at an inquest, at a common public house. Take care that the one tavern that is really neglected and shut up and passed like a house of pestilence is not the tavern in which I drink tonight and that merely because it is the worst tavern on the king's highway. Take care this place where we sit does not get a name like any pub where sailors are hocused or girls debauched. That is what I shall say to them, said he, rising cheerfully. That's what I shall say. See you to it, he cried with a sudden passion, and apparently to the waiter. See you to it, if the sign that is destroyed is not the sign of the old ship, but the sign of the mace and bauble and in the words of a highly historical brewer if we see a dog bark at your going lord ivywood was observing him with a deathly quietude another idea had come into his fertile mind he knew his cousin though excited was not in the least intoxicated 
He knew that he was quite capable of making a speech, and even a good one. He knew that any speech, good or bad, would wreck his whole plan, and send the wild inn flying again. But the orator had resumed his seat and drained his glass, passing a hand across his brow. And he remembered that a man who keeps a vigil in the wood all night, and drinks wine on the following evening, is liable to an accident that is not drunkenness, but something much healthier. I suppose your speech will come on pretty soon, said Dorian, looking at the table. You'll let me know when it does, of course. Really and truly, I don't want to miss it. And I've forgotten all the ways here and feel pretty tired. You'll let me know? Yes, said Lord Ivywood. Stillness fell along all the rooms until Lord Ivywood broke it by saying, Debate is a most necessary thing, but there are times when it rather impedes than assists parliamentary government. He received no reply. Dorian still sat as if looking at the table, but his eyelids had lightly fallen. He was asleep. Almost at the same moment, the member of government, who was nearly asleep, appeared at the entrance of the long room and made some sort of weary signal. Philip Ivywood raised himself on his crutch and stood for a moment looking at the sleeping man. Then he and his crutch trailed out of the long room, leaving the sleeping man behind nor was that the only thing that he left behind. He also left behind an unlighted cigarette and his honor and all the England of his fathers, everything that could really distinguish that high house beside the river from any tavern for the hocusing of sailors. He went upstairs and did his business in twenty minutes, in the only speech he had ever delivered without any trace of eloquence. And from that hour forth, he was the naked fanatic, and could feed on nothing but the future. End of chapter 17 The Poet in Parliament Chapter 18 of The Flying Inn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicola K. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter 18. The Republic of Peaceways. In a hamlet round about Windermere, let us say, or somewhere in Wordsworth's country, there could be found a cottage, in which could be found a cottager. So far all is as it should be, and the visitor would first be conscious of a hearty and even noisy elderly man, with an apple face and a short white beard. This person would then loudly proffer to the visitor the opportunity of seeing his father a somewhat more elderly man with a somewhat longer white beard but still up and about and these two together would then initiate the neophyte into the joys of the society of a grandfather who was more than a hundred years old and still very proud of the fact this miracle it seemed had been worked entirely on milk the subject of this diet the oldest of the three men continued to discuss in enormous detail. For the rest, it might be said that his pleasures were purely arithmetical. Some men count their years with dismay, and he counted his with a juvenile vanity. Some men collect stamps or coins, and he collected days. Newspaper men interviewed him about the historic times through which he had lived, without eliciting anything whatever except that he had apparently taken to an exclusive milk diet at about the age when most of us leave it off. Asked if he was alive in 1815, he said that was the very year he found it wasn't any milk but must be mountain milk, like Dr. Meadows says. Nor would his calculating creed of life have allowed him to understand you if you had said that in a meadowland over sea that lies before the city of Brussels, boys of his old school in that year gained the love of the gods and died young. It was the 
philanthropic Dr. Meadows, of course, who discovered this deathless tribe, and erected on it the whole of his great dietetic philosophy, to say nothing of the houses and dairies of peaceways. He attracted many pupils and backers among the wealthy and influential. Young men who were, so to speak, training for extreme old age, infant old men, embryo non agenarians it would be an exaggeration to say that they watched joyfully for the first white hair as fascination fledgeby watched for his first whisker but it is quite true to say that they seemed to have scorned the beauty of woman and the feasting of friends and above all the old idea of death with glory in comparison with this vision of the sports of second childhood Peaceways was in its essential plan much like what we call a garden city, a ring of buildings where the work people did their work, with a pretty ornamental town in the centre, where they lived in the open country outside. This was no doubt much healthier than the factory system in the great towns, and may have partly accounted for the serene expression of Dr. Meadows and his friends, if any part of the credit can be spared from the splendors of mountain milk. The place lay far from the common highways of England, and its inhabitants were enabled to enjoy their quiet skies and level woods almost undisturbed, and fully absorb whatever may be valuable in the meadow's method and view, until one day a small and very dirty motor drove into the middle of their town. It stopped beside one of those triangular islets of grass that are common at forked roads, and two men in goggles one tall and the other short got out and stood on the central space of grass as if they were buffoons about to do tricks as indeed they were before entering the town they had stopped by a splendid mountain stream quickening and thickening rapidly into a river unhelmed and otherwise eased themselves, eaten a little bread bought at Whittington, and drank the water of the widening current which opened on the valley of Peaceways. I'm beginning quite to like water, said the taller of the two knights. I used to think it a most dangerous drink. In theory, of course, it ought only to be given to people who are fainting. It's really good for them, much better than brandy. Besides, think of wasting good brandy on people who are fainting but i don't go so far as i did i shouldn't insist on a doctor's prescription before i allow people water that was the too severe morality of youth that was my innocence and goodness i thought that if i fell once water drinking might become a habit but i do see the good side of water now how good it is when you're really thirsty how it glitters and gurgles how alive it is after all it's the best of drinks after the other as it says in the song, feast on wine or fast on water, and your honor shall stand sure. God Almighty's son and daughter, he the valiant, she the pure. If an angel out of heaven brings you other things to drink, thank him for his kind intentions. Go and pour them down the sink. Tea is like the east he grows in, a great yellow mandarin, with urbanity of manner and unconsciousness of sin. All the women, like a harem, at his pigtail troop along, and, like all the east he grows in, he is poison when he's strong. Tea, although an oriental, is a gentleman at least. Coco is a cad and coward. Coco is a vulgar beast. Coco is a dull, disloyal, lying, crawling, cad and clown, and may very well be grateful to the fool that takes him down. As for all the windy waters, they were rained like trumpets down, when good drink had been dishonored by the tipplers of the town, when red wine had brought red ruin and the death dance of our times, heaven sent us soda water as a torment for our crimes. Upon my soul, this water tastes quite nice. I wonder what vintage now, and he smacked his lips with solemnity. It tastes just like the year 1881 tasted. You can fancy anything in the tasting way, returned his shorter companion. 
Mr. Jack, who was always up to his tricks, did serve plain water in those little glasses they drink liqueurs out of, and every one swore it was a delicious liqueur and wanted to know where they could get it. All except old Admiral Guffin, who said it tasted too strong of olives. But water's much the best for our game, certainly. Patrick nodded and then said, I doubt if I could do it, if it weren't for the comfort of looking at that. And he kicked the rum keg, and feeling we shall have a good swig at it some day. It feels like a fairy tale carrying that about, as if rum were a pirate's treasure, as if it were molten gold. Besides, we can have such fun with it with other people. What was that joke I thought of this morning? Oh, I remember. Where's that milk can of mine? For the next twenty minutes he was industriously occupied with his milk can and the cask. Pump watching him with an interest amounting to anxiety. Lifting his head, however, at the end of that time, he nodded his red brows and said, What's that? What's what? asked the other traveller. That, said Captain Patrick Dalroy, and pointed to a figure approaching on the road parallel to the river. I mean, what's it for? The figure had a longish beard and very long hair falling far below its shoulders. It had a serious and steadfast expression. It was dressed in what the inexperienced Mr. Pump at first took to be its nightgown, but afterward learned it to be its complete goat's hair tunic, unmixed even with a thread of the destructive and deadly wool of the sheep. It had no boots on its feet. It walked very swiftly to a particular turn of the stream and then turned very sharply, since it had accomplished its constitutional, and walked back toward the perfect town of Peaceways. I suppose it's somebody from that milk place, said Humphrey Pump indulgently. They seem to be pretty mad. I don't mind that so much, said Dalroy. I'm mad myself sometimes. But a madman has only one merit and last link with God. A madman is always logical. Now what is the logical connection between living on milk and wearing your hair long? Most of us lived on milk when we had no hair at all. How do they connect it up? Are there any heads even for a synopsis? Is it, say, milk, water, shaving water, shaving, hair? Is it milk, kindness, unkindness, convicts, hair? What is the logical connection between having too much hair and having far too few boots? What can it be? Is it hair, hair trunk, leather trunk, leather boots? Is it hair, beard, oysters, seaside, paddling, no boots? Man is liable to err, especially when every mistake he makes is called a movement. But why should all the lunacies live together? Because all the lunatics should live together, said Humphrey, and if you'd seen what happened up at Crampton with the farming out idea, you'd know. It's all very well, Captain, but if people can prevent a guest of great importance being buried up to the neck in farm manure, they will. They will, really. He coughed almost apologetically. He was about to attempt a resumption of the conversation when he saw his companion slap the milk can and keg back into the car and get into it himself. You drive, he said. Drive me where those things live. You know, Hump. They did not, however, arrive in the civic center of such things without yet another delay. They left the river and followed the man with the long hair and the goatskin frock, and he stopped as it happened at a house on the outskirts of the village. The adventurers stopped also, out of curiosity, and were at first relieved to see the man almost instantly reappear, having transacted his business with a quickness that seemed incredible. A second glance showed them it was not the man, but another man dressed exactly like him. A few minutes more of inquisitive delay showed them many of the kilty and goatish sect going in and out of this particular place, each clad in his innocent uniform. This must be the temple and chapel, muttered Patrick. It must be here they sacrifice a glass of milk to a cow, or whatever it is they do. Well, the joke is pretty obvious, but we must wait for a lull in the crowding of the congregation. When the last long-haired phantom had faded up the road, Dalroy sprang from the car and drove the signboard deep into the earth with savage violence, and then very quietly knocked at the door. 
the apparent owner of the place of whom the two last of the long-haired and barefooted idealists were taking a rather hurried farewell was a man curiously ill-fitted for the part he seemed cast for in the only possible plot both pump and dalroy thought they had never seen a man look so sullen his face was of the rubicund sort that does not suggest jollity but merely a stagnant indigestion in the head his moustache hung heavy and dark, his brows yet heavier and darker. Dalroy had seen something of the sort on the faces of defeated people, disgracefully forced into submission, but he could not make head or tail of it in connection with the priggish perfections of peaceways. It was all the odder because he was manifestly prosperous. His clothes were smartly cut in something of the sporting manner and the inside of his house was at least four times grander than the outside but what mystified the most was this that he did not so much exhibit the natural curiosity of a gentleman whose private house is entered by strangers but rather an embarrassed and restless expectation during dalroy's eager apologies and courteous inquiries about the direction and accommodations of peaceways his eye which was of the boiled gooseberry order perpetually wandered from them to the cupboard and then again to the window and at last he got up and went to look out into the road oh yes sir a very healthy place peaceways he said peering through the lattice very dash it what do they mean a very healthy place of course they have their little ways only drink pure milk don't they asked dalroy the householder looked at him with a rather wild eye and grunted yes so they say and he went again to the window i've bought some of it said patrick patting his pet milk can which he carried under his arm as if unable to be separated from dr meadow's discovery have a glass of milk sir the man's boiled eye began to bulge in anger or some other emotion what do you want he muttered are you tex or what agents and distributors of the meadows mountain milk said the captain with simple pride taste it the dazed householder took a glass of the blameless liquid and sipped it and the change on his face was extraordinary well i'm jiggered he said with a broad and rather coarse grin that's a queer dodge you're in the joke i see then he went again restlessly to the window and added but if we're all friends why the blazes don't the others come in i've never known trade so slow before who are the others asked mr pump oh the usual peaceways people said the other they generally come here before work dr meadows don't work them for very long hours that wouldn't be healthy or whatever he calls it but he's particular about their being punctual i've seen em running with all their pure-minded togs on when the hooter gave the last call then he abruptly opened the front door and called out impatiently but not loudly come along in if you're coming you'll give the show away if you play the fool out there patrick looked out also and the view of the road outside was certainly rather singular he was used to crowds large and small collecting outside houses which he had honored with the sign of the old ship but they generally stared up at it in unaffected wonder and amusement but outside this open door some twenty or thirty persons in what pump had called their nightgowns were moving to and fro like somnambulists apparently blind to the presence of the sign looking at the other side of the road looking at the horizon looking at the clouds of morning and only occasionally stopping to whisper to each other but when the owner of the house called to one of these ostentatiously abstracted beings and asked him hoarsely what the devil was the matter it was natural for the milk-fed one to turn his feeble eye toward the sign the gooseberry eyes followed his and the face to which they belonged was a study in apoplectic astonishment what the hell have you done to my house he demanded of course they can't come in if this thing's here i'll take it down if you like said dalroy stepping out and picking it up like a flower from the front garden to the amazement of the men in the road who thought they had strayed into a nursery fairy tale but i wish in return you'd give me some idea of what the blazes all this means wait till i've served these men replied his host 
the goat-garbed persons went very sheepishly or goatishly into the now signless building and were rapidly served with raw spirits which mr pump suspected to be of no very superior quality when the last goat was gone captain dalroy said i mean that all this seems to me topsy-turvy i understood that as the law stands now if there's a sign they are allowed to drink and if there isn't they aren't the law said the man in a voice thick with scorn do you think these poor brutes are afraid of the law as they are of the doctor why should they be afraid of the doctor asked dalroy innocently i always heard that peaceways was a self-governing republic self-governing be damned was the illiberal reply don't he own all the houses and could turn em out in a snowstorm don't he pay all the wages and could starve em stiff in a month the law and he snorted a moment after he squared his elbows on the table and began to explain more fully i was a brewer about here and had the biggest brewery in these parts there were only two houses which didn't belong to me and the magistrates took away their licenses after a time Ten years ago you could see Hugby's Ales written beside every sign in the county. Then came these cursed radicals, and our leader, Lord Ivywood, must go over to their side about it, and let this doctor buy all the land under some new law that there shan't be any pubs at all. And so my business is ruined, so that he can sell his milk. Luckily I'd done pretty well before and had some compensation, of course, and I still do a fair trade on the QT, as you see. But of course that don't amount to half the old one, for they're afraid of old Meadows finding out, snuffling old blighter. And the gentleman with the good clothes spat on the carpet. I am a radical myself, said the Irishman rather coldly. For all information on the Conservative Party, I must refer you to my friend Mr. Pump, who is, of course, in the inmost secrets of his leaders. But it seems to me very rum sort of radicalism to eat and drink at the orders of a master who is a madman, merely because he's also a millionaire. O oh, liberty, what very complicated and even unsatisfactory social developments are committed in thy name. Why don't they kick the old ass round the town a bit? No boots? Is that why they're allowed no boots? Oh, roll em down hill in a milk can. He can't object to that. I don't know, said Pump in his ruminant way. Master Christian's aunt did, but ladies are more particular, of course. Look here, cried Delroy in some excitement. If I stick up that sign outside and stay here to help, will you defy them? You'd be strictly within the law, and any private coercion I can promise you they shall repent plant the sign and sell the stuff openly like a man and you may stand in english history like a deliverer mr hugby of hugby's ales only looked gloomily at the table his was not the sort of drinking nor the sort of drink selling on which the revolutionary sentiment flourishes well said the captain will you come with me and say hear hear and how true what matchless eloquence if i make a speech in the marketplace Come along, there's room in our car. Well, I'll come with you if you like, replied Mr. Hugby heavily. It's true if yours is allowed, we might get our trade back too. And putting on a silk hat, he followed the captain and the innkeeper out to their little car. The model village was not an appropriate background for Mr. Hugby's silk hat. Indeed, the hat seemed somehow to bring out, by contrast, all that was fantastic in the place. It was a superb morning, some hours after sunrise. The edges of the sky touching the ring of dim woods and distant hills were still jeweled with the tiny transparent clouds of daybreak, delicate red and green or yellow. But above the vault of heaven rose through turquoise into a torrid and solid blue in which the other clouds, the colossal cumuli, tumbled about like a celestial pillow fight. The bulk of the houses were as white as the clouds, so that it looked, to use another simile, as if some of the whitewashed cottages were flying and falling about the sky. But most of the white houses were picked out here and there with bright colors, here an ornament in orange or there a stripe of lemon yellow, as if by the brush of a baby giant. The houses had no thatching. Thatching is not hygienic. 
but were mostly covered with a sort of peacock green tiles bought cheap at a pre-raphaelite bazaar or less frequently by some still more esoteric sort of terracotta bricks the houses were not english nor homelike nor suited to the landscape for the houses had not been built by free men for themselves but at the fancy of a whimsical lord but considered as a sort of elfin city in a pantomime it was a really picturesque background for pantomimic proceedings i fear mr delroy's proceedings from the first rather deserved that name to begin with he left the sign the cask and the keg all wrapped and concealed in the car but removed all the wraps of his own disguise and stood on the central patch of grass in that green uniform that looked all the more insolent for being as ragged as the grass even that was less ragged than his red hair which no red jungle of the east could imitate then he took out almost tenderly the large milk can and deposited it almost reverently on the island of turf then he stood beside it like napoleon beside a gun with an expression of tremendous seriousness and even severity then he drew his sword and with that flashing weapon as with a flail lashed and thrashed the echoing metal can till the din was deafening and mr hugby hastily got out of the car and withdrew to a slight distance stopping his ears mr pump sat solidly at the steering wheel well knowing it might be necessary to start in some haste gather 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 peaceways shouted patrick still banging on the can and lamenting the difficulties of adapting macgregor's gathering to the name and occasion where landless 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 peaceways two or three of the goat clad recognizing mr hugby with a guilty look drew near with great caution and the captain shouted at them as if they were an army covering salisbury plain citizens he roared saying anything that came into his head try the only original unadulterated mountain milk for which alone mahomet came to the mountain the original milk of the land flowing with milk and honey the high quality of which could alone have popularized so unappetizing a combination try our milk none others are genuine who can do without milk even whales can't do without milk if any lady or gentleman keeps a favorite whale at home now's their chance the early whale catches the milk just look at our milk if you say you can't look at the milk because it's in the can well look at the can you must look at the can you simply must when duty whispers low thou must he bellowed at the top of his voice in a highly impromptu peroration when duty whispers low thou must the youth replies i can and with the word can he hit the can with a shocking and shattering noise like a peal of demoniac bells of steel this introductory speech is open to criticism from those who regard it as intended for the study rather than the stage the present chronicler who has no aim save truth is bound to record that for its own unscrupulous purpose it was extremely successful a great mass of the citizens of peaceways having been attracted by the noise of one man shouting like a crowd there are crowds who do not care to revolt but there are no crowds who do not like someone else to do it for them a fact which the safest oligarchs may be wise to learn but dalroy's ultimate triumph i regret to say consisted in actually handing to a few of the foremost of his audience some samples of his blameless beverage the fact was certainly striking some were paralyzed with surprise some were abruptly broken double with laughter many chuckled some cheered all looked radiantly toward the eccentric orator and yet the radiance died quietly and suddenly from their faces and only because one little old man had joined the group a little old man in white linen with a white pointed beard and a white powder puff of hair like thistledown a man whom almost every man present could have killed with the left arm End of chapter 18 Recording by Nicole K.
Chapter 19 of The Flying Inn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicola K. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter 19 The Hospitality of the Captain. Dr. Moses Meadows, whether that was his name or an anglicized version of it, had certainly come in the first instance from a little town in Germany, and his first two books were written in German. His first two books were his best, for he began with a genuine enthusiasm for physical science, and this was adulterated with nothing worse than a hatred of what he thought was superstition, and what many of us think is the soul of the state. The first enthusiasm was most notable in the first book, which was concerned to show that in the female not upsprouting of the whiskers was from the therewith increasing arrested mentality derived. In his second book he came more to grips with delusions, and for some time he was held to have proved to every one who agreed with him already that the time ghost had been walking particularly rapidly lately, and that the Christus mythus was by the alcoholic mind's trouble explained. Then, unfortunately, he came across the institution called death and began to argue with it not seeing any rational explanation of this custom of dying so prevalent among his fellow-citizens he concluded that it was merely traditional which he thought meant effete and began to think of nothing but ways of evading or delaying it this had a rather narrowing effect on him and he lost much of that acrid ardour which had humanized the atheism of his youth when he would almost have committed suicide for the pleasure of taunting god with not being there his later idealism grew more and more into materialism and consisted of his changing hypotheses and discoveries about the healthiest foods there is no need to detain the reader over what has been called his oil period his seaweed period has been authoritatively expounded in Professor Nim's valuable little work, and on the events of his glue period it is, perhaps, not very generous to dwell. It was during his prolonged stay in England that he chanced on the instance of the longevity of milk consumers, and built on it a theory which was, at the beginning at least, sincere. Unfortunately, it was also successful. Wealth flowed in to the inventor and proprietor of mountain milk, and he began to feel a fourth and last enthusiasm which also can come late in life and have a narrowing effect on the mind in the altercation which naturally followed on his discovery of the antics of mr patrick delroy he was very dignified but naturally not very tolerant for he was quite unused to anything happening in spite of him or anything important even happening without him in the land that lay around at first he hinted severely that the captain had stolen the milk can from the milk producing premises and sent several workmen to count the cans in each shed but dalroy soon put him right about that i bought it in a shop at whittington he said and since then i have used no other you'll hardly believe me he said with some truth but when i went into that shop i was quite a little man i had one glass of your mountain milk and look at me now you have no right to sell the milk here said dr meadows with the faintest trace of a german accent you are not in my employment i am not responsible for your methods you are not a representative of the business i am an advertisement said the captain we advertise you all over england you see that lean skimpy little man over there pointing to the indignant mr pump he's before taking meadows mountain milk i'm after added mr dalroy with satisfaction you shall laugh at the magistrate said the other with a thickening accent i shall agreed patrick well i'll make a clean breast of it sir the truth is it isn't your milk at all it has quite a different taste these gentlemen will tell you so 
a smothered giggle sent all the blood to the eminent capitalist's face. "'Then either you have stolen my can and are a thief,' he said, stamping, "'or you have introduced inferior substances into my discovery and are an adulterer-er.' "'Try adulteratist,' said Dalroy kindly. "'Prince Albert always said adulteratarian. "'Dear old Albert, it seems like yesterday, but it is, of course, today. "'And it's as true as daylight that this stuff tastes different.' I can't tell you what the taste is, subdued guffaws from the outskirts of the crowd. It's something between the taste of your first sugar stick and the fag end of your father's cigar. It's as innocent as heaven and as hot as hell. It tastes like a paradox. It tastes like a prehistoric inconsistency. I trust I make myself clear. The men who taste it most are the simplest men that God has made, and it always reminds them of the salt, because it is made out of sugar. Have some. And with a gesture of staggering hospitality, he shot out his long arm with the little glass at the end of it. The despotic curiosity in the Prussian overcame even his despotic dignity. He took a sip of the liquid, and his eyes stood out from his face. "'You've been mixing something with the milk,' were the first words that came to him. "'Yes,' answered Delroy, "'and so have you, unless you're a swindler. "'Why is your milk advertised as different from everyone else's milk, "'if you haven't made the difference? "'Why does a glass of your milk cost threepence, "'and a glass of ordinary milk a penny?' if you haven't put two penorth of something into it. Now look here, Dr. Meadows. The public analyst who would judge this happens to be an honest man. I have a list of the twenty-one and a half honest men still employed in such posts. I make you a fair offer. He shall decide what it is I add to the milk, if you let him decide what it is you add to the milk. You must add something to the milk. Or what can all these wheels and pumps and pulleys be for? Will you tell me here and now what you add to the milk which makes it so exceedingly mountain? There was a long silence, full of the same sense of submerged mirth in the mob. But the philanthropist had fallen into a naked frenzy in the sunlight, and shaking his fists aloft in a way unknown to all the English around him, he cried out, Ah! But I know what you add. I know what you add. It is the alcohol. And you have no sign, and you shall laugh at a magistrate. Dalroy, with a bow, retired to the car, removed a number of wrappings, and produced the prodigious wooden signpost of the old ship, with its blue three-decker and red St. George's cross conspicuously displayed this he planted on his narrow territory of turf and looked round serenely in this old oak panelled inn of mine he said i will laugh at a million magistrates not that there's anything unhygienic about this inn no low ceilings or stuffiness here windows open everywhere except in the floor and as i hear some are saying there ought always to be food sold with fermented liquor why my dear dr meadows i've got a cheese here that will make another man of you at least we'll hope so we can but try but dr meadows was long past being merely angry the exhibition of the sign had put him into a serious difficulty like most sceptics, like even the most genuine sceptics, such as Bradlaugh, he was as legal as he was sceptical. He had a profound fear, which also had in it something better than fear, of being ultimately found in the wrong in a police court or a public inquiry. And he also suffered the tragedy of all such men living in modern England, that he must always be certain to respect the law while never being certain of what it was he could only remember generally that lord ivywood when introducing or defending the great ivywood act on this matter had dwelt very strongly on the unique and significant nature of the sign 
and he could not be certain that if he disregarded it altogether he might not eventually be cast in heavy damages or even go to prison in spite of his success in business of course he knew quite well that he had a thousand answers to such nonsense that a patch of grass in the road couldn't be an inn that the sign wasn't even produced when the captain began to hand round the rum but he also knew quite well that in the black peril we call british law that is not the point he had heard points quite as obvious urged to a judge and urged in vain at the bottom of his mind he found this fact rich as he was lord ivywood had made him and on which side would lord ivywood be captain said humphrey pump speaking for the first time we'd better be getting away i feel it in my bones inhospitable innkeeper cried the captain indignantly and after i have gone out of the way to license your premises why this is the dawn of peace in the great city of peaceways i don't despair of dr meadows tossing off another bumper before we've done for the moment brother hugby will engage as he spoke he served out milk and rum at random and still the doctor had too much terror of our legal technicalities to make a final interference but when mr hugby of hugby's ales heard his name called he first of all jumped so as almost to dislodge the silk hat then he stood quite still then he accepted a glass of the new mountain milk and then his very face became full of speech before he had spoken a word there's a motor coming along the road from the far hills said humphrey quietly it'll be across the last bridge downstream in ten minutes and come up on this side well said the captain impatiently i suppose you've seen a motor before not in this valley all this morning answered pump mr chairman said mr hugby feeling a dim disposition to say mr vice in memory of old commercial banquets i'm sure we're all law-abiding people here and wish to remain friends especially with our good friend the doctor may he never want a friend or a bottle that is in short anything he wants as we go up the hill of prosperity and so on but as our friend here with the signboard seems to be within his rights well i think the time's come when we can look at these things more broadly so to speak now i know it's quite true those dirty little pubs do a lot of harm to a property and you get a lot of ignorant people there who are just like pigs and i don't say our friend the doctor hasn't done good by clearing em away but a big well-managed business with plenty of capital behind it is quite another thing well friends you all know that i was originally in the trade though i have of course left off selling under the new regulations here the goats looked rather guiltily at their cloven hoofs but i've got my little bit and i wouldn't mind putting it into this old ship here if our friend would allow it to be run on business lines and especially if he'd enlarged the premises a bit ha ha and if our good friend the doctor you rascal fellow spluttered meadows your good friend the doctor will make you dance before a magistrate now don't be unbusinesslike reasoned the brewer it won't hurt your sales it's quite a different public don't you see do talk like a business man i am not a business man said the scientist with fiery eyes i am a servant of humanity then said dalroy why do you never do what your master tells you the motor has crossed the river said humphrey pump you would undo all my works cried the doctor with sincere passion when i have built this town myself when i have made it sober and healthful myself when i am awake and about before anyone in the town myself watching over its interests you would ruin all to sell your barbaric and fundamentally beastly beer and then you call me a goot friend i am not a goot friend that i can't say growled hugby but if it comes to that aren't you trying to sell a motor-car drove up with a white explosion of dust and about six very dusty people got out of it even through the densest disguise of the swift motorist pump perceived in many of them the peculiar style and bodily carriage of the police 
the most evident exception was a long and more slender figure which on removing its cap and goggles disclosed the dark and drooping features of j levison secretary he walked across to the little old millionaire who instantly recognized him and shook hands they confabulated for some little time turning over some official documents dr meadows cleared his throat and said to the whole crowd i am very glad to be able to announce to you all that this extraordinary outrage has been too late attempted lord ivywood with the promptitude he so invariably shows has immediately communicated to places of importance such as this a most just and right alteration of the law which exactly meets the present case we shall sleep in jail to-night said humphrey pump i know it in my bones it is enough to say proceeded the millionaire that by the law as it now stands any innkeeper even if he display a sign is subject to imprisonment if he sells alcohol on premises where it has not been previously kept for three days i thought it would be something like that muttered pump shall we give up captain or shall we try a bolt for it even the impudence of delroy appeared for the instant dazed and stilled he was staring forlornly up into the abyss of sky above him, as if, like Shelley, he could get inspiration from the last and purest clouds and the perfect hues of the ends of heaven. At last he said in a soft and meditative voice the single syllable, Cells. Pump looked at him sharply with a remarkable expression growing on his grim face but the doctor was far too rabidly rejoicing in his triumph to understand the captain's meaning cells alcohol are the exact words he insisted brandishing the blue oblong of the new act of parliament so far as i'm concerned they are inexact words said captain dalroy with polite indifference i have not been selling alcohol i have been giving it away has anybody here paid me money has anybody here seen anybody else pay me money I'm a philanthropist, just like Dr. Meadows. I'm his living image. Mr. Levison and Dr. Meadows looked across at each other, and on the face of the first was consternation, and on the second a full return of all his terrors of the complicated law. I shall remain here for several weeks, continued the captain, leaning elegantly on the can, and shall give away gratis such supplies of this excellent drink as may be demanded by the citizens it appears that there is no such supply at present in this district and i feel sure that no person present can object to so strictly legal and highly charitable an arrangement in this he was apparently in error for several persons present seemed to object to it but curiously enough, it was not the withered and fanatical face of the philanthropist Meadows, nor the dark and equine face of the official Levison, which stood out most vividly as a picture of protest. The face most strangely unsympathetic with this form of charity was that of the ex-proprietor of Hugby's Ales. His gooseberry eyes were almost dropping from his head, and his words sprang from his lips before he could stop them. "'And you blooming well think you can come here like a big buffoon, you beast, and take away all my trade?' Old Meadows turned on him with the swiftness of an adder. "'And what is your trade, Mr. Hugby?' he asked. The brewer bubbled with a sort of bursting anger. The goats all looked at the ground, as is, according to a Roman poet, the habit of the lower animals. Man, in the character of Mr. Patrick Delroy, taking advantage of a free but fine translation of the Latin passage, looked aloft, and with uplifted eyes beheld his own hereditary skies well all i can say is roared mr hugby if the police come all this way and can't lock up a dirty loafer whose coat's all in rags there's an end of me paying these fat infernal taxes and yes said dalroy in a voice that fell like an axe there is an end of you please god 
it's brewers like you that have made the inn stink with poison till even good men asked for no inns at all and you are worse than a teetotalers for you prevented what they never knew and as for you eminent man of science great philanthropist idealist and destroyer of inns let me give one cold fact for your information you are not respected you are obeyed and why should i or any one respect you particularly you say you built this town and get up at daybreak to watch this town you built it for money and you watch it for more money why should i respect you because you are fastidious about food that your poor old digestion may outlive the hearts of better men why should you be the god of this valley whose god is your belly merely because you do not even love your god but only fear him go home to your prayers old man for all men shall die read the bible if you like as they do in your german home and i suppose you once read it to pick texts as you now read it to pick holes i don't read it myself i'm afraid but i remember some words in old mulligan's translation and i leave them with you unless god and he made a movement with his arm so natural and yet so vast that for an instant the town really looked like a toy of bright-coloured cardboard at the feet of the giant unless god build the city their labour is but lost that build it unless god keep the city the watchman watcheth in vain it is lost labour that you rise up early in the morning and eat the bread of carefulness while he giveth his beloved sleep try and understand what that means and never mind whether it's elohistic and now hump we'll away and away i'm tired of the green tiles over there come fill my cup and he banged down the cask in the car come saddle my horses and call out my men and tremble gay goats in the midst of your glee for you've not seen the last of my milk can and me this song was joyously borne away with mr dalroy in the disappearing car and the motorists were miles beyond pursuit from peaceways before they thought of halting again but they were still beside the bank of that noble and enlarging river and in a place of deep fern and fairy ribbon birches with a glowing and gleaming water behind them patrick asked his friend to stop the car by the way said humphrey suddenly there was one thing i didn't understand why was he so afraid of the public analyst what poison and chemicals does he put in the milk h two o answered the captain i take it without milk myself and he bent over as if to drink of the stream as he had done at daybreak End of chapter 19 Recording by Nicola K. Chapter 20 of The Flying Inn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Mike Bloomfield Chapter 20 The Turk and the Futurists Mr. Adrian Crook was a successful chemist whose shop was in the neighborhood of Victoria, but his face expressed more than is generally required in a successful chemist. It was a curious face, prematurely old and like parchment, but acute and decisive, with real headwork in every line of it. Nor was his conversation, when he did converse, out of keeping with this, he had lived in many countries, and had a rich store of anecdote about the more quaint and sometimes the more sinister side of his work, visions of the vapor of eastern drugs, or guesses at the ingredients of Renaissance poisons. He himself, it need hardly be said, was a most respectable and reliable apothecary, or he would not have had the custom of families, especially among the upper classes. But he enjoyed as a hobby the study of the dark days and lands where his science had lain sometimes on the borders of magic and sometimes upon the borders of murder 
hence it often happened that persons who in their serious senses were well aware of his harmless and useful habits would leave his shop on some murky and foggy night with their heads so full of wild tales of the eating of hemp or the poisoning of roses they could hardly help fancying that the shop with its glowing moon of crimson or saffron like bowls of blood and sulphur was really a house of the black art it was doubtless for such conversational pleasures in part that hibbs however entered the shop as well as for a small glass of the same restorative medicine which he had been taking when levison found him by the open window but this did not prevent hibbs from expressing considerable surprise and some embarrassment when levison entered the same chemists and asked for the same chemical indeed levison looked harassed and weary enough to want it you've been out of town haven't you said levison no luck they got away again on some quibble the police wouldn't make the arrest and even old meadows thought it might be illegal i'm sick of it where are you going i thought said mr hibbs of dropping in at this post futurist exhibition i believe lord ivywood will be there he is showing it to the prophet i don't pretend to know much about art but i hear it's very fine there was a long silence and mr levison said people always prejudiced against new ideas then there was another long silence and mr hibbs said after all they said the same of whistler refreshed by this ritual mr levison became conscious of the existence of crook and said to him cheerfully that's so in your department too isn't it i suppose the greatest pioneers in chemistry were unpopular in their own time look at the borges said mr crook they got themselves quite disliked you're very flippant you know said levison in a fatigued way well so long are you coming hibbs and the two gentlemen who were both attired in high hats and afternoon collars coats betook themselves down the street it was a fine sunny day the twin of the day before that had shone so brightly on the white town of peaceways and their walk was a pleasant one along a handsome street with high houses and small trees that overlooked the river all the way for the pictures were exhibited in a small but famous gallery a rather rococo building of which the entrance steps almost descended upon the thames the building was girt on both sides and behind with gaudy flower beds and on the top of the steps in front of the byzantine doorway stood their old friend misysra ammon smiling broadly and in an unusually sumptuous costume but even the sight of that fragrant eastern flower did not seem to revive altogether the spirits of the drooping secretary you have come said the beaming prophet to see the decoration it is approved i have approved it we came to see the post futures pictures began hibbs but levison was silent there are no pictures said the turk simply if there had been i could not have approved for those of our religion pictures are not good they are idols my friends look in there and he turned and darted a solemn forefinger just under his nose toward the gates of the gallery look in there and you will find no idols no idols at all i have most carefully looked into every one of the frames every one i have approved no trace of the man form no trace of the animal form all decoration as good as the goodest of carpets it harms not lord ivywood smile of happiness for i tell him islam indeed progresses the old muslims allowed to draw the picture of the vegetable here i hunt even for the vegetable and there is no vegetable hibbs whose trade was tact naturally did not think it wise that the eminent misizer should go on lecturing from a tall flight of steps to the whole street and river so he had slipped past with a general proposal to go in and see the prophet and the secretary followed and all entered the outer hall where lord ivywood stood with the white face of a statue he was the only statue the new muslims were allowed to worship on a sofa like a purple island in the middle of the sea of floor sat enid wimpole talking eagerly to her cousin dorian doing in fact her best to prevent the family quarrel which threatened to follow hard on the incident at westminster in the deeper perspective of the rooms lady joan brett was floating about and if her attitude before the post-futurist pictures could not be called humble or even inquiring 
it is but just to that school to say that she seemed to be quite as bored with the floor that she walked on and the parasol she held bit by bit other figures or groups of that world drifted through the exhibition of the post futurists it is a very small world but it is just big enough and just small enough to govern a country that is a country with no religion and it has all the vanity of a mob and all the reticence of a secret society levison instantly went up to lord ivywood pulled papers from his pocket and was plainly telling him of the escape from peaceways ivywood's face hardly changed he was or felt above some things and one of them was blaming a servant before the servant's social superiors but no one could say he looked less like cold marble than before i made all possible inquiries about their subsequent route the secretary was heard saying and the most serious feature is that they seem to have taken the road for london quite so replied the statue they will be easier to capture here lady enid by a series of assurances most of which were i regret to say lies had succeeded in preventing the scandal of her cousin dorian actually cutting her cousin philip but she knew very little of the masculine temper if she really thought she had prevented the profound intellectual revolt of the poet against the politician ever since he heard mr hips say yars yars and order his arrest by a common policeman the feelings of dorian wimpole had flowed for some four days and nights in a direction highly contrary to the ideals of mr hibbs and the sudden appearance of that blameless diplomatist quickened the mental current to a cataract but as he could not insult hibbs whom socially he did not even know and could not insult ivywood with whom he had just had a formal reconciliation it was absolutely necessary that he should insult something else instead all watchers for the dawn will be deeply distressed to know that the post futurist school of painting received the full effects of this perverted wrath in vain did mr levison affirm from time to time people always prejudiced against new ideas vainly did mr hibbs say at the proper intervals after all they said the same of whistler not by such decent formalities was the frenzy of dorian to be appeased that little turk has more sense than you have he said he passes it as a good wallpaper i should say it was a bad wallpaper the sort of wallpaper that gives a sick man fever when he hasn't got it but to call it pictures you might as well call it seats for the lord mayor's show a seat isn't a seat if you can't see the lord mayor's show a picture isn't a picture if you can't see any picture you can sit down at home more comfortably than you can at a procession and you can walk about at home more comfortably than you can at a picture gallery there's only one thing to be said for a street show or a picture show and that is whether there is anything to be shown now then show me something well said lord ivywood good-humouredly motioning toward the wall in front of him let me show you the portrait of an old lady well said dorian stolidly which is it mr hibbs made a hasty gesture of identification but was so unfortunate as to point to the picture of rain in the apennines instead of the portrait of an old lady and his intervention increased the irritation of dorian wimpole most probably as mr hibbs afterward explained it was because a vivacious movement of the elbow of mr wimpole interfered with the exact pointing of the forefinger of mr hibbs in any case mr hibbs was sharply and horridly fixed by embarrassment so that he had to go away to the refreshment bar and eat three lobster patties and even drink a glass of that champagne that had once been his ruin but on this occasion he stopped at one glass and returned with a full diplomatic responsibility he returned to find that dorian wimpole had forgotten all the facts of time place and personal pride in an argument with lord ivywood exactly as he had forgotten such facts in an argument with patrick dalroy in a dark wood with a donkey cart and philip ivywood was interested also his cold eyes even shone for though his pleasure was almost purely intellectual it was utterly sincere and i do trust the untried 
I do follow the inexperienced, he was saying quietly, with his fine inflections of voice. You say this is changing the very nature of art. I want to change the very nature of art. Everything lives by turning into something else. Exaggeration is growth. But exaggeration of what? demanded Dorian. I cannot see a trace of exaggeration in these pictures, because I cannot find a hint of what it is they want to exaggerate. You can't exaggerate the feathers of a cow or the legs of a whale. You can draw a cow with feathers or a whale with legs for a joke, though I hardly think such jokes are in your line. But don't you see, my good Philip, that even then the joke depends on its looking like a cow and not only like a thing with feathers? Even then the joke depends on the whale as well as the legs. You can combine up to a certain point. You can distort up to a certain point. After that you lose the identity, and with that you lose everything. A centaur is so much of a man with so much of a horse. The centaur must not be hastily identified with the horsey man, and the mermaid must be maidenly, even if there is something fishy about her social conduct. No, said Lord Ivywood, in the same quiet way. I understand what you mean, and I don't agree. I should like the centaur to turn into something else that is neither man nor horse. But not something that has nothing of either, asked the poet. Yes, answered Ivywood, with the same queer, quiet gleam in his colorless eyes, something that has nothing of either. But what's the good, argued Dorian? A thing that has changed entirely has not changed at all. It has no bridge of crisis. It can remember no change. If you wake up tomorrow and you simply are Mrs. Dope, an old woman who lets lodgings at Broadstairs, well, I don't doubt Mrs. Dope is a saner and happier person than you are. But in what way have you progressed? What part of you is better? Don't you see this prime fact of identity is the limit set on all living things? No, said Philip, with suppressed but sudden violence. I deny that any limit is set upon living things. Why, then I understand, said Dorian. Why, though you make such good speeches, you have never written any poetry. Lady Joan, who was looking with tedium at a rich pattern of purple and green in which Mazizra attempted to interest her, imploring her to disregard the mere title which idolatrously stated it as First Communion in the Snow, abruptly turned her full face to Dorian. It was a face to which few men could feel indifferent, especially when thus suddenly shown them. Why can't he write poetry? she asked. Do you mean he would resent the limits of meter and rhyme and so on? The poet reflected for a moment, and then said, Well, partly, but I mean more than that, too. As one can be candid in the family, I may say that what everyone says about him is that he has no humor. But that's not my complaint at all. I think my complaint is that he has no pathos. That is, he does not feel human limitations. That is, he will not write poetry. Lord Ivywood was looking with his cold, unconscious profile into a little black and yellow picture called Enthusiasm. But Joan Brett leaned across to him with swarthy eagerness and cried quite provocatively, Dorian says you've no pathos. Have you any pathos? He says it's a sense of human limitations. Ivywood did not remove his gaze from the picture of enthusiasm, but simply said, No, I have no sense of human limitations. Then he put up his elderly eyeglass to examine the picture better. Then he dropped it again and confronted Joan with a face paler than usual. Joan, he said, I would walk where no man has walked and find something beyond tears and laughter. My road shall be my road indeed, for I will make it like the Romans. And my adventures shall not be in the hedges and the gutters, but in the borders of the ever-advancing brain. I will think what was unthinkable until I thought it. I will love what never lived until I loved it. I will be as lonely as the first man. They say, she said after a silence, that the first man fell. You mean the priests? he answered. Yes, but even they admit that he discovered good and evil. 
so are these artists trying to discover some distinction that is still dark to us oh said joan looking at him with a real and unusual interest then you don't see anything in the pictures yourself i see the breaking of barriers he answered beyond that i see nothing she looked at the floor for a little time and traced patterns with a parasol like one who has really received food for thought then she said suddenly but perhaps the breaking of barriers might be the breaking of everything the clear and colourless eyes looked at her quite steadily perhaps said lord ivywood dorian wimpole made a sudden movement a few yards off where he was looking at a picture and said hello what's this mr hibbs was literally gaping in the direction of the entrance framed in that fine byzantine archway stood a great big bony man in threadbare but careful clothes with a harsh high-featured intelligent face to which a dark beard under the chin gave something of the puritanic cast somehow his whole personality seemed to be pulled together and explained when he spoke with a north country accent we lads he said genially to whose be main great on to pictures but i coom for something in a moog ha ha levison and hibbs looked at each other then levison rushed from the room lord ivywood did not move a finger but mr wimpole with a sort of poetic curiosity drew nearer to the stranger and studied him it's perfectly awful cried enid wimpole in a loud whisper the man must be drunk na lass said the man with gallantry i've not been drunk nobody to hairly fur these years and all i'm a decent lad and workin my way back to wharfdale no harm in a moog of ale lass are you quite sure asked dorian wimpole with a singular sort of delicate curiosity are you quite sure you're not drunk i'm not drunk said the man jovially even if these were licensed premises began dorian in the same diplomatic manner there's to sign on to hoose said the stranger the black bewildered look on the face of joan brett suddenly altered she took four steps toward the doorway and then went back and sat on the purple ottoman but dorian seemed fascinated with his inquiry into the alleged decency of the lad who was working his way to wharfdale even if these were licensed premises he repeated drink could be refused you if you were drunk now are you really sure you're not drunk would you know if it was raining say ay said the man with conviction would you know any common object of your countryside inquired dorian scientifically a woman let us say an old woman ay said the man with good humour what on earth are you doing with the creature whispered enid feverishly i am trying answered the poet to prevent a very sensible man from smashing a very silly shop i beg your pardon sir as i was saying would you know these things in a picture now do you know what a landscape is and what a portrait is forgive my asking you see we are responsible while we keep the place going there soared up into the sky like a cloud of rooks the eager vanity of the north we call your lads are none so badly educated lad he said in the town i was born in there was a gallery of pictures as fine as lunnon ay and i knew em too thank you said wimpole pointing suddenly at the wall would you be so kind for instance as to look at those two pictures one represents an old woman and the other rain in the hills it's a mere formality you shall have your drink when you've said which is which the northerner bowed his huge body before the two frames and peered into them patiently the long stillness that followed seemed to be something of a strain on joan who rose in a restless manner first went to look out of a window and then went out of the front door at length the art critic lifted a large puzzled but still philosophical face somehow or other he said i moon be drunk after all you have testified cried dorian with animation you have all but saved civilization and by god you shall have your drink and he brought from the refreshment table a huge bumper of the hibsian champagne 
and declined payment by the rapid method of running out of the gallery on to the steps outside. Joan was already standing there. Out the little side window she had seen the incredible thing she expected to see, which explained the ludicrous scene inside. She saw the red and blue wooden flag of Mr. Pump standing up in the flower beds in the sun as serenely as if it were a tall and tropical flower, and yet in the brief interval between the window and the door it had vanished as if to remind her it was a flying dream but two men were in a little motor outside which was in the very act of starting they were in motoring disguise but she knew who they were all that was deep in her all that was sceptical all that was stoical all that was noble made her stand as still as one of the pillars of the porch but a dog bearing the name of quoodle sprang up in the moving car and barked with joy at the mere sight of her and though she had borne all else something in that bestial innocence of an animal suddenly blinded her with tears it could not however blind her to the extraordinary fact that followed mr dorian wimpole attired in anything but motoring costume dressed in that compromise between fashion and art which seems proper to the visiting of picture galleries did not by any means stand as still as one of the pillars of the porch he rushed down the steps ran after the car and actually sprang into it without disarranging his whistlerian silk hat good afternoon he said to dalroy pleasantly you owe me a motor ride you know end of chapter twenty recording by mike bloomfield Chapter Twenty One of the Flying Inn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Bloomfield. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter Twenty One The Road to Roundabout. Patrick Dalroy looked at the invader with a heavy and yet humorous expression and merely said, I didn't steal your car. Really, I didn't. Oh, no, answered Dorian. I've heard all about it since, and as you're rather the persecuted party, so to speak, it wouldn't be fair not to tell you that I don't agree much with Ivywood about all this. I disagree with him, or rather, to speak medically, he disagrees with me. He has, ever since I woke up after an oyster supper and found myself in the House of Commons with policemen calling out, who goes home indeed inquired dalroy drawing his red bushy eyebrows together do the officials in parliament say who goes home yes answered wimpole indifferently it's a part of some old custom in the days when members of parliament might be attacked in the street well inquired patrick in a rational tone why aren't they attacked in the street there was a silence it is a holy mystery said the captain at last. But who goes home? That is uncommonly good. The captain had received the poet into the car with all possible expressions of affability and satisfaction. But the poet, who was keen-sighted enough about people of his own sort, could not help thinking that the captain was a little absent-minded. As they flew thundering through the mazes of South London, for Pump had crossed Westminster Bridge and was making for the Surrey Hills, the big blue eyes of the big red-haired man rolled perpetually up and down the streets, and after longer and longer silences he found expression for his thoughts. "'Doesn't it strike you that there are a very large number of chemists in London nowadays?' "'Are there?' asked Wimpole, carelessly. "'Well, there certainly are two very close to each other just over there.' "'Yes, and both the same name,' replied Dalroy. "'Crook.' and I saw the same Mr. Crook chemicalizing round the corner. He seems to be a highly omnipresent deity. A large business, I suppose, observed Dorian Wimpole. Too large for its profits, I should say, said Dalroy. What can people want with two chemists of the same sort within a few yards of each other? Do they put one leg into one shop and one into the other and have their corns done in both at once? Or do they take an acid in one shop and an alkali in the next and wait for the fizz? Or do they take poison in the first shop and the emetic in the second shop 
it seems like carrying delicacy too far it almost amounts to living a double life but perhaps said dorian he is an uproariously popular chemist this mr crook perhaps there's a rush on some specialty of his it seems to me said the captain that there are certain limitations to such popularity in the case of a chemist if a man sells very good tobacco people may smoke more and more of it from sheer self-indulgence but i never heard of anybody exceeding in cod liver oil even castor oil i should say is regarded with respect rather than true affection after a few minutes of silence he said is it safe to stop here for an instant pump i think so replied humphrey if you'll promise me not to have any adventures in the shop the motor-car stopped before yet a fourth arsenal of mr crook and his pharmacy and dalroy went in before pump and his companion could exchange a word the captain came out again with a curious expression on his countenance especially round the mouth mr wimpole said dalroy will you give us the pleasure of dining with us this evening many would consider it an unceremonious invitation to an unconventional meal and it may be necessary to eat it under a hedge or even up a tree but you are a man of taste and one does not apologize for hump's rum or hump's cheese to persons of taste we will eat and drink of our best tonight. it is a banquet i am not very certain whether you and i are friends or enemies but at least there shall be peace tonight friends i hope said the poet smiling but why peace especially tonight because there will be war tomorrow answered patrick dalroy whichever side of it you may be on i have just made a singular discovery and he relapsed into his silence as they flew out of the fringe of london into the woods and hills beyond croydon dalroy remained in the same mood of brooding dorian was brushed by the butterfly wing of that fleeting slumber that will come on a man hurried through the air after long lounging in hot drawing-rooms even the dog quoodle was asleep at the bottom of the car as for humphrey pump he very seldom talked when he had anything else to do thus it happened that long landscapes and perspectives were shot past them like suddenly shifted slides and long stretches of time elapsed before any of them spoke again the sky was changing from the pale golds and greens of evening to the burning blue of a strong summer night a night of strong stars the walls of woodland that flew past them like long assegais were mostly at first of the fenced and park-like sort endless oblong blocks of black pine wood shut in by boxes of thin gray wood but soon fences began to sink and pine woods to straggle and roads to split and even to sprawl half an hour later dalroy had begun to realize something romantic and even faintly reminiscent in the roll of the country and humphrey pump had long known he was on the marches of his native land so far as the difference could be defined by a detail it seemed to consist not so much in the road rising as in the road perpetually winding it was more like a path and even where it was abrupt or aimless it seemed the more alive they appeared to be ascending a big dim hill that was built of a crowd of little hills with rounded tops it was like a cluster of domes among these domes the road climbed and curled in multitudinous curves and angles it was almost impossible to believe that it could turn itself and round on itself so often without tying itself in a knot and choking i say said dalroy breaking the silence suddenly this car will get giddy and fall down perhaps said dorian beaming at him my car as you may have noticed was much steadier patrick laughed but not without a shade of confusion i hope you got your car back all right he said this is really nothing for speed but it's an uncommonly good little climber and it seems to have some climbing to do just now and even more wandering the roads certainly seem to be very irregular said dorian reflectively well cried patrick with a queer kind of impatience you're english and i'm not you ought to know why the road winds about like this why the saints deliver us he cried it's one of the wrongs of ireland that she can't understand england england won't understand herself england won't tell us why these roads go wriggling about englishmen won't tell us you won't tell us don't be too sure said dorian with a quiet irony dalroy with an irony far from quiet 
emitted a loud yell of victory. Right, he shouted. More songs of the car club. We're all poets here, I hope. Each shall write something about why the road jerks about so much. So much as this, for example, he added, as the whole vehicle nearly rolled over in a ditch. For, indeed, Pump appeared to be attacking such inclines as are more suitable for a goat than a small motor car. This may have been exaggerated in the emotions of his companions, who had both, for different reasons, seen much of mere flat country lately. The sensation was like a combination of trying to get into the middle of the maze at Hampton Court and climbing the spiral staircase to the belfry at Bruges. "'This is the right way to roundabout,' said Dalroy cheerfully. "'Charming place, salubrious spot, you can't miss it. First to the left and right and straight on round the corner and back again. That'll do for my poem. Get on, you slackers. Why aren't you writing your poems?' "'I'll try one if you like,' said Dorian, treating his flattered egotism lightly. "'But it's too dark to write, and getting darker.' Indeed they had come under a shadow between them and the stars, like the brim of a giant's hat, only through the holes and rents in which the summer stars could now look down on them. The hill, like a cluster of domes, though smooth and even bare in its lower contours, was topped with a tangle of spanning trees that sat above them like a bird brooding over its nest. The wood was larger and vaguer than the clump that is the crown of the hill at Chactonbury, but was rather like it, and held much the same high and romantic position. The next moment they were in the wood itself, and winding in and out among the trees by a ribbon of paths. The emerald twilight between the stems, combined with the dragon-like contortions of the great gray roots of the beeches, had a suggestion of monsters in the deep sea, especially as a long litter of crimson and copper-colored fungi which might well have been the more gorgeous types of anemone or jellyfish, reddened the ground like a sunset dropped from the sky. And yet, contradictorily enough, they had also a strong sense of being high up, and even near to heaven, and the brilliant summer stars that stared through the chinks of the leafy roof might almost have been white starry blossoms on the trees of the wood. But though they had entered the wood as if it were a house, their strongest sensation still was the rotatory. It seemed as if that high green house went round and round like a revolving lighthouse or the whiz-gig temple in the old pantomimes. The stars seemed to circle over their heads, and Dorian felt almost certain he had seen the same beech tree twice. At length they came to a central place where the hill rose in a sort of cone in the thick of its trees, lifting its trees with it. Here Pump stopped the car, and clambering up the slope came to the crawling colossal roots of a very large but very low beech tree. It spread out to the four quarters of heaven more in the manner of an octopus than a tree, and within its low crown of branches there was a kind of hollow like a cup into which Mr. Humphrey Pump of the old ship, Pebblewick, suddenly and entirely disappeared. When he appeared, it was with a kind of rope ladder, which he politely hung over the side for his companions to ascend by. But the captain preferred to swing himself onto one of the octopine branches with a whirl of large wild legs worthy of a chimpanzee. When they were established there, each propped in the hollow against a branch, almost as comfortably as in an armchair, Humphrey himself descended once more, and began to take out their simple stores. The dog was still asleep in the car. "'An old haunt of yours, Hump, I suppose,' said the captain. "'You seem quite at home.' "'I am at home,' answered Pump, with gravity, at the sign of the old ship, and he stuck the old blue and red signboard erect among the toadstools, as if inviting the passer-by to climb the trees for a drink.' The tree just topped the mound or clump of trees, and from it they could see the whole champagne of the country they had passed, with the silver roads roaming about in it like rivers. They were so exalted they could almost fancy the stars would burn them. "'Those roads remind me of the songs you've all promised,' said Dalroy at last. "'Let's have some supper, Hump, and then recite.' Humphrey had hung one of the motor lanterns onto a branch above him, and proceeded by the light of it to tap the keg of rum and hand round the cheese. "'What an extraordinary thing!' exclaimed Dorian Wimpole, suddenly. "'Why, I'm quite comfortable. Such a thing has never happened before, I should imagine, 
and how holy this cheese tastes it has gone on a pilgrimage answered dalroy or rather a crusade it's a heroic a fighting cheese cheese of all cheeses cheeses of all the world as my compatriot mr yates says to the something or other of battle it's almost impossible that this cheese can have come out of such a coward as a cow i suppose he added wistfully i suppose it wouldn't do to explain that in this case hump had milked the bull that would be classed by scientists among irish legends those that have the celtic glamour and all that no i think this cheese must have come from that dun cow of dunsmore heath who had horns bigger than elephant's tusks and who was so ferocious that one of the greatest of the old heroes of chivalry was required to do battle with it the rum's good too i've earned this glass of rum earned it by christian humility for nearly a month i've lowered myself to the beasts of the field and gone about on all fours like a teetotaler hump circulate the bottle i mean the cask and let us have some of this poetry you're so keen about each poem must have the same title you know it's a rattling good title it's called an inquiry into the causes geological historical agricultural psychological psychical moral spiritual and theological of the alleged cases of double treble quadruple and other curvature in the english road conducted by a specially appointed secret commission in a hole in a tree by admittedly judicious and academic authorities specially appointed by themselves to report to the dog quoodle having power to add to their number and also to take away the number they first thought of god save the king having delivered this formula with blinding rapidity he added rather breathlessly that's the note to strike the lyric note for all his rather formless hilarity dalroy still impressed the poet as being more distrait than the others as if his mind were laboring with some bigger thing in the background he was in a sort of creative trance and humphrey pump who knew him like his own soul knew well that it was not mere literary creation Rather, it was a kind of creation which many modern moralists would call destruction. For Patrick Dalroy was, not a little to his misfortune, what is called a man of action, as Captain Dawson realized when he found his entire person a bright pea-green. Fond as he was of jokes and rhymes, nothing he could write or even sing ever satisfied him like something he could do. Thus it happened that his contribution to the metrical inquiry into the crooked roads was avowedly hasty and flippant while dorian who was of the opposite temper the temper that receives impressions instead of pushing out to make them found his artist's love of beauty fulfilled as it had never been before in that noble nest and was far more serious and human than usual patrick's verses ran some say that the guy of warwick the man that killed the cow and brake the mighty boar alive beyond the bridge and slough went up against a loathly worm that wasted all the downs and so the roads they twist and squirm if i may be allowed the term from the writhing of the stricken worm that died in seven towns i see no scientific proof that this idea is sound and i should say they wound about to find the town of roundabout the merry town of roundabout that makes the world go round some say that robin goodfellow whose lantern lights the meads to steal a phrase sir walter scott in heaven no longer needs such dance around the trysting place the moonstruck lover leads which superstition i should scout there is more faith in honest doubt as tennyson has pointed out than in those nasty creeds but peace and righteousness st john in roundabout can kiss and since that's all that's found about the pleasant town of roundabout the roads they simply bound about to find out where it is some say that when sir lancelot went forth to find the grail gray merlin wrinkled up the roads for hope that he should fail all roads led back to lyonnes and camelot in the vale i cannot yield assent to this extravagant hypothesis the plain shrewd britain will dismiss such rumours daily mail but in the streets of roundabout are no such factions found or theories to expound about or roll upon the ground about in the happy town of roundabout that makes the world go round patrick dalroy relieved his feelings by finishing with a shout draining a stiff glass of his sailor's wine 
turning restlessly on his elbow and looking across the landscape toward London. Dorian Wimpole had been drinking golden rum and strong starlight and the fragrance of forests, and, though his verses too were burlesque, he read them more emotionally than was his wont. Before the Roman came to Rye, or out to Severn strode, the rolling English drunkard made the rolling English road, a reeling road, a rolling road that rambles round the shire, and after him the parson ran, the sexton, and the squire. A merry road, a mazy road, and such as we did tread, that night we went to Birmingham by way of Beachy Head. I knew no harm of Bonaparte, and plenty of the squire and for to fight the frenchmen i did not much desire but i did bash their bagonets because they came arrayed to straighten out the crooked road an english drunkard made where you and i went down the lane with ale mugs in our hands the night we went to glastonbury by way of goodwin sands his sins they were forgiven him or why do flowers run behind him and the hedges all strengthening in the sun the wild thing went from left to right and knew not which was which but the wild rose was above him when they found him in the ditch god pardon us nor harden us we did not see so clear the night we went to bannockburn by way of brighton pier my friends we will not go again or ape an ancient rage or stretch the folly of our youth to be the shame of age but walk with clearer eyes and ears this path that wandereth and see undrugged in evening light the decent inn of death for there is good news yet to hear and fine things to be seen before we go to paradise by way of kensal green have you written one hump asked dalroy humphrey who had been scribbling hard under the lamp looked up with a dismal face yes he said but i write under a great disadvantage you see i know why the road curves about and he read very rapidly all on one note the road turned first toward the left where pinker's quarry made the cleft the path turned next toward the right because the mastiff used to bite then left because of slippery height and then again toward the right we could not take the left because it would have been against the laws squire closed it in king william's day because it was a right of way still right to dodge the ridge of chalk where parson's ghost it used to walk till someone parson used to know met him blind drunk in callow then left a long way round to skirt the good land where old doggy bert was owner of the crown and cup and would not give his freehold up right missing the old river bed they tried to make him take instead right since they say sir gregory went mad and let the gypsies be and so they have their camp secure and though not honest they are poor and that is something then along on first to write no i am wrong second to write of course the first is what the holy sisters cursed and none defy their awful oaths since the policeman lost his clothes because of fairies write again what used to be high toby lane left by the double larch and right until the milestone is in sight because the road is firm and good from past the milestone to the wood and i was told by dr low whom mr wimpole's aunt would know who lives at oxford writing books and ain't so silly as he looks the romans did that little bit and we've done all the rest of it by which we hardly seem to score left and then forward as before to where they nearly hanged miss brown who told them not to cut her down but loose the rope or let her swing because it was a waste of string left once again by hunker's cleft and right beyond the elm and left by pills right by nineteen nicks and left no 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 hump 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 cried dalroy in a sort of terror don't be exhaustive don't be a scientist hump and lay waste fairyland how long does it go on is there a lot more of it yes said pump in a stony manner there is a lot more of it and it's all true inquired dorian wimpole with interest yes replied pump with a smile it's all true my complaint exactly said the captain what you want is legends 
What you want is lies, especially at this time of night, and on rum like this, and on our first and our last holiday. What do you think about rum? he asked Wimpole. About this particular rum, in this particular tree, at this particular moment, answered Wimpole, I think it is the nectar of the younger gods. If you ask me in a general synthetic sense what I think of rum, well, I think it's rather rum. You find it a trifle sweet, I suppose, said Dalroy with some bitterness. Sybarite. By the way, he said abruptly, what a silly word that word hedonist is. The really self-indulgent people generally like sour things and not sweet. Bitter things like caviar and curries or what not. It's the saints who like the sweets. At least I've known at least five women who were practically saints, and they all preferred sweet champagne. Look here, Wimpole. Shall I tell you the ancient oral legend about the origin of rum? I told you what you wanted was legends. Be careful to preserve this one, and hand it on to your children, for, unfortunately, my parents carelessly neglected the duty of handing it on to me. After the words, a farmer had three sons, all that I owe to tradition ceases. But when the three boys last met in the village marketplace, they were all sucking sugar sticks. Nevertheless, they were all discontented, and on that day parted forever. One remained on his father's farm, hungering for his inheritance. One went up to London to seek his fortune, as fortunes are found today in that town forgotten of God. The third ran away to sea, and the first two flung away their sugar sticks in shame and he on the farm was always drinking smaller and sourer beer for the love of money, and he that was in town was always drinking richer and richer wines, that men might see that he was rich. But he who ran away to sea actually ran on board with the sugar stick in his mouth, and St. Peter or St. Andrew or whoever is the patron of men in boats touched it and turned it into a fountain for the comfort of men upon the sea. That is the sailor's theory of the origin of rum. Inquiry addressed to any busy captain with a new crew in the act of shipping an unprecedented cargo will elicit a sympathetic agreement. Your rum, at least, said Dorian good-humouredly, may well produce a fairy tale, but indeed I think all this would have been a fairy tale without it. Patrick raised himself from his arboreal throne and leaned against his branch with a curious and sincere sense of being rebuked. Yours was a good poem, he said, with seeming irrelevance, and mine was a bad one. Mine was bad partly because I'm not a poet as you are, but almost as much because I was trying to make up another song at the same time, and it went to another tune, you see. He looked out over the rolling roads and said almost to himself, In the city upon slime and loam they cry in their parliament, Who goes home? And there is no answer in arch or dome, for none in the city of graves goes home. Yet these shall perish and understand, for God has pity on this great land. Men that are men again, who goes home? Toxin and trumpeter, who goes home? For there's blood on the field and blood on the foam, and blood on the body when man goes home. And a voice valedictory, who is for victory? Who is for liberty? Who goes home? softly and idly as he had said this second rhyme there were circumstances about his attitude that must have troubled or interested any one who did not know him well may i ask asked dorian laughing why it is necessary to draw your sword at this stage of the affair because we have left the place called roundabout answered patrick and we have come to a place called rightabout and he lifted his sword toward london and the gray glint upon it came from a low gray light in the east. End of chapter 21 Recording by Mike Bloomfield Chapter 22 of The Flying Inn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter 22 The Chemistry of Mr. Crook. When the celebrated Hibbs next visited the shop of Crook, that mystic and criminologist chemist, he found the premises were impressively and even amazingly enlarged 
with decorations in the Eastern style. Indeed, it would not have been too much to say that Mr. Crook's shop occupied the whole of one side of a showy street in the West End, the other side being a blank facade of public buildings. It would be no exaggeration to say that Mr. Crook was the only shopkeeper for some distance round. Mr. Crook still served in his shop, however, and politely hastened to serve his customer with the medicine that was customary. Unfortunately, for some reason or other, history was, in connection with this shop, only too prone to repeat itself. And after a vague but soothing conversation with the chemist on the subject of vitriol and its effects on human happiness, Mr. Hibbs experienced the acute annoyance of once more beholding his most intimate friend, Mr. Joseph Levison, enter the same fashionable emporium. But indeed, Levison's own annoyance was much too acute for him to notice any on the part of Hibbs. Well, he said, stopping dead in the middle of the shop, here is a fine confounded kettle of fish. It is one of the tragedies of the diplomatic that they are not allowed to admit either knowledge or ignorance. Sir Hibbs looked gloomily wise and said, pursing his lips, You mean the general situation. I mean the situation about this everlasting business of the insigns, said Levison impatiently. Lord Ivywood went up specially when his leg was really bad to get it settled in the house in a small non-contentious bill, providing that the sign shouldn't be enough if the liquor hadn't been on the spot three days. Oh, but, said Hibbs, sinking his voice to soft solemnity as being one of the initiate, a thing like that can be managed, don't you know? Of course it can, said the other, still with the same slightly irritable air. It was, but it does not seem to occur to you, any more than it did to his lordship, that there is rather a weak point, after all in this business, of passing acts quietly before they are unpopular. Has it ever occurred to you that if a law is really kept too quiet to be opposed, it may also be kept too quiet to be obeyed? It's not so easy to hush it up from a big politician without running the risk of hushing it up even from a common policeman. But surely that can't happen by the nature of things. Can't it? By God, said J. Levison, appealing to a less pantheistic authority. He unfolded a number of papers from his pocket, chiefly cheap local newspapers, but some of them letters and telegrams. Listen to this, he said. A curious incident occurred in the village of Poltwell in Surrey yesterday morning. The baker's shop of Mr. Whiteman was suddenly besieged by a knot of the loser types of the locality, who appeared to have demanded beer instead of bread, basing their claim on some ornament object erected outside the shop, which object they asserted to be a signboard within the meaning of the act. There, you see. They haven't even heard of the new act. What do you think of this from the Clapton Conservator? The contempt of socialists for the law was well illustrated yesterday when a crowd collected round some wooden ensign of socialism set up before Mr. Dukedale's drapery stores refused to disperse, though told that their action was contrary to the law. Eventually, the malcontents joined the procession following the wooden emblem. And what do you say to this? Stop press news. A chemist in Pimlico has been invaded by a huge crowd demanding beer and asserting the provision of it to be among his duties. The chemist is, of course, well acquainted with his immunities in the matter, especially under the new act. But the old notion of the importance of the sign seems still to possess the populace and even, to a certain extent, paralyze the polis. What do you say to that? Isn't it as plain as Monday morning that this flying in has flown a day in front of us, as all such lies do? 
There was a diplomatic silence. Well, asked the still angry Levison of the still dubious Hibbs, what do you make of all that? One ill acquainted with that relativity essential to all modern minds might possibly have fancied that Mr. Hibbs could not make much of it. However, that may be, his explanations or incapacity for explanations were soon tested with a fairly positive test. For Lord Ivywood actually walked into the shop of Mr. Crook. Good day, gentlemen, he said, looking at them with an expression which they both thought baffling and even a little disconcerting. Good morning, Mr. Crook. I have a celebrated visitor for you. And he introduced the smiling Miss Isra. The prophet had fallen back on a comparatively quiet costume this morning, a mere matter of purple and orange or what not. But his aged face was now perennially festive. The cause progresses, he said. Everywhere the cause progresses. You hear his lordship's beautiful speech? I have heard many, said Hibbs gracefully, that can be so described. The prophet means what I was saying about the Ballot Paper Amendment Act, said Ivy Wood casually. It seems to me the alphabet of statesmanship to recognize now that the great Oriental British Empire has become one corporate whole with the Occidental one. Look at our universities with their Mohammedan students. Soon they may be a majority. Now are we, he went on still more quietly. Are we to rule this country under the forms of representative government? I do not pretend to believe in democracy, as you know, but I think it would be extremely unsettling and incalculable to destroy representative government. If we are to give Muslim Britain representative government, we must not make the mistake we made about the Hindus and military organization, which led to the mutiny. We must not ask them to make a cross on their ballot papers. For though it seems a small thing, it may offend them. So I brought in a little bill to make it optional between the old-fashioned cross and an upward curved mark that might stand for a crescent. And as it's rather easier to make, I believe it will be generally adopted. And so, said the radiant old Turk, the little light easily made Curly mark is substituted for the hard, difficult, double-made, cutting both ways mark. It is the more good for hygiene. For you must know, and indeed our good and wise chemist will tell you, that the Saracenic and the Arabian and the Turkish physicians were the first of all physicians, and taught all medicals to the barbarians of the Frankish territories. And many of the most modern, the most fashionable remedies are thus of the oriental origin. Yes, that is quite true, said Crook in his rather cryptic and unsympathetic way. The powder called arenine, lately popularized by Mr. Bose, now Lord Helvelin, who tried it first on birds, is made of plain desert sand. And what you see in prescriptions as cannabis indiensis is what our lively neighbors of Asia described more energetically as bhang. And so, in the same way, said Miss Isra, making soothing passes with his brown hand like a mesmerist, in the same way, the making of the crescent is hygienic. The making of the cross is non-hygienic. The crescent was a little wave, as a leaf, as a little curling feather and he waved his hand with real artistic enthusiasm towards the capering curves of the new Turkish decoration, which Ivy Wood made fashionable in many of the fashionable shops. But when you make the cross, you must make the one line so, and he swept the horizon with the brown hand, and then you go back and make the other line so, and he made an upward gesture suggestive of one constrained to lift a pine tree, and then you become very ill. As a matter of fact, Mr. Crook, said Ivy Wood in his polite manner, I brought the prophet here to consult you as the best authority on the very point you have just mentioned. The use of hashish 
or the hemp plant. I have it on my conscience to decide whether these oriental stimulants or sedatives shall come under the general veto we are attempting to impose on the vulgar intoxicants. Of course, one has heard of the horrible and voluptuous visions and the kind of insanity attributed to the assassins and the old man of the mountain. But on the one hand, we must clearly discount much for the illimitable pro-Christian bias with which the history of these eastern tribes is told in this country. Would you say the effect of hashish was extremely bad? And he turned first to the prophet. You will say mosques, said that seer, with candor. Many mosques, more mosques, taller and taller mosques, till they reach the moon. And you hear a dreadful voice in the very high mosque calling the musin. And you will think it is Allah. Then you will see wives, many, many wives, more wives than you yet have. Then you will be rolled over and over in a great pink and purple sea, which is still wives. Then you will go to sleep. I have only done it once, he concluded mildly. And what do you think about hashish, Mr. Crook? asked Ivywood thoughtfully. I think it's hemp at both ends, said the chemist. I fear, said Lord Ivywood, I don't quite understand you. A hempen drink, a murder, and a hempen rope. That's my experience in India, said Mr. Crook. It is true, said Ivywood, yet more reflectively, that the thing is not Muslim in any sense in its origin. There is that against the assassins always. And of course, he added, with a simplicity that had something noble about it, their connection with St. Louis discredits them rather. After a space of silence, he said suddenly, looking at Crook, So it isn't the sort of thing you chiefly sell? No, my lord, it isn't what I chiefly sell, said the chemist. He also looked steadily, and the wrinkles of his young old face were like hieroglyphics. The cars progress, everywhere it progress, cried Miss Eistra, spreading his arms and relieving a momentary tension, of which he was totally unaware. The hygienic curve of the crescent will soon superimpose himself for your plus sign. You already use him for the short syllables in your dactyl, which is doubtless of oriental origin. You see the new game? He said this so suddenly that everyone turned round to see him produce from his purple clothing a brightly coloured, highly polished apparatus from one of the grand toy shops, which on examination seemed to consist of a kind of blue slate in a red and yellow frame, a number of divisions being already marked on the slate, about 17 slate pencils with covers of different colours and a vast number of printed instructions stating that it was but recently introduced from the remote east and was called knots and crescents. Strangely enough, Lord Ivywood, with all his enthusiasm, seemed almost annoyed at the emergence of this Asiatic discovery, more especially as he really wanted to look at Mr. Crook as hard as Mr. Crook was looking at him. Head scoffed considerately and said, of course all our things came from the east, and he paused, being suddenly unable to remember anything but curry, to which he was very rightly attached. He then remembered Christianity, and mentioned that too. Everything from the east could, of course, he ended with an air of light omniscience. Those who, in later ages, in other fashions, failed to understand how Miss Isra had ever got a mental hold on men like Lord Ivywood, left out two elements in the man which are very attractive, especially to other men. One was that there was no subject on which the little Turk could not instantly produce a theory. The other was that, though the theories were crowded, they were consistent. He was never known to accept an illogical compliment. You are an error, he said solemnly to Hibbs, because you say all things from the east are good. There is the east wind. I do not like him. He is not good. And I think very much 
that all the warmth and all the wealthiness and the colors and the poems and the religiousness that the east was meant to give you have been much poisoned by this accident this east wind when you see the green flag of the prophet you do not think of a green field in summer you think it blown by the east wind when you read of the moon-faced houris you think not of our moons like oranges but of your moons like snowballs your new voice contributed to the conversation its contribution though imperfectly understood appeared to be nor what should i write for a little jew in his dressing gown little jews in their dressing gowns as their drinks as we as our drinks bitter miss the speaker who appeared to be a powerful person of the plastering occupation looked round for the unmarried female he had ceremonially addressed and seemed honestly abashed that she was not present ivywood looked at the man with that expression of one turned to stone which his physique made so effective in him but j levison secretary could summon no such powers of self petrification upon his soul the slaughter red of that unhallowed eve arose when first the ship and he were foes when he discovered that the poor are human beings and therefore are polite and brutal within a comparatively short space of time he saw that two other men were standing behind the plastering person one of them apparently urging him to counsels of moderation which was an ominous sign and then he lifted his eyes and saw something worse than any omen all the glass frontage of the shop was a cloud of crowding faces they could not be clearly seen since night was closing in on the street and the dazzling fires of ruby and amethyst which the lighted shop gave to its great globes of liquid rather veiled than revealed them but the foremost actually flattened and whitened their noses on the glass and the most distant were nearer than mr levison wanted them also he saw a shape erect outside the shop the shape of an upright staff and a square board he could not see what was on the board he did not need to see those who saw lord ivywood at such moments understood why he stood out so strongly in the history of his time in spite of his frozen face and his fanciful dogma he had all the negative nobility that is possible to man unlike nelson and most of the great heroes he knew not fear thus he was never conquered by a surprise but was cold and collected when other men had lost their heads even if they had not lost their nerve i will not conceal from you gentlemen said lord ivywood that i have been expecting this i will not even conceal from you that i have been occupying mr crook's time until it occurred so far from excluding the crowd i suggest it would be an excellent thing if mr crook could accommodate them all in this shop i want to tell as soon as possible as large a crowd as possible that the law is altered and this folly about the flying in has ceased come in all of you come in and listen thank you said a man connected in some way with motor buses who lurched in behind the plasterer thank you sir said a bright little clock mender from croydon who immediately followed him thanks said a rather bewildered clerk from camberwell who came next in the rather bewildered procession thank you said mr dorian wimpole who entered carrying a large round cheese thank you said captain delroy who entered carrying a large cask of rum thank you very much said mr humphrey pump who entered the shop carrying the sign of the old ship i fear it must be recorded that the crowd which followed them dispensed with all expressions of gratitude but though the crowd filled the shop so there was no standing room to spare levison still lifted his gloomy eyes and beheld his gloomy omen for though there were very many more people standing in the shop there seemed to be no less people looking in at the window gentlemen said ivywood all jokes come to an end 
this one has gone so far as to be serious and it might have become impossible to correct public opinion and expound to law-abiding citizens the true state of the law had i not been able to meet so representative an assembly in so central a place it is not pertinent to my purpose to indicate what i think of the jest which captain dalroy and his friends have been playing upon you for the last few weeks but i think captain dalroy will himself concede that i am not jesting with all my heart said dalroy in a manner that was unusually serious and even sad then he added with a sigh as you truly say my jest has come to an end that wooden sign said ivywood pointing at the queer blue ship can be cut up for firewood it shall lead decent citizens a devil's dance no more understand it once and for all before you learn it from policemen or prison wardens you are under a new law that sign is a sign of nothing you can no more buy and sell alcohol by having that outside your house than if it were a lamp post do you mean to say governor said the plasterer with the dawn of intelligence on his large face which was almost awful to watch that i'm to have a glass of bitter try a glass of rum said patrick captain dalroy said lord ivywood if you give one drop from that cask to that man you are breaking the law and you shall sleep in jail are you quite sure asked dalroy with a strange sort of anxiety i might escape i'm quite sure said ivywood i have posted the police with full powers for the purpose as you will find i mean that this business shall end here tonight if i find the policeman what told me i could have a drink just now i'll knock his helmet into a fancy necktie i will said the plasterer why ain't people allowed to know the law they ain't got no right to alter the law in the dark like that said the clock mender damn the new law what is the new law asked the clerk the words inserted by the recent act said lord ivywood with the cold courtesy of the conqueror are to the effect that alcohol cannot be sold even under a lawful sign unless alcoholic liquors have been kept for three days on the premises captain dalroy that cask of yours has not i think been three days on this premises i command you to seal it up and take it away surely said patrick with an innocent air the best remedy would be to wait till it has been three days on the premises we might all get to know each other better and he looked round at the ever-increasing multitude with hazy benevolence you shall do nothing of the kind said his lordship with sudden fierceness well answered patrick wearily now i come to think of it perhaps i won't i'll have one drink here and go home to bed like a good little boy and the constables shall arrest you thundered ivywood why nothing seems to suit you said the surprised dalroy thank you however for explaining the new law so clearly unless alcoholic liquors have been three days on the premises i shall remember it now you always explain such things so clearly you only made one legal slip the constables will not arrest me and why not demanded the nobleman white with passion because cried patrick dalroy and his voice lifted itself like a lonely trumpet before the charge because i shall not have broken the law because alcoholic liquors have been three days on these premises three months more likely because this is a common grog shop philip ivywood because that man behind the counter lives by selling spirits to all the cowards and hypocrites who are rich enough to bribe a bad doctor and he pointed suddenly at the small medicine glass on the counter by hibbs and levison what is that man drinking he demanded Hibbs put out his hand hastily for his glass, but the indignant clock mender had snatched it first and drained it at a gulp. Scotch, he said, and dashed the glass to atoms on the floor. Right you are too, roared the plasterer, 
seizing a big medicine bottle in each hand. We're going to have a little of the fun now, we are. What's in that big red bowl up there? I reckon it's port. Fetch it down, Bill. Ivy Wood turned to Crook and said, scarcely moving his lips of marble, This is a lie. It is the truth, answered Crook, looking back at him with equal steadiness. Do you think you made the world that you should make it over again so easily? The world was made badly, said Philip, with a terrible note in his voice, and I will make it over again. Almost as he spoke, the glass front of the shop fell inward, shattered, and there was wreckage among the moonlight colored bowls, almost as if spheres of celestial crystal cracked at his blasphemy. Through the broken windows came the roar of the confused tongue that is more terrible than the elements, the cry that the deaf kings have heard at last, the terrible voice of mankind. All the way down the long, fashionable street, lined with the crook plate glass, that glass was crashing amid the cries of a crowd. Rivers of gold and purple wines sprawled above the pavement. Out in the open, shouted Dalroy rushing out of the shop, sign board in hand, the dog Quirrell barking furiously at his heels, while Dorian with the cheese and Humphrey with the keg followed as rapidly as they could. Good night, my lord. Perhaps our meeting next may fall at Tamworth in your castle hall. Come along, friends, and form up. Don't waste time destroying property. We're all to start now. Where are we all going to? asked the plasterer. We are all going into Parliament, answered the captain, as he went to the head of the crowd. The marching crowd turned two or three corners, and at the end of the next long street, Dorian Wimpole, who was towards the tail of the procession, saw again the grey cyclops tower of St. Stephen's, with its one great golden eye, as he had seen it against that pale green sunset that was at once quiet and volcanic on the night he was betrayed by sleep and by a friend almost as far off at the head of the procession he could see the sign with the ship and the cross going before them like an ensign and hear a great voice singing men that are men again who goes home toxin and trumpeter who goes home the voice valedictory who is for victory who is for liberty? Who goes home? End of chapter 22。Chapter 23 of The Flying Inn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eliza. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter 23. The March on Ivywood. That storm spirit, or eagle of liberty, which is the sudden soul in a crowd, had descended upon London after a foreign tour of some centuries in which it had commonly alighted upon other capitals. It is always impossible to define the instant and the turn of mood which makes the whole difference between danger being worse than endurance and endurance being worse than danger. The actual outbreak generally has a symbolic or artistic or what some would call whimsical cause. Somebody fires off a pistol or appears in an unpopular uniform or refers in a loud voice to a scandal that is never mentioned in the newspapers. Somebody takes off his hat or somebody doesn't take off his hat and a city is sacked before midnight. When the ever-swelling army of revolt smashed the whole street full of the shops of Mr. Crook, the chemist, and then went on to Parliament, the Tower of London, and the road to the sea, the sociologists hiding in their coal cellars could think, in that clarifying darkness, of many material and spiritual explanations of such a storm in human souls, but of none that explained it quite enough. Doubtless there was a great deal of sheer drunkenness when the urns and goblets of Asclepius were reclaimed as belonging to Bacchus, and many who went roaring down that road were merely stored with rich wines in liqueurs which are more comfortably and quietly digested at a city banquet or a West End restaurant. But many of these had been blind drunk twenty times without a thought of rebellion. You could not stretch the material explanation to cover a corner of the case. Much more general was a savage sense of the meanness of Crook's wealthy patrons, 
in keeping a door open for themselves which they had wantonly shut on less happy people, but no explanation can explain it, and no man can say when it will come. Dorian Wimple was at the tail of the procession, which grew more and more crowded every moment. For one space of the march he even had the misfortune to lose it altogether, owing to the startling activity which the rotund cheese, when it escaped from his hands, showed, in descending a somewhat steep road toward the river. But in recent days he had gained a pleasure in practical events which was like a second youth. He managed to find a stray taxicab, and had little difficulty in picking up again the trail of the extraordinary cortege. Inquiries addressed to a policeman with a black eye outside the House of Commons informed him sufficiently of the rebels' line of retreat or advance, or whatever it was, and in a very short time he beheld the unmistakable legion once more. It was unmistakable, because in front of it there walked a red-headed giant, apparently carrying with him a wooden portion of some public building and also because so big a crowd had never followed any man in England for a long time past. But except for such things, the unmistakable crowd might well have been mistaken for another one. Its aspect had been altered almost as much as if it had grown horns or tusks, for many of the company walked with outlandish weapons like iron teeth or horns, bills and pole-axes, and spears with strangely shaped heads. What was stranger still, whole rows and rows of them had rifles, and even marched with a certain discipline, and yet again others seemed to have snatched up household or workshop tools, meat-axes, pickaxes, hammers, and even carving-knives. Such things need be none the less deadly, because they are domestic. They have figured in millions of private murders before they appeared in any public war. Dorian was so fortunate as to meet the flame-haired captain almost face to face, and easily fell into step with him at the head of the march. Humphrey Pump walked on the other side, with the celebrated cask suspended round his neck by something resembling braces, as if it were a drum. Mr. Wimple had himself taken the opportunity of his brief estrangement to carry the cheese somewhat more easily in a very large, loose, waterproof knapsack on his shoulders. The effect in both cases was to suggest dreadful deformities in two persons who happened to be exceptionally cleanly built. The captain, who seemed to be in tearing and towering spirits, gained great pleasure from this, but Dorian had his source of amusement too. "'What have you been doing with yourself since you lost my judicious guidance?' he asked, laughing. "'And why are parts of you a dull review, and parts of you a fancy dress ball? What have you been up to?' "'We've been shopping,' said Mr. Patrick Dalroy, with some pride. "'We are country cousins. I know all about shopping. Let us see. What are the phrases about it? Look at those rifles now. We got them at quite a bargain. We went to all the best gunsmiths in London, and we didn't pay much. In fact, we didn't pay anything. That's what is called a bargain, isn't it?' Surely I've seen in those things they send to ladies something about giving them away. Then we went to a remnant sale. At least, it was a remnant sale when we left. And we bought that piece of stuff we've tied round the sign. Surely it must be what ladies called chiffon. Dorian lifted his eyes and perceived that a very coarse strip of red rag, possibly collected from a dustbin, had been tied round the wooden signpost by way of a red flag of revolution. Not what ladies call chiffon, inquired the captain with anxiety. Well, anyhow, it is what chiffoniers call it. But as I'm going to call on a lady shortly, I'll try to remember the distinction. Is your shopping over, may I ask? asked Mr. Wimpole. All but one thing, answered the other. I must find a music shop. You know what I mean. Place where they sell pianos and things of that sort. Look here, said Dorian. This cheese is pretty heavy as it is. Have I got to carry a piano, too? You misunderstand me, said the captain calmly. And as he had never thought of music shops until his eye had caught one an instant before, he darted into the doorway. Returning almost immediately with a long parcel under his arm, he resumed the conversation. "'Did you go anywhere else?' asked Dorian. "'Except to shops?' "'Anywhere else?' cried Patrick indignantly. "'Haven't you got any country cousins? Of course, we went to all the right places. We went to the Houses of Parliament. But Parliament isn't sitting, so there are no eggs of the quality suitable for elections. We went to the Tower of London.' You can't tire country cousins like us. We took away some curiosities of steel and iron. We even took away the halberds from the beef-eaters. We pointed out that for the purpose of eating beef, their only avowed public object, knives and forks had always been found more convenient. To tell the truth, they seemed rather relieved to be relieved of them. And may I ask, said the other with a smile, where you are off to now? Another beauty spot, cried the captain boisterously. No tiring the country cousin. I'm going to show my young friends from the provinces what is perhaps the finest old country house in England. We are going to Ivywood, not far from the big watering place they call Pebblewick. I see, said Dorian, and for the first time looked back, with intelligent trouble on his face, on the marching ranks behind him. Captain Dalroy, said Dorian Wimple in a slightly altered tone, there is one thing that puzzles me. 
Ivy Wood talked about having set the police to catch us, and though this is a pretty big crowd, I simply cannot believe that the police, as I knew them in my youth, could not catch us. But where are the police? You seem to have marched through half of London with much, if you'll excuse me, of the appearance of carrying murderous weapons. Lord Ivywood threatened that the police would stop us. Well, why didn't they stop us? Your subject, said Patrick cheerfully, divides itself into three heads. I hope not, said Dorian. There really are three reasons why the police should not be prominent in this business, as their worst enemy cannot say that they were. He began ticking off the three on his own huge fingers, and seemed to be quite serious about it. First, he said, you have been a long time away from town. Probably you do not know a policeman when you see him. They do not wear helmets, as our line regiments did after the Prussians had won. They wear fezes, because the Turks have won. Shortly, I have little doubt, they will wear pigtails, because the Chinese have won. It is a very interesting branch of moral science. It is called efficiency. Second, explained the captain, you have perhaps omitted to notice that a very considerable number of those wearing such fezes are walking just behind us. Oh, yes, it's quite true. Don't you remember that the whole French Revolution really began because a sort of city militia refused to fire on their own fathers and wives, and even showed some slight traces of a taste for firing on the other side? You'll see lots of them behind, and you can tell them by their revolver belts and their walking in step, but don't look back on them too much. It makes them nervous. And the third reason, asked Dorian. For the real reason, answered Patrick, I'm not fighting a hopeless fight. People who have fought in real fights don't, as a rule. But I noticed something singular about the very point you mentioned. Why are there no more police? Why are there no more soldiers? I will tell you. There really are very few policemen or soldiers left in England today. Surely that, said Wimpole, is an unusual complaint. But very clear, said the captain gravely, to anyone who has ever seen sailors or soldiers. I will tell you the truth. Our rulers have come to count on the bare bodily cowardice of a mass of Englishmen as a sheepdog counts on the cowardice of a flock of sheep. Now look here, Mr. Wimpole. Wouldn't a shepherd be wise to limit the number of his dogs if he could make his sheep pay by it? At the end you might find millions of sheep managed by a solitary dog. But that is because they are sheep. Suppose the sheep were turned by a miracle into wolves. There are very few dogs they could not tear in pieces. But, what is my practical point, there are really very few dogs to tear. You don't mean, said Dorian, that the British army is practically disbanded? There are the sentinels outside Whitehall, replied Patrick in a low voice. But indeed, your question puts me in a difficulty. No, the army is not entirely disbanded, of course. But the British army. Did you ever hear, Wimple, of the great destiny of the empire? I seem to have heard the phrase, replied his companion. It is in four acts, said Dalroy. Victory over barbarians, employment of barbarians, alliance with barbarians, conquest by barbarians. That is the great destiny of empire. I think I begin to see what you mean, returned Dorian Wimple. Of course, Ivywood and the authorities do seem very prone to rely on the Sepoy troops. And other troops as well said Patrick. I think you'll be surprised when you see them. He tramped on for a while in silence, and then said, with some air of abruptness, which yet did not seem to be entirely a changing of the subject, Do you know the man who lives now on the estate next to Ivywood? No, replied Dorian. I am told he keeps himself very much to himself. And his estate, too, said Patrick, rather gloomily. If you would climb his garden wall, Wimple, I think you would find an answer to a good many of your questions. Oh, yes, the right honorable gentlemen are making full provision for public order and national defense, in a way. He fell into an almost sullen silence, and several villages had been passed before he spoke again. They tramped through the darkness, and dawn surprised them somewhere in the wilder and more wooded parts where the roads began to rise and roam. Dalroy gave an exclamation of pleasure and pointed ahead, drawing the attention of Dorian to the distance. Against the silver and scarlet bars of the daybreak could be seen afar a dark purple dome with a crown of dark green leaves, the place they had called Roundabout. Dalroy's spirit seemed to revive at the sight, with the customary accompaniment of the threat of vocalism. "'Been making any poems lately?' he asked of Wimpole. "'Nothing particular,' replied the poet. "'Then,' said the captain, portentously clearing his throat, <clears> throat> "'you shall listen to one of mine, whether you like it or not. Nay, the more you dislike it, the longer and longer it will be. I begin to understand why soldiers want to sing when on the march, and also why they put up with such rotten songs.' The druids waved their golden knives and danced around the oak, when they had sacrificed a man. But though the learned search and scan, no single modern person can entirely see the joke. But though they cut the throats of men, they cut not down the tree, and from the blood the sapling sprang of oak woods yet to be. But Ivywood, Lord Ivywood, he rots the tree as Ivywood, he clings and crawls as Ivywood, about the sacred tree. 
King Charles, he fled from Worcester fight, and hid him in an oak. In convent schools no man of tact would trace and praise his every act, or argue that he was, in fact, a strict and sainted bloke. But not by him the sacred woods have lost their fancies free, and though he was extremely big, he did not break the tree. But Ivywood, Lord Ivywood, he breaks the tree as Ivywood, and eats the wood as Ivywood, between us and the sea. Great Collingwood walked down the glade and flung the acorns free. The oaks might still be in the grove, as oaken as the beams above, when the great lover, sailor's love, was kissed by death at sea. But though for him the oak trees fell to build the oaken ships, the woodman worshipped what he smote and honoured even the chips. But Ivywood, Lord Ivywood, he hates the tree as Ivywood, as the dragon of the Ivywood that has us in his grips. They were ascending a sloping road, walled in on both sides by solemn woods, which somehow seemed as watchful as owls awake. Though daybreak was going over them with banners, scrolls of scarlet and gold, and with a wind like trumpets of triumph, the dark woods seemed to hold their secret like dark, cool cellars. Nor was a strong sunlight seen in them, save in one or two brilliant shafts that looked like splintered emeralds. "'I should not wonder,' said Dorian, "'if the ivy does not find the tree knows a thing or two also.' "'The tree does,' assented the captain. The trouble was that until a little while ago the tree did not know that it knew. There was a silence, and as they went up the incline grew steeper and steeper, and the tall trees seemed more and more to be guarding something from sight, as with the grey shields of giants. "'Do you remember this road, Humph?' asked Dalroy of the innkeeper. "'Yes,' answered Humphrey Pump, and said no more, but few have ever heard such fullness in an affirmative. They marched on in silence, and about two hours afterward, toward eleven o'clock, Dalroy called a halt in the forest, and said that everybody had better have a few hours' sleep. The impenetrable quality in the woods, and the comparative softness of the carpet of beech mast, made the spot as appropriate as the time was inappropriate, and if any one thinks that common people, casually picked up in a street, could not follow a random leader on such a journey, or sleep at his command in such a spot, given the state of the soul, then some one knows no history. "'I'm afraid,' said Dalroy, You'll have to have supper for your breakfast. I know an excellent place for having breakfast, but it's too exposed for sleep. And sleep you must have, so we won't unpack the stores just now. We'll lie down like babes in the wood, and any bird of an industrious disposition is free to start covering them with leaves. Really, there are things coming before which you will want sleep. When they resumed the march, it was nearly the middle of the afternoon, and the meal which Dalroy insisted buoyantly on describing as breakfast was taken about that mysterious hour when ladies die without tea. The steep road had consistently grown steeper and steeper and steeper, and at last Dalroy said to Dorian Wimple, "'Don't drop that cheese again just here. It will roll right away down into the woods. I know it will. No scientific calculations of grades and angles are necessary, because I have seen it do so myself. In fact, I have run after it.' Wimple realized they were mounting to the sharp edge of a ridge, and in a few moments he knew by the oddness in the shape of the trees what it had been that the trees were hiding. They had been walking along a swelling woodland path beside the sea. On a particular high plateau, projecting above the shore, stood some dwarfed and crippled apple trees, of whose apples no man alive would have eaten, so sour and salt they must be. All the rest of the plateau was bald and featureless, but Pump looked at it, every inch of it, as if at an inhabited place. "'This is where we'll have breakfast,' he said, pointing to the naked grassy waste. "'It's the best inn in England.' Some of his audience began to laugh, but somehow suddenly ceased doing so, as Dalroy strode forward and planted the sign of the old ship on the desolate seashore. "'And now,' he said, "'you have charge of the stores we brought up, and we will picnic, as it said in a song I once sang. "'The Saracen's head out of there became, King Richard riding in arms like flame, and where he established his folk to be fed, he set up his spear and the Saracen's head.' It was nearly dusk before the mob, much swelled by the many discontented on the Ivywood estates, reached the gates of Ivywood House. Strategically, and for the purposes of a night surprise, this might have done credit to the captain's military capacity, but the use to which he put it actually was what some might call eccentric. When he had disposed his forces with strict injunctions of silence for the first few minutes, he turned to Pump and said, "'And now, before we do anything else, I'm going to make a noise.' And he produced from under brown paper what appeared to be a musical instrument. "'A summons to parley?' inquired Dorian with interest. A trumpet of defiance or something of that kind? No, said Patrick. A serenade. End of chapter 23
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter Twenty Four: The Enigmas of Lady Joan. On an evening when the sky was clear and only its fringes embroidered with the purple arabesques of the sunset, Joan Brett was walking on the upper lawn of the terraced garden at Ivywood, where the peacocks trail themselves about. She was not unlike one of the peacocks herself in beauty, and, some might have said, in inutility. She had the proud head and the sweeping train nor was she in these days devoid of the occasional disposition to scream for indeed for some time past she had felt her existence closing round her with an incomprehensible quietude and that is harder for the patients than an incomprehensible noise whenever she looked at the old yew hedges of the garden they seemed to be higher than when she saw them last as if those living walls could still grow to shut her in. Whenever from the turret window she had a sight of the sea, it seemed to be farther away. Indeed, the whole closing of the end of the turret wing with the new wall of eastern woodwork seemed to symbolise all her shapeless sensations. In her childhood the wing had ended with a broken-down door and a disused staircase, they led to an uncultivated copse and an abandoned railway tunnel, to which neither she nor any one else ever wanted to go. Still, she knew what they led to. Now it seemed that this scrap of land had been sold and added to the adjoining estate, and about the adjoining estate nobody seemed to know anything in particular. The sense of things closing in increased upon her. All sorts of silly little details magnified the sensation. She could discover nothing about this new landlord next door, so to speak, since he was, it seemed, an elderly man who preferred to live in the greatest privacy. Miss Browning, Lord Ivywood's secretary, could give her no further information than that he was a gentleman from the Mediterranean coast, which singular form of words seemed to have been put into her mouth. As a Mediterranean gentleman might mean anything from an American gentleman living in Venice to a black African on the edge of the Atlas, the description did not illuminate, and probably was not intended to do so. She occasionally saw his liveried servants going about, and their liveries were not like English liveries. She was also, in her somewhat morbid state, annoyed by the fact that the uniforms of the old Pebblewick militia had been changed under the influence of the Turkish prestige in the recent war. They wore fezes like the French Zouave, which were certainly much more practical than the heavy helmets they used to wear. It was a small matter, but it annoyed Lady Joan who was, like so many clever women, at once subtle and conservative. It made her feel as if the whole world was being altered outside, and she was not allowed to know about it. But she had deeper spiritual troubles also, while under the pathetic entreaties of old Lady Ivywood and her own sick mother, she stayed on week after week at Ivywood House. If the matter be stated cynically, as she herself was quite capable of stating it, she was engaged in the established feminine occupation of trying to like a man. But the cynicism would have been false, as cynicism nearly always is, for during the most crucial days of that period she had really liked the man. She had liked him when he was brought in with Pump's bullet in his leg, and was still the strongest and calmest man in the room. She had liked him when the hurt took a dangerous turn, and when he bore pain to admiration. 
she had liked him when he showed no malice against the angry dorian she had liked him with something like enthusiasm on the night he rose rigid on his rude crutch and crushing all remonstrance made his rash and swift rush to london but despite the queer closing-in sensations of which we have spoken she never liked him better than that evening when he lifted himself laboriously on his crutch up the terraces of the old garden and came to speak to her as she stood among the peacocks he even tried to pat a peacock in a hazy way as if it were a dog he told her that these beautiful birds were of course imported from the east by the semi-eastern empire of macedonia but all the same joan had a dim suspicion that he had never noticed before that there were any peacocks at ivywood his greatest fault was a pride in the faultlessness of his mental and moral strength but if he had only known something faintly comic in the unconscious side of him did him more good with the woman than all the rest they were said to be the birds of juno he said but i have little doubt that juno like so much else of the homeric mythology has also an asiatic origin i always thought said joan that juno was rather too stately for the seraglio you ought to know replied ivywood with a courteous gesture for i never saw any one who looked so like juno as you do but indeed there is a great deal of misunderstanding about the arabian or indian view of women it is somehow too simple and solid for our paradoxical christendom to comprehend even the vulgar joke against the turks that they like their brides fat has in it a sort of distorted shadow of what i mean they do not look so much at the individual as at womanhood and the power of nature i sometimes think said joan that these fascinating theories are a little strained your friend misisera told me the other day that women had the highest freedom in turkey as they were allowed to wear trousers ivywood smiled his rare and dry smile the prophet has something of a simplicity often found with genius he answered i will not deny that some of the arguments he has employed have seemed to me crude and even fanciful but he is right at the root there is a kind of freedom that consists in never rebelling against nature and i think they understand it in the orient better than we do in the west you see joan it is all very well to talk about love in our narrow personal romantic way but there is something higher than the love of a lover or the love of love what is that asked joan looking down the love of fate said lord ivywood with something like spiritual passion in his eyes doesn't nietzsche say somewhere that the delight in destiny is the mark of the hero we are mistaken if we think that the heroes and saints of islam say kismet with bowed heads and in sorrow they say kismet with a shout of joy that which is fitting that is what they really mean in the arabian tales the most perfect prince is wedded to the most perfect princess because it is fitting the spiritual giants the genii achieve it that is the purposes of nature in the selfish sentimental european novels the loveliest princess on earth might have run away with her middle-aged drawing-master these things are not in the path the turk rides out to wed the fairest queen of the earth he conquers empires to do it and he is not ashamed of his laurels the crumpled violet clouds around the edge of the silver evening looked to lady joan more and more like vivid violet embroideries 
hemming some silver curtain in the closed corridor at Ivywood. The peacocks looked more lustrous and beautiful than they ever had before, but for the first time she really felt they came out of the land of the Arabian Nights. Joan, said Philip Ivywood very softly in the twilight, I am not ashamed of my laurels. I see no meaning in what these Christians call humility. I will be the greatest man in the world if I can, and I think I can. Therefore, something that is higher than love itself, fate and what is fitting, make it right that I should wed the most beautiful woman in the world. And she stands among the peacocks, and is more beautiful and more proud than they. Joan's troubled eyes were on the violet horizon, and her troubled lips could utter nothing but something like, Don't! Joan, said Philip again, I have told you, you are the woman one of the great heroes could have desired. Let me now tell you something I could have told no one to whom I had not thus spoken of love and betrothal. When I was twenty years old in a town in Germany pursuing my education, I did what the West calls falling in love. She was a fisher girl from the coast, for this town was near the sea. My story might have ended there. I could not have entered diplomacy with such a wife, but I should not have minded then. But a little while after I wandered into the edges of Flanders, and found myself standing above some of the last grand reaches of the Rhine. And things came over me but for which I might be crying stinking fish to this day. I thought how many holy or lovely nooks that river had left behind and gone on. It might anywhere in Switzerland have spent its weak youth in a spirit over a high crag, or anywhere in the Rhinelands lost itself in a marsh covered with flowers, but it went on to the perfect sea, which is the fulfilment of a river. Again Joan could not speak. And again it was Philip who went on. Here is yet another thing that could not be said till the hand of the prince had been offered to the princess. It may be that in the East they carry too far this matter of infant marriages. But look round on the mad young marriages that go to pieces everywhere, and ask yourself whether you don't wish they had been infant marriages. People talk in the newspapers of the heartlessness of royal marriages, but you and I do not believe the newspapers, I suppose. We know there is no king in England, nor has been since his head fell before Whitehall. You know that you and I and the families are the kings of England, and our marriages are royal marriages. Let the suburbs call them heartless. Let us say they need the brave heart that is the only badge of aristocracy. Joan, he said very gently, perhaps you have been near a crag in Switzerland, or a marsh covered with flowers. Perhaps you have known a fisher girl. But there is something greater and simpler than all that, something you find in the great epics of the East, the beautiful woman and the great man and fate. My lord, said Joan, using the formal phrase by an unfathomable instinct, will you allow me a little more time to think of this? and let there be no notion of disloyalty, if my decision is one way or the other. Why, of course, said Ivywood, bowing over his crutch, and he limped off, picking his way among the peacocks.
for days afterward joan tried to build the foundations of her earthly destiny she was still quite young but she felt as if she had lived thousands of years worrying over the same question she told herself again and again and truly that many a better woman than she had taken a second best which was not so first class a second best but there was something complicated in the very atmosphere she liked listening to philip ivywood at his best as any one likes listening to a man who can really play the violin but the great trouble always is that at certain awful moments you cannot be certain whether it is the violin or the man moreover there was a curious tone and spirit in the ivywood household especially after the wound and convalescence of ivywood about which she could say nothing except that it annoyed her somehow there was something in it glorious but also languorous by an impulse by no means uncommon among intelligent fashionable people she felt a desire to talk to a sensible woman of the middle or lower classes and almost threw herself on the bosom of miss browning for sympathy but miss browning with her curling reddish hair and white very clever face struck the same indescribable note lord ivywood was assumed as a first principle as if he were father time or the clerk of the weather he was called he the fifth time he was called he joan could not understand why she seemed to smell the plants in the hot conservatory you see said miss browning we mustn't interfere with his career that is the important thing and really i think the quieter we keep about everything the better i'm sure he is maturing very big plans you heard what the prophet said the other night the last thing the prophet said to me said the darker lady in a dogged manner was that when we english see the english youth we cry out he is crescent but when we see the english aged man we cry out he is cross a lady with so clever a face could not but laugh faintly but she continued on a determined theme the prophet said you know that all real love had in it an element of fate and i am sure that is his view too people cluster round a centre as little stars do round a star because a star is a magnet you are never wrong when destiny blows behind you like a great big wind and i think many things have been judged unfairly that way it's all very well to talk about the infant marriages in india miss browning said joan are you interested in the infant marriages in india well said miss browning is your sister interested in them i'll run and ask her cried joan plunging across the room to where mrs mackintosh was sitting at a table scribbling secretarial notes well said mrs mackintosh turning up a rich-haired resolute head more handsome than her sister's i believe the indian way is best when people are left to themselves in early youth any of them might marry anything we might have married a nigger or a fishwife or a criminal now mrs mackintosh said joan with black-browed severity you well know you would never have married a fishwife where is enid she ended suddenly lady enid said miss browning is looking out music in the music room i think joan walked swiftly through several long salons and found her fair-haired and pallid relative actually at the piano enid cried joan you know i've always been fond of you for god's sake tell me what is the matter with this house 
i admire philip as everybody does but what is the matter with the house why do all these rooms and gardens seem to be shutting me in and in and in why does everything look more and more the same why does everybody say the same thing oh i don't often talk metaphysics but there is a purpose in this that's the only way of putting it there is a purpose and i don't know what it is lady enid wimpole played a preliminary bar or two on the piano then she said nor do i joan i don't indeed i know exactly what you mean but it's just because there is a purpose that i have faith in him and trust him she began softly to play a ballad tune of the rhineland and perhaps the music suggested her next remark suppose you were looking at some of the last reaches of the rhine where it flows in it cried joan if you say into the north sea i shall scream scream do you hear louder than all the peacocks together well expostulated lady enid looking up rather wildly the rhine does flow into the north sea doesn't it i dare say said joan recklessly but the rhine might have flowed into the round pond before you would have known or cared until until what asked enid and her music suddenly ceased until something happened that i cannot understand said joan moving away you are something i cannot understand said enid wimpole but i will play something else if this annoys you and she fingered the music again with an eye to choice joan walked back through the corridor of the music-room and restlessly resumed her seat in the room with the two lady secretaries well asked the red-haired and good-humoured mrs mackintosh without looking up from her work of scribbling have you discovered anything for some moments joan appeared to be in a blacker state of brooding than usual then she said in a candid and friendly tone which somehow contrasted with her knit and swarthy brows no really at least i think i've only found out two things and they're only things about myself i've discovered that i do like heroism but i don't like hero worship surely said miss browning in the girton manner the one always flows from the other i hope not said joan but what else can you do with the hero asked mrs mackintosh still without looking up from her writing except worship him you might crucify him said joan with a sudden return of savage restlessness as she rose from her chair things seem to happen then aren't you tired asked the miss browning who had the clever face yes said joan and the worst sort of tiredness when you don't even know what you're tired of to tell the honest truth i think i'm tired of this house it's very old of course and parts of it are still dismal said miss browning but he has enormously improved it the decoration with the moon and stars down in the wing with the turret is really away in the distant music-room lady enid having found the music she preferred was fingering its prelude on the piano at the first few notes of it joan brett stood up like a tigress thanks she said with a hoarse softness that's it of course and that's just what we all are she's found the right tune now what tune is it asked the wondering secretary the tune of harp sap but psaltery dulcimer and all kinds of music said joan softly and fiercely 
when we shall bow down and worship the golden image that nebuchadnezzar the king has set up girls women do you know what this place is do you know why it is all doors within doors and lattice behind lattice and everything is curtained and cushioned and why the flowers that are so fragrant here are not the flowers of our hills from the distant and slowly darkening music-room enid wimpole's song came thin and clear less than the dust beneath thy chariot wheels less than the rust that never stains thy sword do you know what we are demanded joan brett again we are a harem why what can you mean cried the younger girl in great agitation why lord ivywood has never i know he has never i am not sure said joan even whether he would ever i shall never understand that man nor will anybody else but i tell you that is the spirit that is what we are and this room stinks of polygamy as certainly as it smells of tube-roses why joan cried lady enid entering the room like a well-bred ghost what on earth is the matter with you you all look as white as sheets joan took no heed of her but went on with her own obstinate argument and besides she said if there's one thing we do know about him it is that he believes on principle in doing things slowly he calls it evolution and relativity and the expanding of an idea into larger ideas how do we know he isn't doing that slowly getting us accustomed to living like this so that it may be the less shock when he goes further steeping us in the atmosphere before he actually introduces and she shuddered the institution is it any more calmly outrageous a scheme than any other of ivywood's schemes than a sepoy commander-in-chief or miss isra preaching in westminster abbey or the destructions of all the inns in england i will not wait and expand i will not be evolved i will not develop into something that is not me my feet shall be outside these walls if i walk the roads for it afterward or i will scream as i would scream trapped in any den by the docks she swept down the rooms toward the turret with a sudden passion for solitude but as she passed the astronomical wood-carving that had closed up the end of the old wing, Enid saw her strike it with her clinched hand. It was in the turret that she had a strange experience. She was again, later on, using its isolation to worry out the best way of having it out with Philip when he should return from his visit to London for to tell old lady ivywood what was on her mind would be about as kind and useful as describing chinese tortures to a baby the evening was very quiet of the pale grey sort and all that side of ivywood lay before her eyes undisturbed she was the more surprised when her dreaming took note of a sort of stirring in the grey-purple dusk of the bushes of whisperings and of many footsteps then the silence settled down again and then it was startlingly broken by a big voice singing in the dark distance it was accompanied by faint sounds that might have been from the fingering of some lute or viol lady the light is dying in the skies lady and let us die when honour dies your dear dropped glove was like a gauntlet flung 
when you and I were young, for something more than splendor stood, and ease was not the only good about the woods in ivy wood when you and i were young lady the stars are falling pale and small lady we will not live if life be all forgetting those good stars in heaven hung when all the world was young for more than gold was in a ring and love was not a little thing between the trees in ivy wood when all the world was young the singing ceased and the bustle in the bushes could hardly be called more than a whisper but sounds of the same sort and somewhat louder seemed wafted round corners from other sides of the house and the whole night seemed full of something that was alive but was more than a single man she heard a cry behind her, and Enid rushed into the room as white as one of the lilies. "'What awful thing is happening?' she cried. "'The courtyard is full of men shouting, and there are torches everywhere, and—' Joan heard a tramp of men marching, and heard, afar off, another song, sung on a more derisive note, something like— that ivy would, Lord Ivy would, de rot the tree as ivy would. I think, said Joan thoughtfully, it is the end of the world. But where are the police? wailed her cousin. They don't seem to be anywhere about since they wore those fezzes. We shall be murdered or three thundering and measured blows shook the decorative wood panelling at the end of the wing as if admittance were demanded with the club of a giant. Enid remembered that she had thought Joan's little blow energetic, and shuddered. Both the girls stared at the stars and moons and suns blazoned on that sacred wall that leapt and shuddered under the strokes of the doom. Then the sun fell from heaven, and the moon and stars dropped down and were scattered about the Persian carpet, and by the opening of the end of the world, Patrick Dalroy came in, carrying a mandolin. End of chapter 24《Chapter Twenty Five of the Flying Inn》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Therese. The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter Twenty Five. The Finding of the Superman. I've brought you a little dog," said Mister Dalroy, introducing the rampant Quoodle. I had him brought down here in a large hamper labelled Explosives, a title which appears to have been well selected. He had bowed to Lady Enid on entering, and taken Joan's hand with the least suggestion that he wanted to do something else with it, but he resolutely resumed his conversation which was on the subject of dogs. People who bring back dogs, he said, are always under a cloud of suspicion. Sometimes it is hideously hinted that the citizen who brings the dog back with him is identical with the citizen who took the dog away with him. In my case, of course, such conduct is inconceivable. But the returners of dogs, that prosperous and increasing class, are also accused, he went on, looking straight at Jane with blank blue eyes, of coming back for a reward. There is more truth in this charge. 
then with a change of manner more extraordinary than any revolution even the revolution that was roaring round the house he took her hand again and kissed it saying with a confounding seriousness i know at least that you will pray for my soul you had better pray for mine if i have one answered joan but why now because said patrick you will hear from outside you may even see from that turret window something which in brute fact has never been seen in england since poor Monmouth's army went down in spirit and in truth it has not happened since saladin and Coeur de Lion crashed together i only add one thing and that you already know i have lived loving you and i shall die loving you it is the only dimension of the universe in which i have not wandered and gone astray i leave the dog to guard you and he disappeared down the old broken staircase lady enid was much mystified that no popular pursuit assailed the stair or invaded the house but lady joan knew better she had gone on the suggestion she most cared about into the turret room and looked out of its many windows onto the abandoned copse and tunnel which were now fenced off with high walls the boundary of the mysterious property next door across that high barrier she could not even see the tunnel and barely the tops of the tallest trees which hid its entrance from sight but in an instant she knew that dalroy was not hurling his forces on ivywood at all but on the house and the state beyond it and then followed a sight that was not an experience but rather a revolving vision she could never describe it afterward nor could any of those involved in so violent and mystical a wheel she had seen a huge ball of a breaker wash all over the parade at pebblewick and wondered that so huge a hammer could be made merely of water she had never had a notion of what it is like when it is made of men the palisade put up by the new landlord in front of the old tangled ground by the tunnel she had long regarded as something as settled and ordinary as one of the walls of the drawing room it swung and split and sprang into a thousand pieces under the mere blow of a human bodies bursting with rage and the great wave crested the obstacle more clearly than she had ever seen any great wave crest the parade only when the fence was broken she saw behind it something that robbed her of reason so that she seemed to be living in all ages in all lands at once she could never describe the vision afterward but she always denied it was a dream she said it was worse it was something more real than reality it was a line of real soldiers which is always a magnificent sight but they might have been soldiers of hannibal or of attila they might have been dug up from the cemeteries of sidon and babylon for all joan had to do with them there encamped in english meadows with a hawthorn tree in front of them and three beaches behind was something that has never been encamped nearer than some leagues south of paris since the carolus called the hammer broke it backward at tours there flew the green standard of that great faith and strong civilization which has so often almost entered the great cities of the west which long encircled vienna which was barely barred from paris but which had never before been seen in arms on the soil of england at one end of the line stood philip ivywood in a uniform of his own special creation a compromise between the sepoy and the turkish uniform the compromise worked more and more wildly in joan's mind if any impression remained it was merely that england had conquered india and turkey had conquered england then she saw that ivywood for all his uniform was not the commander of these forces for an old man with a great scar on his face which was not a european face set himself in front of the battle as if it had been a battle in the old epics and crossed swords with patrick dalroy he had come to return the scar upon his forehead and he returned it with many wounds though at last it was he who sank under the sword thrust he fell on his face and dalroy looked at him with something that is much more great than pity blood was flowing from patrick's wrist and forehead but he made a salute with his sword as he was doing so the corpse as it appeared laboriously lifted a face with feeble eyelids and seeming to understand the quarters of the sky by instinct oman pasha dragged himself a foot or so to the left and fell with his face towards mecca after that the turret turned round and round about joan and she knew not whether the things she saw were history or prophecy something in the last fact of being crushed by the weapons of brown men and yellow 
secretly entrenched in english meadows had made the english what they had not been for centuries the hawthorn tree was twisted and broken as it was at the battle of ashdown when alfred led his first charge against the danes the beech trees were splashed up to their lowest branches with the mingling of brave heathen and brave christian blood she knew no more than that when a column of the christian rebels led by humphrey of the sign of the ships burst through the choked and forgotten tunnel and took the turkish regiment in the rear it was the end that violent and revolving vision became something beyond the human voice or human ear she could not intelligently hear even the shots and shouts round the last magnificent rally of the turks it was natural therefore that she should not hear the words lord ivywood addressed to his next-door neighbour a turkish officer or rather to himself but his words were i have gone where god has never dared to go i am above the silly supermen as they are above mere men when i walk in the heavens no man has walked before me and i am alone in a garden all this passing about me is like the lonely plucking of garden flowers i will have this blossom i will have that the sentence ended so suddenly that the officer looked at him as if expecting him to speak but he did not speak but patrick and joan wandered together in a world made warm and fresh again as it can be for few in the world that calls courage frenzy and love superstition feeling every branching tree as a friend with arms open for the man or every sweeping slope as a great train trailing behind the woman did one day climb up to the little cottage that was now the home of the superman he sat playing with a pale reposeful face with scraps of flowers and weed put before him on a wooden table he did not notice them nor anything else around him scarcely even enid wimple who attended to all his wants he is perfectly happy she said quietly joan with the glow on her dark face could not prevent herself from replying and we are so happy yes said enid but his happiness will last and she wept i understand said joan and kissed her cousin not without tears of her own End of chapter 25 Recording by Maria Therese End of The Flying Inn by G. K. Chesterton